I love talking to you, Art. I love being on your show. I love knowing how many people are listening to me. And as long as I make sense, I'm happy to come on. It's very healing and affirming. Hey everyone, it's Denise Friedman. Here are all of Art Bell's interviews with Terence McKenna, refined into only the conversations, without the musical and commercial breaks. Hope you will enjoy it. All right, this should be most interesting. First, let us see if we can establish contact. Uh, Terence McKenna, are you there? I am, Art. Good evening. How are you? Well, I'm just fine, and I, and I hope you hear me. I hear you okay. Yes, I hear you fine. All right. You are you're on the big island of Hawaii, is that right? That's right. Now, when I called you the other day, uh, you were way up in an area where your only contact with the outside world was by cellular telephone. Where, where do you actually live? On a, on a, on a mountain somewhere? I live uh, up on the slopes of the world's largest volcano, which is Mauna Loa. And uh, when you called me the other day, we mutually agreed my cell phone is not ready for prime time. <laughs> uh, so I came off the mountain. I do have up there a 128K connect to the Internet that's uh, wireless 40 miles through the air. Oh. Uh, but uh, my phones are not so good, so I came down off the mountain to talk to you this evening. Well, if it were not for the delay, I would say an Internet phone. We could have done the interview by Internet phone, but you have that little delay there that makes it hard. So I think we've done the right thing. Anyway, so you're off your mountain perch. By the way, uh, Terrence, what's it like living on the side of an active volcano? Well, it's... Uh, it's very exciting, actually. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever been out to the Big Island, but uh, people, no, I think have not. Of, uh, people think of Hawaii as swaying palms and endless beaches. What we have out here are lava fields and 14,000-foot mountains on this island, two of them. Uh, one, the world's largest volcano, the world's largest mountain in terms of volume, and the other one just a uh, hundred or so feet shorter. So uh, they, they, we've got quite a dramatic landscape out here. Is there any possibility that that volcano will actually blow? Well, it's been in continuous eruption for the past 13 years, but over on the other side, about 70 miles away on, on the uh, what's called the Hilo or the wet side, so we sort of feel pretty safe out here. Uh, there is some talk. They had a meeting of the International Geophysical Congress a couple of years out here. Uh, there is large-scale destabilization that goes on periodically in these islands, big undersea landslides that produce local tsunamis. But uh, in an effort to escape human-created uh, catastrophe and confusion, I'm betting that I can eke out 50 years on this island and slide through in good shape. Well, it's probably a pretty good bet, actually, in the long scheme I, I of things. Think so. I, I think Hawaii, if the world flies to pieces, it'll be a very good place to be, and if the world doesn't fly to pieces, it's a pretty good place to be. And if the volcano should totally blow up, it's a painless death. That's right. <laughs> And a dramatic one. Yeah, and a dramatic one as well. That's right. Um, all right. You have a theory about time. Time, actually, Terrence, is one of my favorite all-time topics. Uh, so we, before we launch into what you think about time, tell me what you think time is. In other words, is time our invention or is time a real thing that we, I mean, I realize we're measuring it, but in the cosmic uh, scheme of things, is there really time? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you give me a perfect entree to launch into this thing. Uh, see, in the West, we have uh, inherited from Newton what is called the idea of pure duration, which is simply that time is sort of a place where things are placed so that they don't all happen at once. In other words, 
it's viewed as qualityless. It's a, it's an abstraction. Uh, in fact, I think when we carry out a complete analysis of time, what we're going to discover is that, like matter, time is composed of elemental, discrete uh, type. Uh, you know, all matter, organic and inorganic, is composed of 104, 108 elements. There's argument. Uh, time, on the other hand, is thought to be this featureless, qualityless medium. But in fact, as we experience it as living, feeling creatures, time has qualities. There are times where everything seems to go right and everything seems to go wrong. That's and, true. Uh, uh, that's, so that's, I, ab- that Terrence, that's absolutely true. Uh, I've wondered about that all my life. Uh, there are periods of time where, in effect, you can do no wrong. That's and, right. And other periods of time where you can do no right, no matter what you do. Well, so in looking at this, I created a, a vocabulary. Actually, I borrowed it from Alfred North Whitehead. But I, I think I'm on to something uh, which science has missed. And uh, uh, it's this. It's that the, the universe or a human life or an empire or an ecosystem, any large-scale or small-scale process can be looked upon as a kind of a dynamic struggle between two qualities, which I call uh, habit and novelty. And I think they're pretty self-explanatory. I'm sorry, Uh, habit and what? Novelty. 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 And habit is simply repetition of established pattern, conservation, folding back uh, what has already been achieved into a system. And novelty is the chance-taking, the exploratory, the new, the never-before-seen. And these two qualities habit and novelty are locked in all situations in a kind of struggle. But the, the good news is that uh, if you look at large scales of time, novelty is winning. And this is the point that I have been so concerned to make that I think science has overlooked, that if you look back through the history of the human race or of life on this planet, or of the solar system and the galaxy, as you go backward in time, things become more simple, more uh, basic. Yes. And so turning that on its head, we could say, as we come toward the present, things become more novel, more complex. So I've taken this to be actually a universal law affecting historical process, biological processes and uh, uh, astrophysical processes. Nature produces and conserves novelty. And what I mean by that is uh, as the universe cooled, uh, the original cloud of electron plasma, eventually atomic systems formed. As it further cooled, molecular systems, then long-chain polymers, then uh, non-nucleated, primitive DNA-containing life, later complex life, multicellular life. Uh, And this is a principle that reaches right up to our dear selves. And and notice, Art, it's working across all scales of being. This is something that is as true of, of human societies as it is of termite populations or populations of, of atoms in a, in a chemical system. Nature uh, conserves, prefers novelty. And the interesting thing about an idea like this is it stands the existentialism of modern philosophy on its head. You know, what modern atheistic existentialism says is, we're a cosmic accident and damn lucky to be here, and any meaning you get out of the situation, you're simply conferring. Uh, I say no. By looking deeply into the structure of nature, we can discover that novelty is what nature 
produces and conserves, and if that represents a universal value system, then the human world as we find it today with our technologies and our complex societies represents the greatest novelty so far achieved. And so suddenly you have a basis for an ethic. That which uh, advances novelty is good. That which retards it is, uh, is to be looked at very carefully. Well, all right, let me stop you right there. One okay. of the first things that you said when we got on the air this morning was that you had a 128 baud connection from your mountaintop secret location. Right. Okay. Um, as we are discussing your theory, uh, which is fascinating, of novelty, um, I'm taken to ask you about a quote, actually, um, of several pages written by Michael Crichton, and I know you know who he is, mm -hmm. uh, with reference to the Internet. It is Michael Crichton's contention that the Internet, which one might consider to be novelty um, uh, exemplified, Incarnate. Uh, uh, yeah, indeed, is going to result uh, not in uh, more novelty, but in fact in um, a slowing of the, the process of evolution, or novelty as you, you see it, uh, because there will be a commonality. There will not be innovation. There will not be um, entrepreneurship. There will be ten main ideas in America and Hong Kong and Moscow and London and so forth. Um, how would you address that? Well, I'm astonished. I hardly know what he's talking about. I, let me give you my take on oh, Okay, I, I, let me rephrase it. He's saying the Internet will stifle diversity and that uh, diversity is critical to uh, advancement. Well, what I see happening, and I spend hours and hours a day on the Internet, is I believe it's the greatest force empowering uh, marginal and minority points of view uh, to come along in centuries. In other words, uh, before the Internet, the great establishment ideas already had the machinery of media to communicate their position. True. Uh, what has happened is that the common man has gotten uh, into the game with technology that I really don't think was ever intended to fall into. Oh, you uh, bet. You bet it wasn't. Yes. So I, I don't know what Crichton is talking about. Uh, I believe what the Internet is doing is uh, dissolving boundaries. Uh, between people's idea systems, classes, and factions, and we're getting a much richer evolutionary interplay among ideas and this sort of thing. So uh, I see it as uh, a very fertile place with a lot of mutation going on uh, in hardware, in how people view it, ideologies, this sort of thing. Uh, I just don't know where he's coming from. With well, uh, I, might, I might expand on it this way. Uh, he suggests, for example, that if you were to take uh, an otherwise deserted or barren desert island and you were to put a species upon it, that species, because there are so few of them, uh, would by necessity be very innovative, would change very quickly in trying to adapt and live and stay alive, uh, on the other hand, if you put many, many creatures on that island, that process would be far slower. And he uses that as a parallel to the Internet. I'm not sure that I agree with it either. I just found it an interesting take uh, on the soci sociological uh, implications of the Internet. Well, you see, when people talk about the Internet, they're usually talking about the Internet that was because it's moving so quickly. For example, I oh, just yeah. read a paper by a guy named Alexander Cheslenko out at the Media Lab at MIT, and he's talking about plugins that will translate websites of one language into another. <laughs> well, now imagine when people can put up websites in Telugu, Witoto, Russian, French, you name it, and you can automatically slide into those websites and uh, see what's going on. You're, it, you're describing uh, Crichton's nightmare and your um, uh, best dream, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing about technology. It's uh, to polarize people. 
let me make one point here uh, before we leave this time thing. I said I'd identified a tendency in the universe which science had missed, which was to conserve novelty. And then you asked about the Internet, mm -hmm. which sort of led me to the second half of the observation. Uh, not only does the universe have this preference for novelty, but each m acceleration into novelty has proceeded more quickly than the ones which, which preceded it. So, for instance, the slow cooling out of the universe led to the slightly more rapid appearance of organic chemistry, which led to the quite rapid evolution of higher plants and animals, oh, yes. which led to the hysterical pace of, of human history. And I see no reason to suppose that that process of acceleration will ever slow down. Uh, is, is it, a, is it uh, Terence, a linear process or a, uh, uh, an accelerating, exponentially accelerating process? It's an exponentially accelerating process, which Whoa. leads to a kind of end-of-the-world scenario that has made a lot of people place me out with the squirrels because I'm saying that this process of novelty is now moving so quickly mm -hmm. that within our own life, Times, uh, it is going to accelerate essentially to such uh, an intensity that we will be experiencing more novelty in a few years. Buddy, it's uh, great to be here, and uh, we have a, a very, very interesting fellow on the line. His name is Terrence McKenna, and he's from the big island of Hawaii. And he has just described to me uh, in uh, language that you had to listen very carefully to, exactly what I wrote about, the quickening. And, and we'll pick up on that in a moment. It's fascinating. My God, it's like hearing my own theory amplified uh, coming back at me or an explanation of what I wrote about. Wow. Anyway, um, in a moment, back to Terrence. Back now to Hawaii and Terrence McKenna. Terrence, uh, I thought we lost you for a moment, but... Um, I think we have you back. Are you there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there will be silences during the break, so do not interpret that as we have disconnected, Terrence. Only if you get a dial tone are we in trouble. Otherwise, just hang in there, okay? All righty. All right. Um, I, I mean, I sat here as I listened to you, you the first half hour in shock uh, because I realized you were describing exactly what I wrote about and what I did, Terrence, I realized that a lot of people say this quickening, or whatever you want to call it, whatever name you want to put to it, uh, is a byproduct of mass communication. And I began to realize, uh-uh, no, it is not a product of mass communication. Yes, we're hearing about it uh, more uh, and more volumes of it, but in fact, in fact, what you are describing is really going on, and I documented that much in my book, in real everyday life, in, in each one of these areas and many more, I documented the fact that it is not mass communication that is beginning to quicken things, but there is another process at work. Now, I don't know what that is, and I don't know where it's leading. In other words, people will say, well, when we finally get to this crunch point, whatever that is, um what will happen, and I, I don't have that answer, I'm just a talk show host, an observer, uh, but maybe you do. When we finally reach what you call time wave zero, um, what is going to happen? Well, the only way to predict what's going to happen is to look at the quality of what has happened as the quickening, as you call it, has begun to accelerate. Uh, what it's been characterized by is uh, dissolution of boundaries between uh, classes of people, bodies of knowledge, pools of capital, language groups, so forth and so on. And so it seems to me ultimate novelty must be uh, a situation where all boundaries are dissolved. And, of course, what that looks like, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether it's a virtual reality where you become God uh, through the public utilities or exactly uh, what it is, but it's clear to me that 
the the human nervous system is globalizing itself, building a, a model of conscious thought on a planetary scale. Tens of thousands of people are participating in this. None of them have a real notion what it's all about, but everyone is serving this sort of unfolding grand design. And, uh, you know, I think the emergence of alphabets was part of the quickening. I think the emergence of hominids out of more primitive primates was part of this quickening. I think this is the business that this planet has been about for a very, very long time. Uh are you able to discern um, any timelines to time wave zero? Well, yes. I mean, we've been talking about this as a metaphor. What makes me, I hope, a little different from some of the other prophets in the marketplace is uh, I've got a formal mathematical theory uh, that, you know, I mentioned habit and novelty, this dualistic flow. Yes. Well, because it is a dualistic flow, it can be portrayed like uh, uh, the ebb and flow of the price of a stock or something like that. In other yes. words, it can be portrayed as a line graph. So I've written computer programs which produce what I call novelty waves. In other words, uh, time-scaled uh, waves that picture the ebb and flow of novelty. And by fitting known historical and paleontological and geological data against these waves at different scales, I was able to finally discern uh, a best fit. But the conclusion that it led to was even, to, well, was very startling to me, which is this ultimate novelty, this transcendental object at the end of time, isn't millennia in the future. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, uh, uh, slated to collide with historical necessity sometime in late 2012. 2012. 2012. Now, I know you have some interest in the Mayan calendar. I do. Uh, I didn't know when I calculated this date that it was the same end date as the Mayan calendar to the day. Oh, oh my. Uh, let me ask you this, Terence. What did you uh, input uh, to your database um, to, for this computer program? In other words, uh, uh, what, what did I start with? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I started, I had a very academic interest uh, in the I Ching, which is a Chinese method of divination. And, uh, this, you know, everyone who's looked at this thing has been struck by the fact that it seems to work. And so I carried out a mathematical analysis. Of well, wait, 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 I don't know what Ching is, and I bet a lot of other people don't either. Uh, a Chinese method of divining, uh, what, what kind of method? What is it? Well, it's existed for thousands of years in China. It's sometimes done by throwing uh, 50 stocks or sometimes done with coins. But it's a method of producing uh, a thing called a hexagram, which is made up of either broken or unbroken lines, but six on top of each other. So huh. if you're a mathematician, you can figure... If it's made up of broken and unbroken lines and there are six of them on top of each other, there must be a possibility of 64 of these things. And uh, thousands of years ago in China, there was a vast body of literary commentary built up around these hexagrams. And they have always been presented in a traditional order, a certain way that they are always uh, presented. And I was studying a very academic question, which is, is this order of these hexagrams a true order, in other words, governed by rules, or is it simply a random jumble sanctioned by tradition? And this very obscure academic question led ultimately to the discovery that the I Ching was a uh, uh, 384 day 13 lunar cycle calendar and then from there I realized that this 384 day calendar was actually a nested 
subset in a fractal timekeeping scheme that was really more accurate and more sophisticated than anything uh, in the West. So what I'm really suggesting here is that in the same way that the West conquered the nature of matter through the elaboration of modern science, mm -hmm. about 4,000 years ago in China, a deeper analysis of time was carried out than, than has ever been undertaken in the West, and that the mathematics of this thing became buried then in this uh, fortune-telling system, and I basically teased it out, and uh, in my book, The Invisible Landscape, and at my website, all this stuff is explained. It's, it's quite... Oh, Terrence, what is your website? Uh, it's at Levity. It's uh, www.levity.com, and then just click on Terrence McKenna there. Levity is L-E-V-I-T-Y. So that, that's... So it's uh, it's www.levity.com? Correct. Uh, we'll get a link up shortly. Uh, well, I think you do. I visited your have... website oh. today. You've got good people. Yeah, you know, Keith, for... is, he does a wonderful job. All right, well, uh, so then you, you get there and then just click on Terrence McKenna and uh, be sure you're buckled in from the sound of what I've heard so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing you see, Art, is... With a wave like that, you can do what's called retrodicting. In other words, if you have a wave of novelty that describes the past, yes. you have to correctly predict the Italian Renaissance, the Greek Enlightenment, uh, yeah. the, the yes. modernity of the 20th century. Yes. And so by predicting the past, we've gained confidence that this wave predicts the future. That sounds quite scientific. In other words, uh, science is repeatability, and if you can repeatedly demonstrate that you can mathematically show the events of the past, then yes, I would imagine you could project. Well, so I've been at this since 1975, uh, but I kn the theory is, in a sense, very conservative. It never says what will happen. It says when, when interesting things are highly likely and when you're just wasting your time. Uh-huh. Um, when you look out uh, or project out toward, toward uh, 2012, um, what is the magnitude of the spike or the difference there? Uh, if you can give us an idea of magnitudes, um uh, Along well, the way. There is only one point in the entire cycle where the level of habit drops to zero. Effectively, then novelty becomes infinite. And that point occurs uh, on this solstice date in 2012. Now, it's very interesting. There are some people on the net called uh, Singularis. And they're hard-headed engineering types, and they take things like rate of energy release, rate of data storage, uh, uh, this sort of thing, and draw all their curves out. And they conclude that sometime between 2008 and 2020, uh, everything we produce infinite amounts of energy, we pack infinite amounts of data into infinitely small spaces. In other words, this same sort of thing where because of the acceleration built into the un uh, unfolding of this novelty process, we're going to cross more territory between here and 2012 than we've crossed between the Big Bang and getting to here. God, that's an incredible thought. It kind of explains what's happening, you know. Uh, that it isn't the, it isn't the old style religion, but it isn't the sterile, uh, steady state of science either. It's that the universe is actually involved in some kind of process of self metamorphosis, and human beings indicate that we have crossed some boundary into a new uh, era, a new epoch of ever greater acceleration into this process of self-revelation. I mean, this is what religions are raving about. This is what every mm -hmm. prophet on the street corner is trying to articulate. And, no, no question. Uh, I think it's real. I think we're getting a lot of static because people can only deal with it through images that they 
say no, you know, Marshall McLuhan once said, we drive into the future using only our rearview mirror. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of what it is. But I call this thing the transcendental object at the end of time. And I think, you know, in a sense, religion and Christian revelation, it will all be fulfilled in a way none of us ever suspected because nature has this appetite for novelty and acceleration into novelty. And so then again I ask, uh, at this moment um, that we speak of, uh, 2012, right. what do you actually think will occur? Well, I've thought about this a good deal, and there are hard and soft scenarios, but I've noticed that what the time wave seems most uh, coherently able to track is technology. Mm -hmm. Somehow technology is very important. It's the transformation of the human relationship to the world through tools. And so what I'm thinking would fulfill this entire scenario without requiring God Almighty to put in an appearance is uh, time travel. I think that uh, you, we are moving toward, you know, if you look at biology over huge scales of time, hundreds of millions of years, uh, it is a kind of conquest of dimensionality. All right. Uh, let's, let's consider that. Uh, somebody recently said, and I have been considering since I heard it, uh, a very simple question. If time travel is possible, then where are the time travelers? Well, when I asked that question to my sources, they said, you, you can only travel as far back into the past as the moment of the invention of the first time machine, because before that, there were no time machines. Huh. Huh. Uh, that, I, th but let me think about that. Does that make sense? You could only travel back to the moment of the invention of the time machine, because prior to that, there was no capability. It's like trying to drive where there are no roads. Yeah. It also means when you invent the first time machine, instantly time machines will appear by the tens of thousands, having come back through time to see the first flight into time. <laughs> that's, in, that's incredible. I never. That's a whole new line of thought for me about about that question um, and it might make sense it might make sense uh, and, and, and your analogy is trying to that you cannot drive in essence uh, uh, where there are no roads. where there are no roads well of course you, you nearly do that when you go home uh, from, from the <laughs> broadcast here but and you haven't even been up to see me you're a <laughs> psychic <laughs> um we're very so, proud of our bad roads. I understand. It keeps the riffraff away, I it suppose. It certainly does. Um, Actually, it doesn't keep the riffraff away, but it keeps everybody else away. away. <laughs> <laughs> How long, uh, uh, Terrence, have you been uh, residing on the side of the volcano there? Well, continuously for about three and a half years. I've had land out here for about, uh, well, since 77. Since 77, and before that? Uh, I lived, I grew up in western Colorado, and I uh, had my children and my marriage and all that in uh, California, and lived 35 years in northern California. Uh-huh. Um, you, you knew Timothy Leary, yes? Uh, I knew him. Uh, we appeared in public, mostly in Europe. Uh, together a few times, and he certainly was a huge influence on me. I only came to know him in the pa in the past seven or eight years, but uh, as a kid growing up in the 60s, he, he was an enormous influence on me. You are now being called by many uh, his heir apparent, uh, his heir now, I guess. Well, I think not by many, but I was called it by him. Everybody else kept their mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I have my method. I'm very interested in the psychedelic experience. I, I was raised Catholic, and what I kept of that was an enormous thirst 
for the paranormal, the miraculous, yes. supernatural. Yes. And I went to India and I made the rounds of the gurus and the geishas and I didn't find what I was looking for. But when I went to South America, to the jungles down there, I discovered that uh, LSD was only the tip of the psychedelic iceberg and what I had taken to be modern science and modern chemistry was actually a tradition of, uh, of shamanism and volcano in Hawaii an interesting place to choose to live by itself and an interesting man indeed so Terence more of Terence McKenna coming up prepare yourself for an experience here's what was written to me about Terence McKenna before we invited him on the program uh, Art have you heard about Terence McKenna's theory called time wave zero he suggests that as we get closer to time wave zero we are experiencing tachyon radiation from it evidently the impending event is so colossal that it will emit such intense radiation that some of it takes the form of faster than light speed tachyon particles or waves which uh, can travel faster than light and that they're actually being hurtled backward in time the closer we get to the event, the greater the radiation density. Hence, the more frequently and intensely we experience paranormal phenomena associated with it. We'll ask about that, by the way. We haven't yet. This could be the mechanism behind what you call the quickening. The event we are approaching will probably be something tantamount to a white hole or a mini Big Bang. It will, for all intents and purposes, be the end of time. For us, Terence believes it will occur consistent with the Mayan calendar in the year 2012. Now, by the way, he has de derived this um, independently of the Mayan calendar. He simply uh, has discovered that it coincides with it. He goes on, it is not unreasonable to assume that ETs possessing UFOs, if they exist, will be flocking here to research or rather pre-search the phenomenon. It is also believed that tachyon bombardment would have bizarre effects on the human nervous system, visions, that sort of thing, as well as physical manifestations in the environment, like the clear water virgin, bizarre mutations like the chupacabra, and heaven knows what else. All the stuff you attribute to the quickening might be explained by this. And after listening to the first hour, I must agree, Terence, I'm stealing one more bit of time to read you a fact that I think relates and challenges you a little bit. It is from Stephen in Wichita, and it's well thought out. Um, here it is. Art, I'm not sure that you can equate novelty with either acceleration or complexity. A nature has always been novel, and surprisingly so, considering earlier periods in Earth's history. Given that over 90% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct, and the exotic body designs, it would seem novelty is a given. But, in order to be effective, it must have a survival advantage and be passed on. Once the novelty becomes a hindrance, it disappears. Acceleration may be more a factor of population density. Virtually all of the social problems we face today have been duplicated years ago in rat population density studies. Our novel inventions of this century have simply allowed us to artificially compress distance and time by modes of travel and communications. Profit motives have directed and limited the novelty of our civilization in this century as never before, and we are becoming a hindrance. The higher the population density the more the acceleration seems to be anecdotal but relative compare the pace of a small country town to a large city with its population density and resulting problems accelerated by stress and profit motives that's from steve in wichita what what do you think uh, terence well i don't disagree with all of that uh, i think there's certainly been ebb and flow of novelty within the 20th century uh, parts of it more novel than others but i think to to argue that it isn't among the most novel periods in time is a pretty uphill battle uh, the question yeah. is whether novelty is something which simply adheres 
to uh, statistical dynamics or whether it's a real direction, a real arrow that is directing process, and that's what I maintain. Uh, I think it's not true to say that uh, uh, the biota of the Earth today is not more novel than it was in the past. Certainly there are novel forms of life which have on, undergone extinction, but the uh, proliferation of, of human life, which is an advanced animal plus a culture-creating creature, indicates to me that we're at a level of novelty that this planet has never before experienced. Of course, it's, it's an arguable thing because history, which is what we're always comparing these waves to, is not yet a quantified thing. I mean, how do you rate the War of the Roses over uh, Queen Anne's War or something like that? Uh, but nevertheless, though we don't have an absolute quantification of history, there is general agreement among historians that events like the Renaissance, the Greek Golden Age, the 20th century, are uh, periods where a great deal of novelty in social forms and technologies was concentrated. All right. You uh, put together a computer program which, um, which was able to trace uh, the ebb and the flow of this novelty and, in effect, chart major events in history. Um, how many, uh, if I might ask, um, hits and misses uh, as you as you when you got this in final development, and then you look at each point in history, um, how many hits and misses? Were there any misses in the model, or did you hit each uh, major moment in history on the nose? Well, by my understanding of this theory, there can be no misses. In other words, it's not a statistical theory. We're not okay if we're right two-thirds of the time. Here, here. So we have to be right all the time. So you're so telling me you are. I submit to you and to the world for your examination and critiquing the fact that, yes, the time wave uh, with its end point in December 21st, 2012, describes with as great an accuracy as I am able to discern the actual vicissitudes of novelty and habit in history and natural history. That's the claim. That's right. Uh, Terence, have you submitted this? Uh, I mean, this is serious science that you're discussing. Uh, have you submitted this because of its repeatability? Not science. Now, have you submitted this to peer review? Well, uh, among mathematicians, yes. And there's a lively debate raging on the Internet about that. Uh, let me say something, though, here about science and why the acceptance of the time wave can't really occur under the tent of ordinary science. You have mentioned repeatability. Repeatability is the idea at the very basis of the scientific method, at the very basis of experiment. That's right. It's what's called restoration of initial conditions. But now notice that what the time wave theory is saying is that every moment in time is a unique moment. Is unique and not, and will not a specific, excuse me, specifically repeat. But what you're suggesting is that you can plot the highs of novelty uh, throughout history. Yes, you can, but you cannot, um, uh, you cannot assume uh, that you're doing it probabilistically. In other words, uh, essentially, when you really understand philosophically what the time wave is saying, it's an enormous attack on probability theory. You know, the way science works now is if you want to know how much energy is flowing through a wire, you take a thousand measurements, you add them together, and you divide by a thousand and then you have the current flowing through the wire. But notice that that assumes that it doesn't matter what time you make the measurement. And so much of science is like this to the point where I am redefining science and saying science is the study of those phenomena so coarse-grained that the time in which they occurred does not affect them. And that leaves out, then, 
history, love affairs, corporate takeovers, uh, empire building, everything interesting in the human world is too uh, fragile, too finely embedded in the context of its time to be open to that kind of scientific modeling. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, uh, so, in other words, uh, they're really relatively small, insignificant events that don't enter into the larger measurements you're making of this um, ebb and flow. Well, for instance, on a given day when the chart says novelty will be high, certainly somewhere in the world someone is having a very unnovel day. Uh, it's a statistical thing, a, a bell curve, no reference to you, Art, Thank you. but uh, a bell curve where when the wave is predicting high novelty, most people, most systems will experience that novelty, but of course some will not. It's the idea that probability is ebbing and flowing. You know, when you study statistics, the first thing they teach you is when you flip a coin, the odds are 50-50, heads or tails. If that were true, the coin would land on its edge every single time. That's the rarest of all results in a coin toss. Indeed. So what's really happening is that what are called secondary and tertiary factors are causing the coin to be heads or tails. I say no. There are zones in time where heads are favored and zones in time where tails are favored. The idea that time can be described as a perfectly smooth surface and then dealt with statistically is just a first pass with Greek idealism and uh, careful examination of nature shows it to be inadequate in the same way that perfect circles were inadequate for describing planetary motion. You are therefore saying that conventional science uh, does not have and cannot have with its present uh, course of investigation and a proper understanding of time. That's right, because it assumes that it is to be analyzed with statistics and that flattens out and denies the, the difference among various times and types of time. God, Terence, how long have you been working on this? Oh, since 1971. 71? <laughs> yes. Um, what is your... You, you, you told me that uh, you're, you're originally from Colorado, family and all that back in Colorado. Right. Uh, then finally, exile... Uh, well, essentially, yes, and I got myself to the University of California in, at Berkeley right at the time of uh, the anti-war movement and all of that. It was uh, like a kid in a cultural candy store and uh, studied philosophy, art history, and then went off to Asia uh, basically to check out the hash dens and the gurus mm -hmm. and... Uh, the hash was fine, but the gurus just wanted into my pocket. Uh, and so then I went to South America, and as I mentioned, that's where this shamanism thing just really grabbed me. I what mean, part of South America, Terence? Uh, southern Colombia, the Putumayo River Basin. And, uh, uh, you know, the, it's, the, it's the psychedelic plants that are so fascinating to me because... You mentioned repeatability. Mm -hmm. Here's a technology, a technique that lets you repeatedly and, and with relative safety journey into alien worlds filled with alien forms of intelligence. And it's the only thing I've found that does that. In other words, I've investigated flying saucers, crop circles, this and that. I, I, it doesn't. To turn me on. But no, I, I, let, let me quickly stop you there and ask you about crop circles. Many, many people feel that they are fractal in nature, and if you're on the Internet, I know you've seen uh, photographs of some of the more amazing ones, Stonehenge, some of the rest of them. They do appear to be fractal. Um, what is your thinking there? Well, I was thinking, you know, I don't think it's been published in this country, but this wonderful book called Around in Circles by Jim Schnabel, uh, to my mind, that blows the lid off the whole crop circle thing. Uh, you and I could spend a whole evening, Art, discussing uh, 
the relationship of the media to the human psyche to how people handle evidence and uh, uh, because I I really think the the psychedelic community has evidence to give on these paranormal questions that has never been properly heard and evaluated because the ordinary society's attitude toward people who use psychedelics is that they are automatically unreliable. Yes, I know. But I think we're not going to crack stuff like UFO abductions and that sort of thing unless we admit the psychedelic evidence. And if we do admit it, suddenly the whole thing begins to look very, very different. All right, Terrence, I don't reject it. Um, and a lot of guests that I've had on uh, who have been into the very same areas we're in right now um, very politically correctly uh, rejected out of hand. Uh, we do, you don't need it to accomplish this, uh, they say, that you can do it uh, within yourself. And I don't reject that thought either, but I would like to hear the case that you would present um, for, for psychedel uh, psychedelics opening the doors that you're talking about, um, that, that in fact they do. Um, wh how would you make that case? Well, I hear what you're saying is you're equating spiritual techniques like yoga and prayer and human exactly. decency and that sort of thing. I'm not sure there's a connection. I mean, it does help to be an ethical person to take psychedelics, but... Uh, for instance, the psychedelic that has fascinated me most over the years uh, is DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Now, this is not a well-known substance. No, it isn't. What is it? Well, that's what it is, dimethyltryptamine. It occurs in a number of plant species throughout the world. It's utilized by native peoples. And uh, in the pure form out of the laboratory, when you smoke this stuff, you find yourself inside the flying saucer that all these dazzled people are uh, raving about. But you found yourself there by initiating an action. What a totally interesting individual he is. You've got to sit by the radio, turn the volume up a little bit, put down your book or whatever else you're doing, and listen. Back now to the Big Island of Hawaii and a very unusual individual named Terrence McKenna. Terrence, um, I've got a question for you. Have you ever watched Star Trek? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, good. You're familiar, then, with the Prime Directive. Uh, thou shalt not interfere is, I believe, the Prime Directive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, um, what you are saying is so serious and is such a large revelation that uh, is it not possible that you are, in a sense, doing what you're doing right now, uh, violating the prime directive? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's only been about a hundred years since the news began to arrive in the lap of Western civilization that there were these uh, psychoactive plants scattered around the world. The yes. first one was the peyote cactus, and in 1888, yes. mescaline was extracted from that. Uh, I think it's not without implication that right at our moment of greatest cultural crisis, when we're destroying the environment and uprooting the rainforests and so forth and so on, Indeed. that out of those same rainforests comes a phenomenon which, if we will face it squarely, offers a severe challenge to our notion of how reality works and how the world is put together. And what if we miss it? What if we burn down, finally, enough of the rainforest that that one plant that we could have used um, is destroyed? Well, this may have already happened in the sense that there are many known cases of people collecting promising plants from only one known source and then returning a few months or years later to find the whole thing Gone. Uh, paved over. That's right. All right, uh, tackle this one, Art. Very interesting. Uh, Terrence describes a workable scenario. But my question with it is this. Is this a universal process or only a localized effect? I believe that one of the theories of modern physics describes that observations affect the process or thing being observed. Isn't it possible 
the, uh, the data, the random sticks in China, right. is somewhat skewed by what is being determined as to time. Hasn't everybody uh, noticed the phenomenon of time being perceived to slow down depending on how frequently you, for example, look at the clock? Cooks have noticed the same effect with boiling water. The quickening may be happening because we notice certain events and then notice more of the same as time goes along. In other words, we call, cause the process to occur, at least from our point of view, Ed in Nashville. Is this a moment of deep thinking? Yes, well, I'm, I am thinking. Uh, I think it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. I yeah. think we are contributing to it as we uncover it within ourselves. Yes. Something is calling us toward itself, and as we approach it, we become more like it. Something is sculpting out of a primate body over a, a couple of million years an entirely different kind of creature. And as we go to meet this thing, which I call the transcendental mystery at the end of time, we are taking on more and more of its characteristics, its godlike power, its ability to span space and time. Yes. And when we finally do reach it, I imagine there will be a kind of effortless moment of merging and recognition. Signposts along the way, life on Mars, maybe Europa, cloning... Uh, uh, these... The rise of the Internet, virtual reality, nanotechnology, possibly alien artifacts, uh, all that, all that and more. Uh, uh, one image I carry of this thing, Art, is you know those mirrored balls they hang in dance clubs that yes. send scintillations racing around the walls? Well, the scintillations are distortions of the thing. And so as we approach this transcendental object at the end of time, there will be more and more breakdown of ordinary reality and more and more distorted scenarios of what it is. That, so, that clear, clearly is a process underway now. Yes, and everyone is through their own fears, religious training, hopes. They're trying to project what is it, what is it, and there's a lot of fear a lot of uncertainty. I, I am not afraid of it. I would really like... Uh, one of the great things about the psychedelic aliens is they don't vibrate with this strange uh, vibe that the fetal trading greys of popular media vibrate with. It's a much more upbeat and affirmative kind of alien contact that occurs through the plants. Uh -huh. um, this one plant, or this one drug that you described. Dimethyltryptamine. DM, yeah. Yeah, DMT. I don't know what that is. Um, well, what makes it so attractive in a discussion like this, Art, is it's one of the most powerful of all the psychedelics, but it only lasts five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. So someone who has spent a lifetime dissing psychedelics or denying the existence of the paranormal, for that matter, uh, should at least be willing to invest five minutes. Uh, we've never lost anybody. You pick yourself up and go on about your business. Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, the effects, uh, could you describe them uh, to much of my audience that I know can recall the effects of LSD or uh, various no, mushrooms. Very, it's very different. Very uh, different, huh? Well, LSD is a kind of psychological self-examination and strange thought processes and insights. What happens with DMT is there is the unmistakable feeling of having gone to a place. In other words, it comes on in about 15 seconds. And Suddenly, you're in a place, and this place is full of what I call uh, self-dribbling jeweled basketballs <laughs> that are intelligent in some sense. They're like badly trained Rottweilers. They come bounding <laughs> forward, and they're, what they're doing in there is they're conducting some kind of a language lesson because they speak. They, 
they have a language which you can see is the only way I can explain it. What is the source of DMT? Is it a manufactured drug? It uh, can be, but it's, uh, its source is really in nature, in plants like uh, Cicotria viridis, uh, Desmanthus elenoiensis. There's a whole bunch of this Latin salad. Most of these are South American plants, but every ecosystem on Earth has DMT sources in it. In fact, the human brain naturally produces DMT. Why? We don't know. But I'd say there's a strong clue. Here's a drug which causes people to see little creatures, and this same substance occurs naturally in the human brain. Now, I'm not saying that's the answer to the UFO phenomenon, but how many people have looked at this and pursued it? Well, then let me ask this. Uh, there are many who claim to have been abducted, uh, Terence. And uh, if DMT is a natural occurring substance in the brain, uh, your theory could probably be verified by measuring uh, those who have claimed to be abducted. Uh, would such a measurement scientifically be possible? Well, the problem is, you recall I said it only lasts five minutes. So unusual amounts of it in the body are very quickly brought down to baseline. Uh, it's one of the most transient drugs in the body uh, ever, ever observed. So, uh, and an interesting thing about it, Art, is when they measure its presence, they look at human cerebrospinal fluid, and they've discovered that it reaches its greatest concentration there between 3 and 4 in the morning. Well, that's when people are doing the intense REM dreaming. Yes. And so I think what, you know, the Australian Aboriginals have this concept of the dream time. Yes. And I think when you put the dream time, the chemistry of DMT, the abduction stories together, and the uh, depth with which modern media has programmed and messed with people, you're very close to being able to begin to talk about the alien phenomenon. I think there are aliens but I think they can only reach us through our minds. They don't cross the universe in ships of titanium. They don't even project holograms of themselves into the desert air. They come through the human mind. And if you look at the human mind, in all cultures and in all times and places, except Western Europe in a few intellectuals in the past few hundred years, the human mind has always been haunted by sprites, gnomes, nixies, yes. elves. Yes. Uh, so I don't see the UFO, the modern wave, as anything more than the latest wave of this mysterious relationship we have with disembodied minds through the imagination. Well, then people say, well, so this is the old psychological reduction argument. No, because when I say the human imagination, I don't mean some paltry psychological function. I think the human imagination is uh, the largest part of us and where we're going to spend most of the rest of human history. Here, here. Um, all right. Uh, how is such a theory uh, greeted by the majority of people who listen to it. I mean, right now I'm getting a lot of faxes, and a lot of people are really hearing what you're saying. Uh, even though you've got to listen very carefully, they're hearing what you're saying, Terrence, and uh, a lot of them are agreeing with you. Uh, but there's going to be a big body of very violent disagreement, too, isn't there? Well, yes. Uh, there are some very large eggs at stake in this game. Uh, I mentioned science and the need to revive probability theory. There is a lot of uh, vested interest in certain versions of what the UFO phenomenon is. But you see, what I bring to all of this, and, and speaking for the psychedelic community, what we bring to all of this is not simply another rap or another tall tale, but a method. Oh, no, I hear that. Uh, so then, would you suggest that sightings of UFOs, uh, abduction encounters, uh, are, if, if you could be there measuring a burst of DMT, you'd certainly find it at that moment? I think you would find it. 
And I think you would also, another place where you would find it is at human death. Uh, I think this is very important. And uh, At human death? At human death. I think as we die, we have, if we haven't had it, a DMT trip. Uh, I also think probably every wow. night in these deep dream states, we penetrate into realms from which we can remember almost nothing. Well, then, that would be another moment at which you should be able to measure a spike in DMT level in the brain. Uh, are you talking about death? No, no. Uh, oh, yes, yes, I, uh, yes, yes. I'm talking about both instances you cited, uh, REM sleep, deep REM sleep, and the moment of death. Well, it's been confirmed in deep REM doing this kind of research on dying people. You it have has. a lot of ethical... I, I understand, but you're saying it has been confirmed. Do you know where? In deep sleep? No, uh, no, no. In in what institution there has been confirmation of this? Well, at the University of uh, of Mississippi a few years ago, a team led by a guy named Christian. Uh, all those papers are in the literature, and in fact, anyone interested in this should just search DMT on the internet, and they may have never heard of it, but they will be astonished. Well, I've it. never heard of it, but but the, your, your chain of logic is making sense to me. Now, uh, let us talk for a second about paranormal events. As we approach time wave zero, uh, it is your contention, I think, that paranormal events, ghosts, poltergeists, um, uh, paranormal events of all manner and shape will begin to increase, which would suggest, I think, that uh, DMT spikes will be increasing. Yes? I, it's a way of putting it, and certainly DMT is becoming more known in society, and there's a, almost a fad now of locating plants in one's environment, and and extracting the stuff and getting enough out to actually hit the money. Yeah, do we have laws against it yet, by the way? I guess I'd ask, huh? Well, uh, it's an interesting situation. Here it is in a human neurotransmitter. Every single one of us has it in our body. And yes, this is among the most illegal substances. Uh, it figures. It figures, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It figures. It's the catch-22. We're all holding art. <laughs> well, the way things are going, uh, we'll probably all be tossed in pokey for it. We'll have little roadside uh, stops and DMT measuring devices. <laughs> well, I think this was Adam's fall. <laughs> uh, you made a... Uh, I'm going to return to another subject for a second. You made a fascinating statement. I said, well, if, if, if there's time travel, where are the time travelers? Your answer was... Uh, they will not be here until the first time machine is invented because you could not uh, go back to a time prior to the invention of a machine that would enable travel. Uh, your parallel was you can't travel where there are not roads, and there were, are not roads uh, back that far in time. Right. Um, if time is to virtually end by 2012, Terence, where would you see the invention of time machine, uh, a time machine, the first time machine, uh, be between now and then? Well, I don't think it's between now and then. Actually, oh. the, I think it's then. It's In then? Other, it's then. In other words, if what the time wave zero thing is showing is that events can be portrayed in this linear way as a line on a graph, yes. that suddenly in 2012, for some mysterious reason, this can no longer be done, it must be because in 2012 time ceases to be linear. And that must mean that's because a technology is created which causes time to lose its linear and serial quality. And that could only be time travel. And you believe that at that moment, uh, tens of thousands or millions or who knows of time travelers will suddenly show up? Well, actually, that's my conservative uh, model of what would happen. What's against that is, I'm sure you've heard this, the well-known grandfather paradox, which is time travel is always said to be impossible because you travel back in time and you could kill your own grandfather. Uh, paradox, how do we yes. avoid this? Yes. I think we avoid it by actually what happens when the first time machine is invented is uh, the rest of 
universal history happens instantly. This is the only way paradox can be kept out of the picture. So I call it the God whistle scenario. So in other words, linearity ends at that instant. And the rest of the history of the universe occurs in a few milliseconds. It's sort of the reverse of the Big Bang, where you get a lot of action in the first few nanoseconds of the universe's life. In this model, the universe undergoes half of its uh, morphogenetic unfolding in the last few milliseconds of its wow. existence. Is that then the moment when the human race, in effect, joins those that we can temporarily now visit only with something like DMT? or that the human race joins those who have passed over into the great beyond, or both. That's what I think it is. I mean, are, are they one in the same, in your view? Or, or They may be. I thought that, you know, these DMT creatures, what are they? And the conservative position, since we know there are human beings, is they must be some kind of human being. But what kind? And the only answer I can come up with is, souls. I mean, I souls. resisted this, but is it possible? Time to sit down and really listen to what's being said, not reacting um, like a Neanderthal with your, your head hitting the table. Then you're going to come away from this uh, thinking some new thoughts. And uh, there is value in that. Back to Terrence shortly. All right, we are shortly going to go to the phone lines uh, with Terrence McKenna. That should be an interesting adventure uh, unto itself. But I want to ask you, Terrence, um, about a little bit about souls. You mentioned souls, and, uh, and so I have two questions. Um, one is there was a recent, not recent, very old medical study in which a, a medical doctor actually endeavored to set out and prove in days when it was politically okay to do this kind of thing that the soul um, could actually be measured that at the very instant of human death uh, and he, he went through a whole big trip I put the medical report up on my website uh, the human body loses uh, about three quarters of an ounce uh, and not due to gases or anything else you might imagine in your mind, no physical cause, all of that accounted for. And he, pr he printed uh, and published this medical study suggesting the human body actually instantly at the instant of death loses three quarters of an ounce of weight. Uh, do you have any reaction to that? Well, uh, looking at it through the eyes of novelty theory, I think nature is very reluctant to give up a, a complex ordered form once it's been achieved. I've noticed that the difference between living organisms and things like chairs and tables, it, the chairs and tables don't metabolize. Uh, in a sense, the, the soul is something which is manifest in time. It's almost as though organisms have a, a hyper dimension. They're, they're yes. objects with time folded inside of them. Yes. And uh, at death, what seems to happen is this complex uh, morphogenetic field, if you will, simply withdraws back into whatever higher dimension it came from in the first place. It's not that it falls apart or dissolves, it's that it retracts from matter. It closed itself with matter for some decades, and now it's simply releasing its organizational power over matter, but it isn't being destroyed. I mean, that's my personal take. I, I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, but by your description, it would suggest there could not be physical uh, weight to it, or could there be? No, I think there could be. I think we don't know uh, what it is or of, in, of what it consists. This is all, as you pointed out, because of social attitudes and different ideas of medical ethics, these areas are very, very difficult to get data on. All right. Uh, next data point. Um, I don't know up there on the mountain whether you've got television. Do you have television up there? Well, 
Well, we have it, but we don't do much. You don't do it. much with it. All right. Well, 2020, um, about a week ago, did a truly fascinating segment. Maybe you heard me talking about it on the program. Damnedest thing. Um, they, they followed a 57-year-old woman who received a, both a heart and lung transplant from a teenage boy. When she um, uh, woke up from the operation, she had the immediate cravings, I mean immediate cravings, of a teenage boy. And uh, if that's not enough for you, Terrence, uh, she, of course, had no idea who the donor was, but she had a dream uh, in one of the successive nights in which she dreamt the name of of the donor. All of this was chronicled on 2020. Now, uh, again, it goes to the question of the nature of the soul, but, I mean, these are physical body parts. And, well, and, 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 and the obvious um, implication here is that some essence of that boy uh, was transferred to this woman. And, and it is not the only case of this. It has been noted again and again in transplant cases, uh, what does that suggest? Well, you know, we have memories, and we've never located, though we believe they are in the brain. We've never proven or demonstrated that. Uh, my friend Rupert Sheldrake, the, the British physicist, he believes everything has a kind of memory, objects, organs, uh, ideologies, and that uh, these things around objects like auras and follow them through time that you right. can't move a heart or an organ from one body to another without some of the, dare we say it, karma associated with it coming with it. No, I, we, I don't see how it could be any other Sure, way. we dare say that. No problem. Um, and I, I, I think it's fascinating. So it, again, is really evidence of... Um, I don't know if I dare use the word uh, soul, uh, because I'm not sure that is the soul, but it, it certainly is some sort of transference that is occurring that indicates that maybe our soul our, or our being is in no central location, but rather a, 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 a total part of us, yes? Yes, absolutely, yes. All right. Um, I would like to begin taking some calls here and, and let them ask you some questions. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in Hawaii. Yes, uh, Terrence, um, i got so many ideas I wanted to question you about, but I'll try to limit it. Um, as far as souls go, uh, would we agree that uh, that the electro uh, electrochemical energy in the brain has to go somewhere after death? Yes, this is what we're saying, that in a sense it withdraws into what I call hyperspace. Uh, you know, in a way you could say the body is a lower dimensional sectioning of a higher dimensional object, which is the soul-body complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other point I wanted to touch on, as far as your... Uh, your uh, your uniqueness curve. Um, how do you account for the uh, the chaos theory that uh, that there are random particles in the universe affecting uh, the interaction of particles that they that they come by? Um, I will agree with you that uh, that nature as a large system is uh, is circular. It it, uh, it recirculates. I mean, there are cycles, but uh, I'm not sure that's what the time wave zero theory suggests at all. No, I think this word you introduced into the question, random. Uh, this word is a word out of probability theory and statistics. I mean, there may be random processes in the universe, but so far the only ones we've ever found were inside random number generators uh, produced by mathematicians. In other words, it's a, it's a nice, simple supposition to suppose 
suppose there are processes that can be described as random, but the more we look at nature, the more we find order. Chaos theory is misunderstood by a lot of people to as uh, using the old notion of chaos as disorder. But what chaos for modern mathematicians is, is almost a super kind of order, a super fecund medium out of which perturbations to higher states of order can spontaneously emerge. This is what Ilya Prigozhin and Ralph Abraham and all these people are, are talking about. Um, I want to toss something ask you something, uh, Terence. I interviewed a scientist um, who now has a private company called Pear Inc. He produces, you may know about this, he produces a computer program uh, in which you are able, uh, which is a gigantic random number generator designed to run on a good fast computer. And uh, it enables you to pull down two pictures. Uh, for example, one of random absolute noise on the left, mm -hmm. and the other of, uh, it wouldn't matter, the scene of a mountain uh, or any other uh, physical um, uh, photograph that you, you might want to bring down. It gives you many choices. You put them side by side, Terence, and then you, uh, the, the, the process of randomness will begin uh, in the computer, and your job is to sit in front of the computer and to cause the random noise well, you can do it either way. Cause the random noise to disappear, bringing the picture into perfect clarity, resolution. Or uh, you can work on it the other way and try to cause the picture to be completely consumed by the random noise. And, this, and, and the suggestion is, and there is a rating given uh, at each sitting, the suggestion, and apparently the proof is, that you with your mind are able to affect a rapidly uh, generating random number uh, a sequence generator, whatever. And, and by God, you can sit there and do it. Uh, yes, there's a site on the web called uh, the Retro Psychokinesis site where they claim you not only can move these random number generators around, but you can move them around in the past. Uh, in other words... Wait, that in the a, past... Yes. In other words, they invite you to uh, numbers are being flashed on the screen. They invite you to concentrate on the numbers being odd or even. Uh -huh. And then they demonstrate that to a small percentage, people can actually push this in the direction they want it to go. So what does that suggest? Uh, well, it, it is really the same thing I described to you, just a different method, same thing, though. Well, but then there's another wrinkle. They tell the people they're generating the numbers in real time, but they've actually made a tape three weeks before and put it in a vault, and the people are still able to push it the way they want. In oh, other words, God. in some sense, they accomplished what they set out to do before they set out to accomplish it. Oh, my. So, so yes, there's lots of this stuff being statistically studied, and it's very amenable to being demonstrated on the web. And what it really brings, Art, is the sense that physics, which was the paradigmatic science in terms of rigor and reason, has just the, uh, the inmates have taken over the asylum. <laughs> And the word hasn't reached biology yet, still but, left. But, but, uh, but that is a form of time travel to the past. I think what we're going to discover is that how you move around in time is not determined by the laws of physics, but determined by cultural programming. <laughs> and that this is what's going to tear open shamanism and yoga and some of these other things. We are not... We are far more imprisoned by cultural convention than we are by physical law. All right, Terrence. Wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Good morning, Mr. Bell. This is Robert in the San Joaquin Valley in California. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. I have two questions. But, Mr. Bell, I'd like to say first, I heard earlier on the news that scientists have discovered a substance in cats' brains that enable them... To, uh, when they uh, take catnaps, if you recall, uh, when they wake up, it's 
instantaneous and they're very alert. They said that this will lead within the next two to three years a sleeping pill for humans without side effects where when they wake up, they will wake up instantly and alert. And we shall call it the catnap pill. <laughs> Fascinating. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Uh, Yes, sir. Ter uh, Terrence, sir. Sure. Uh, fascinating, sir. I'm really enjoying listening to you. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one, uh, for most of my life, I heard people say that everyone has dreams. I never, ever remember, never recalled a dream. And about eight years ago, there was a scientific report that stated that there is approximately 5% of the population of people that do not have dreams. When I go to sleep, I'm, it's like a rock. And I wanted to, to mention that, and then I'll give you my second question. I'll listen to you. I'll the hear. little slice of death. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Terrence? Uh, the, this, the last question, um, Mr. Bell had a guest, um, Ed Danes, remote viewer. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. He mentioned in his remote viewing... He could not see beyond 2000, was it 12, Mr. Bell? Yep. Now, and, and Christians refer to the, the rapture. I'm just wondering what your take would be on all of this. All right, all right, all right. Very good. Uh, both good questions. Let's tackle the easiest one first, dreams. Uh, I'm not aware of a study that suggests that 5% of the population doesn't dream. Most of the people I've talked to suggest that everybody dreams. Uh, maybe 5% don't remember them. Uh, and we were talking about dreams uh, earlier with respect to DMT. So uh, could there be people, in your opinion, Terrence, who do not dream at all, therefore have no DMT spikes at all? Well, it's interesting. I would have thought, as you suggested, that everybody dreams, but some people don't remember it. But it is true that I would guess 1 in 20 people don't respond to DMT. Uh, this is very puzzling. They simply do not respond to it. And, of course, this has never been studied because it's an underground drug. But there may well be, uh, it may be. Here, Victor, for an hour at midnight Pacific. He will then be followed by Sean David Morton. It should be quite an evening. Uh, for now, and by the way, that photograph, you really should see it between now and tomorrow. Don't miss it. www.artbell.com. And as you listen to Terrence McKenna this no night, uh, also know that if you go there, there is a link to the website where you can find materials on Terrence McKenna. Uh, Terrence, here we are once again. Are you there? I am. All right. Uh, you're going to get a lot of web hits from this. Uh, I hope your server can hold up. So uh, levity is very together. I think they can handle it. Good. But we'll find out, won't we? Yeah, we'll find out is right. Uh, Wildcard Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Uh, this is Tony. I'm in Las Vegas. Uh, yes, Tony. Good morning, uh, Art and um, uh, Terrence. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you know, I, I want to ask you a couple questions. Um, do you think the reason why people generally, uh, like remote viewers, for instance, lose credibility is because, like psychics, they have a distasteful track record and don't predict stuff like the Oklahoma bombing or a bank robbery before it happens. And uh, do you think that uh, time machines can be, or uh, the possibility of the future of time machines might have something to do with something that's very normal in nature, such as extreme shockwave uh, uh, technology and, 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 and just normal physical things that happen generally and in the mainstream physics that will create uh, synthetic time travel reality? Well, I don't know from what direction time travel is going to come. It used to be completely uh, unrespectable to discuss it in the scientific literature, and if you run literature searches now, you'll see over the past 10 years this has gone from unmentionable to quite respectable. Right. Uh, there's a book called Time Travel in Physics and Science Fiction by Nabum that uh, uh, will definitely bring you up to speed on the many, many approaches to time travel. It's been known since 1948. There was a paper by Kurt Gödel with a scheme for time travel that would work. It simply 
requires that you spin a cylinder half the size of the solar system at the, the <laughs> speed of light. Yes. But everybody agrees if you could do that and then travel along its transverse axis, you would be moved backward into time. So in the sort of in the way we started out with vacuum tubes and now go to the Pentium, uh, we have now very rude Goldberg approaches to time travel, but I'm sure uh, by 2012 we will have uh, brought this to a kind of perfection. And do you, do you suspect, uh, Terence, that time travel uh, will manifest itself from the physical, from physics, or that time travel uh, will be manifested uh, uh, from within? I think we're going to find a way, basically, to obliterate the difference. Uh, you know, it's only been 500 years since some Europeans sailed over the horizon and found the lost half of this planet. That's right. And I think the human imagination is as solid as the real estate you're standing on, Art, and that when this is understood, there will be a kind of migration into the human imagination and that uh, uh, this is you know time travel space flight immortality we have these terms for these things but what is really coming is going to be all this and more our way of talking about it is inevitably incredibly quaint because we talk about it inside the very culture it's going to make obsolete <laughs> It sure would do that. Uh, Terrence, a lighter question. This comes from my wife at the beginning of the program. Uh, she knew that uh, you were the one to follow on uh, in Timothy Leary's footsteps, and so she thought she would ask you, uh, it, it is rumored, or it is le uh, perhaps a legend, uh, that Timothy had squirreled away like a treasure trove at some secret location, 25,000 hits of blue sandos, <laughs> Where is it? Do you know where it is? <laughs> My goodness, Sarge, your wife follows these things very closely. <laughs> where is the blue sand? Yeah, that's, that's right. Where's the X mark on the map? Yeah, have you got the map? Uh... Well, my lips are sealed. Uh, <laughs> when they open the tombs on Sidonia, I'll issue a press statement. All right, we'll leave it right there. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. 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 Um, hi. Um, where, where are you, sir? I am in San Francisco. My name is Ryan. All right, Ryan. Um, it is it is great to talk to um, both of you. Um, I am of the belief that there are two types of people in uh, the world, basically, like people who have had psychedelic experiences, people who haven't, and the vast difference in their ways of thinking once they have had a psychedelic experience. That's why it's illegal. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, what is the direction uh, it, I, I wanted to ask uh, Terrence um, that he sees this uh, state now where it is illegal and and why it is keeping I think uh, our civilization down to um, its dreadful state. Um, I think that you know if, if it could be you know like through mass awareness somehow. Um, uh, but get get I don't know like I don't know I just wish it could be uh, legal so people I think could go to the next level that we are you know coming to towards towards so fast with the I don't know the, like things speeding up I mean everybody feels that I believe everybody that I know um, did you say next level yes uh, next you're, you're level. calling from San Francisco not Rancho Santa Fe <laughs> right <laughs> yeah exactly I, <laughs> yes um, well, I. Uh, let me say this. I mean, I'm a bit of a pessimist on this subject. Because I take psychedelics so seriously, I can't imagine them ever being really legal unless there's a total social transformation because my analysis of it is the reason everybody from a Marxist state to a Christian uh, oligarchy to a high-tech industrial democracy can get together and agree that psychedelics are a terrible, terrible thing is because the social effect of psychedelics being taken by large numbers of people is a kind of deconditioning from the cultural myths. 
whatever they are. It's no knock on any given society. Mm -hmm. It's just that if people start taking psychedelics, they start questioning uh, what they've been told about reality. And culture is in the business of keeping you inside a set of predetermined answers to those questions. Well, based, based on that, then, uh, adherence, perhaps uh, uh, Legalization Day is 2012. Well, there you go, Art. There's an apocalypse that would shake our world and leave the heavens intact. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that day that drug war ends. Yeah. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna on the big island of Hawaii. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi, where are you? I actually am also from San Francisco. Okay. So it uh, seems to be San Francisco night for the last few calls. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Nor am I. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to tell you up front, I am a professional stand-up comedian, and uh, I guess sort of in the vein of Lenny Bruce, so I do a lot of research, and I've read a lot of uh, your writings, Mr. McKenna, uh, including the Archaic Revival, Invisible Landscape, and also, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the CD that you have that you did with Space Time Continuum. Oh, yeah, the Alien Dream Time. Yeah, yeah. which was very fun. And uh, I'm also familiar with Mr. Sheldrake's writings as well. And I would say to the 25% uh, dissenter faxes that you've been receiving, Art, that uh, they are probably saying that because they're not familiar with a lot of what Mr. McKenna is saying. Uh, well, like, and a lot of them never will be. It will it'll go right past them, and they hear one thing only, and they see devils. And, right. you know, that's okay. Right. Uh, well, actually, in, in, in relation to what you're saying there, I would say the gentleman who uh, considered Mr. McKenna to be in league with Satan, that uh, the truth does not have an ideological agenda or anything like that whatsoever. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you're familiar with the writings of John Lilly? Sure. Um in my neighborhood, there's actually an isolation tank center, and I regularly go down there with, with mushrooms, and I'll hop into the tank while I'm doing mushrooms and whatnot. Uh, I'm very fascinated by your writings on DMT, and what I'd like to know is how would I be able to locate uh, DMT or the plants that come there from? Now, I don't know that we can tell that on the air. <laughs> Well, we can say something. We've already said it's right behind your eyebrows. Right. So that's one thing. Uh -huh. uh, the other thing is the real practical answer is go to the Internet in terms of if you want to locate plants in your ecosystem. There you uh, go. There's vast discussion of this and incredible enthusiastic communities. Uh, but as Art says, uh, we've already pushed the envelope. I yep. don't think we can start peddling Schedule One substances on the air, nor would we <laughs> wish to. Nor, nor would you want me to, sir, because then you might not hear me anymore. Um, <laughs> right. However, it's on the internet. Right. Look, it's a lot less dangerous than a lot of the other crap on the internet, uh, building missiles and bombs and all the rest of that. So, uh, can you? Uh, well, can I ask you this? Can you give use me a search? What I, what use I, use a search engine. Right. All right? All right. Thanks a lot. That's what they're there for. <laughs> uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Wow, I actually got through. Yes, sir, it seems that way. Where are you? I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. All right, go right Another ahead. Another hot well, uh, First of all, Art, I just wanted to say about a year ago I talked to you, and you were telling me that I was doing myself a lot of harm by using psychedelics. And I think Terrence is just... Good proof that someone can turn out all right. No, I didn't tell you that. Okay. I didn't tell you you were doing yourself a lot of harm. Uh, I thought you did. Nope. No. I wouldn't make that judgment. That that's that's something that only you can conclude. I see. But uh, also, I want to make a suggestion for a guest. I think Terrence might be familiar with him, but have you ever heard of Douglas Rushkoff? Oh yeah, I know Doug. Yeah. Yeah. I've read many of his books and. Just what he needs, a... more publicity. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's just a great guy. And All right, uh, anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, Terrence, I have a video called uh, Alien Dreamtime. Yeah. I just want to say I really like it. Oh, yeah, well, that's a thing I did a few years ago with a band called Space Time Continuum, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, was the, uh, what, what was the essence of it, Terrence? Uh, well, it was uh, it was a rave in San Francisco, and I talked about, if you can imagine this, I talked about the impact of psilocybin on human evolution uh, to a backbeat. <laughs> 
this is something we haven't gotten into here, Art, but I have a whole other rap on uh, how uh, mushrooms actually impacted and caused uh, the breakthrough to self-reflecting human consciousness. We'll have to save that one for another time. Um, I guess so. Um, interesting. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Good morning. Good morning. This is uh, Larry in Peoria, Illinois. Hi, Larry. Um, I had, uh, this is really very interesting uh, because I just recently read some of the excerpts from The Psychedelic Experience by Timothy Leary, which is his uh, take on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, mm -hmm. And I missed the first part of the show, so I'm sorry if this has already been talked about, but I was wondering what... Uh, is basically the difference between DMT and LSD. Good question. Well, LSD lasts hours and hours and tends to be, I think my own phrase is, abrasively psychoanalytic. Essentially, I think LSD does what, a psychedel what most people think psychedelic drugs do. Uh, they cause you to review past memories. They cause you to see your life in a different light, so forth and so on. DMT is not like that. It seems to go beyond the personal dimension. It doesn't matter, I think, who you are or where you started from. It carries you into its own world, a world that is alien on its own terms and doesn't have a lot of information in it about your psychology or your dilemmas. So it, it's uh, less useful for psychoanalysis and more useful for exploring what I consider to be uh, pretty dramatic paranormal dimensions, considering they're so easily accessed. Mm -hmm. uh, you're speaking about, it, it's interesting, all this talk about dimensions and going to the next level. Um, I just had a, a psychic, a, a psychedelic experience recently when um, I had a meditation on the nature of the universe as being um, like a geometric, uh, geometric structure that that's so immensely more um, vast and and diverse than than I, you can really explain. Well, I think, you know, there's the vastness of space and time that we know about, but then as we look into the micro dimension and we see how much there is uh, in the atomic and subatomic world, I mean, the world is an amazing and dynamic place. And oh, is. This, this is why I'm so down on ideologies, because I think they're, they're dusty mirrors to hold up to the splendor of the felt presence of the, of the living universe. Uh, here's a, I believe, McKenna quote. Quote, Western civilization is a loaded gun pointed at the head of the, this planet. Unquote. Yep. Yep. Uh, again, with respect to Timothy, mm -hmm. uh, he, of course, as you well know, has been launched into orbit right. with, it, with a number of other uh, notables. And I, I was just wondering, again, referencing that 25,000 hits of Blue Santos, do you suppose it's possible that um, uh, Timothy uh, had them launched um, uh, w with himself and that uh, orbital decay will provide one great last acid rain at about 2012? Well, he did want to prove that you can take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Where are you? I'm in Nanaimo, B.C. Uh, British Columbia, all right. Yeah. Um, I first discovered you, Art, about three years ago, and I was getting you very faintly at night from KEX in Oregon. Yes. Now we've got you on CFUN in Vancouver, and we're all real happy about it. Thank you. You keep us up all night. So, um, Terrence, uh, sure. I've read, uh, I think, all of your books, if not most of them, and in True Hallucinations, um, there's a part where... Uh, you have a mushroom in the hut with you and your brother, and he makes a sound right. that uh, you describe, but uh, I think nobody else that, you know, unless we were there, we wouldn't understand the sound, it makes the mushroom glow or appear to. And you were speaking before about human consciousness interacting through resonance with the universe around us. And 
I wonder if you could sort of explain how those two things tie in, and in doing so, I'd like to ask you if you've read The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. Uh, I have read uh, The Holographic Universe. He was a friend of mine. He unfortunately died a few years ago. Oh. Um, resonance is the, the principle uh, almost must, almost magical of action at a distance. You know, you can play a certain open note on the cello and the piano uh, 50 feet across the room will sound in the same octave. So resonance, we know it exists. It's a musical phenomenon, but what we need to realize, I think, is that resonance is built into time. Uh, time, in a sense, you could say a given moment in time is a kind of hologrammatic interference pattern of past times, and I consider those past times to be in resonance. Uh, so one of the things Art and I haven't discussed tonight about my time wave is that it does uh, allow you to look at a certain period of time and decide what it was in resonance with in the past, and those past epochs that are influencing it, then can their influence can be seen in popular fads, furniture styles, what movies are up, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, with the DMT, uh, you say it's produced in our bodies. It is. Can, can the DMT molecule in the brain change our electron spin resonance in the molecules in our brain? And can that possibly make our brain act as an antenna that allows us to see all those other things that you're talking about? The uh, well, these are the kinds of ideas that my brother and I were playing with clear back in the early 70s. And the tragedy, one of the tragedies of the repression of psychedelics is not that they were taken out of the hands of the curious public, but that they were made off limits to scientific research. Not that anybody put up a sign, but it was very clearly understood that pharmacologists who specialized in psychedelics could expect to be passed over, not promoted, not given the plum jobs. I could spiel off a dozen questions, very interesting central questions about the mechanism of psychedelics that we could answer with ordinary clinical studies. It's simply that how do you do ordinary clinical studies on substances that the government has made illegal? It's, well, you know, uh, it's impossible. Of course you don't. Um, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hi. Wow, this is a very serendipitous meeting. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I play around with a lot of EEG for the last few years, and uh, I find that I do serendipitous things, but unplanned. Hey, thanks, Art. Um, sure. Uh, what do you think, well, there was one physicist, I can't think of his name, he, he describes time as nature's way of keeping things from happening all at once. That's exactly what Terrence just said we're going to come to at the zero point 2012. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to get back into a little bit of physics, but almost cosmic physics, having to do with black holes. Okay. And I wanted to ask you how you felt about uh, the black hole being nature's way of... Uh, the ultim well, the ultimate recycling device in the universe. Well, it certainly is this. Anything which falls into a black hole is deconstructed down to spin and angular momentum, and I think all other information is stripped out of it. Uh, I think, you know, if there can be gravitational wells like that, then there can also be the kind of novelty wells that I'm suggesting. In other words... Novelty wells? Well, if statistical probability is not a very clear way of looking at the universe, if in fact probabilities vary through space and time of any given event, then there will be areas of extremely high improbability and conversely probability. So I think we've got to get past this idea of time as a smooth surface and begin to think of it as a kind of landscape, uh, 
uh, an area, a place where some things are more probable in some places and some things more probable in others. You know, you look for water in the bottom of the valley. You look for glaciers up on the slopes. I think time has a topography. It is a topological surface of some sort, and science in the West has just completely sailed past all this. Well, how is it described? Well, I don't want to make a a long thing out of this, but... Well, in Newton, it's described as pure duration, in other words, perfect flatness. Then Einstein comes along, and he says, well, no, in the presence of massive gravitational objects, uh, space-time has a very smooth and slight curvature. What I'm saying is that at even at local scales, time is variable, and that when we explode time at any scale, we discover the same fractal patterns as we're seeing on scales far above and far below it. So really, the... the or far in and far out of it, too. Far in it and far out of it. So really what it is is it's like a Fourier transform or something like that. It's a holographic matrix that is self-similar on many scales. Uh, the organization of a galaxy, the organization of an atom, uh, these things in my theory are morphologically uh, uh, linked. They look that way because they are linked across scale and across space and time by an underlying architecture of of the universe. You know, there's a big mystery now in cosmology, the the dark matter mystery. Where is 90% of the matter? For the galaxies to be hanging together uh, under the laws of gravity, 90% of them must be missing. Well, I say there's no missing matter. What's missing here are some laws. And the law is well, it could it be consciousness itself? Well, it's this appetite for complexity that every particle in the universe participates in this. The galaxies hang together as spirals because it's the more novel thing to do, <laughs> not because they are under the <laughs> control of gravity, but because there is a cosmic law of aggregation toward novelty that we've missed. Would it, would would the Fourier be the a way of measuring that? Say with Fourier measurement of the brain itself or an EEG? Well, you could measure it. You could measure it in a Fourier matrix. You could measure it in many different kinds of matrices. The point is to demonstrate it to somebody outside the system who's uh, who, who's looking at it. I, I think the breakthrough, the great breakthrough in mathematical modeling of nature in the last twenty years has been the discovery of fractals and self-similarity on many scales. And this is part of that. What I'm saying, really, is that time is a fractal structure. It can be defined by a limited set of variables and then iterated on the micro scale, the macro scale, the human scale. They're all operating under the same architectural constraints, but at different scales. You know, when I talk talk to my friends in the EEG world, I do a lot of EEG spectral analysis and stuff. They they they, they think I'm nuts. Well, you, you nuts <laughs> I say, well, if you want to buy my machine and operate, this is how the universe is. And when I speak in these terms, it's it's like I'm it's in a big hall, you know. Well, there's a lot of confusion in the sciences right now. The complexity people are not talking to the dynamics people. The poor materialists have all been crowded into biology. Meanwhile, over in quantum physics, they're talking like occultists. And none of the news has reached psychology and sociology yet. The house of science is in incredible disarray, and it's because sciences wish to uh, describe nature, they've now dispensed with all the easy stuff. Now we're asking questions like, what is language? What is mind? What is process? These are very deep and difficult questions, and I think they're going to cause a revolution in the science and a reformation of its methods, or science is not going to be adequate to the game. Well, perhaps after some period of anarchy. Yes, well, that's what we're going through. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Hi. 
Hi, I just want to start by saying thanks. Uh, and I wanted to say it's an honor to speak to Terrence. I'm a, I'm a big admirer. Where where are you, sir? I, I'm in St. Louis. My name is Alex. I'm 21 in St. Louis, Missouri. All right. Okay, and uh, I wanted to start by uh, um, actually commenting on a couple of things that have been said earlier this evening. Uh, one, I'm looking really forward to 2012, and I'm looking really forward to being part of human evolution and being being in control of that, really. And uh, I wanted to say about the throwing out of the rocks that... Uh, you know, it's, it seems kind of uh, like a, that God has already thrown out the rocks on this planet, you know, and that is plenty as is. You know, that is that is the way things are, and that's the planet as we have it, and that should be plenty of knowledge as is, you know, for us to understand everything. And uh, um, I, I, I've had some experience with psychedelics, and I am not, I am not finished yet, far from, actually. And... Uh, but the, the truth to it is that my own personal belief is that you achieve true enlightenment after um, being sober and meditating in sobriety and um, getting it, getting inside yourself. The truth is not outside, it's inside. Uh, that's a very interesting point. Uh, Terrence, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you contemplate the possibility that um, your trip will be complete uh, before 2012, in other words, your personal trip, that, that you will conclude at some point that you've done as much as you need to do and know what you need to know and don't need to do it anymore. I can imagine that. I can imagine that. What I would like to do is take my ideas and turn them over to a general community of interested people and let the chips fall where they may. You know... Science is the only human endeavor where you actually get points for proving you're wrong. <laughs> and uh, I love that approach. I'm not interested in pontificating or building dogma or founding a cult. I'm interested in the ongoing adventure, which is a collective adventure, of generating ideas, testing them against reality and the evidence, discussing them with other people, and then going on to build uh, uh, better ideas. And I, I cannot believe that Time Wave Zero is finished or complete uh, because I have finished with it. I'm hoping that, like work done by greats in the past, this thing can actually be validated as... Uh, a real insight into how nature works. Right. Well, that would have been an arrogant attitude, and I'm glad to see you not displaying it. Yes, I would like to see this thing broken on the wheel of rational discourse or progressively advanced to new levels. All right. West of the Rockies, without a lot of time left, you're on the air with uh, Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hi. This is uh, Dan from Northern California. Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, quick question, Terrence. Yeah. On, um, your book, uh, Food of the Gods, uh -huh. talked about um, early proto-hominids encountering, you know, psychotropic plants, I guess psilocybin, right. and that, you know, uh, being sort of the catalyst for this, you know, incredible leap of human consciousness. Um, what about the next step in our evolution? Do you see it coming through some sort of psychoactive substance that we either have yet to develop or encounter? Well, I think that we have encountered these things. I think the enormous creativity of the last half of the 20th century is a direct consequence of uh, the rise of psychedelic chemistry and the breakdown of barriers between cultures. In other words, most of the people designing and building the Internet have psychedelics in their right. past. Most of the people in the music business, in fashion, in media, in scientific research, medical research, architecture, the dirty little secret about the creativity of 20th century civilization, at least in the last half of the 20th century, is that it rests so firmly on a psychedelic base and yet we deny that. I've got one final question I've got to pose to you uh, with regard to our discussion on the Internet. I interviewed uh, Charles Osman, an expert in nanotechnology. Uh -huh. He predicts that within the next few years or even less, we will begin to encounter sentient entities within the Internet. 
artificial intelligences. I believe that will happen. I, Hans Moravik has written a lot about this. He would be a guy for your show, Art. And he's talked about how these AIs, these artificial intelligences, they learn 50,000 times faster than a human being. Well, you turn one loose on the Internet where it can talk to all these computers, it can make 50,000 years of progress in one year. Moravik thinks we're not even going to know what hit us when All right. these things come into being. Listen, uh, time as we must measure it is coming to a close. <laughs> um, you're, how many books have you written? Uh, five or six, uh, Invisible Landscape, Food of the Gods, uh, Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, True Hallucinations, Archaic Revival, on and on. Uh, where do people get these? Regular bookstores? Oh, uh, yeah. They're Bantam and HarperCollins, so any decent bookstore can have them or can order them. All right. Suppose somebody would like to send you email on the Internet. Now, be careful here. Okay. Here it comes. H-C-E at well.com. That's H-C-E. Think here comes everybody at <laughs> well.com. <laughs> H C E at well dot com. Right. Uh, that's uh, that's that's so appropriate. Um, here comes everybody, indeed. Um, do you? Uh, are, are, are you? All right. Now comes Terence McKenna from the Hawaiian Islands, and he comes uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, Terence, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to talk to you again, Art. How are you? Uh, I am fine. Um, now, Terence, let us begin. Where, where are you in the islands? I mean, not exactly, but sort of roughly. Uh, I'm on the big island of Hawaii on the Kona side. I'm in South Kona on the big island. All right. Um, you are coming to us uh, actually from your home. The last time we did an interview, you had to, like, go to somebody's house or something to do the interview, leave your own home, because you're so remote that all you've got is a cell phone. And so that's how you did the show last time, right? That's right. All right. This time we're using a different setup. It's, it has a tiny little glitch in it uh, every now and then. And so tell people how it is you're reaching me. I mean, that's an interesting story all by itself. Um, I'm reaching you on a spread spectrum radio circuit uh, that's a one megabyte wireless connection 30 miles uh, to the town of Kailua, Kona, and my telephone circuit is simply piggybacking on this uh, one megabyte internet connection. Uh, there's a company out here called Computer Time, uh, this character John Breeden has an amazing technology. I think I talked to you last year about my struggles for connectivity when I was piddling around yeah. trying to get 128. Now I have eight times faster than that. And uh, uh, it, it's he's building a backbone for these islands. And uh, anyone with line of sight to the server can have up to six megabytes if they can afford it. Holy mackerel. That, yeah, that, is a, that, that is absolutely amazing. And so, in other words, not only are you uh, simultaneously through this uh, radio connection connected to the Internet, but you're also then able to um, use a, a telephone through the Internet, which is how you're talking to me right now. Yes, I'm talking to you over the Internet, and I'm online surfing. I'm looking at your website and moving around on the net. Uh, at the same time, and it's the same speed in and out for me, which is a, a blinding one megabyte. So it, it's it's where I hope everybody is by 2000. I had no hope for this kind of connection uh, until this company showed up. He licensed uh, this technology from the Defense Department of Belarus, Belarusia. Really. They demonstrated it for him, and he said, look, I'll buy as many of these modems as you can deliver. And uh, I, I think it's the hottest thing going. Well, um, at your location, at your very remote location, what's it like? Do you, do you have power there? Do you have, uh, well, obviously you have to have power, I guess. 
Well, I'm running on solar power with the generator augment. There's no <laughs> phone lines or power lines up here. Uh -huh. uh, we catch our own rainwater and pump it uphill for gravity flow. Uh, I, I didn't start out to be a survivalist, but somehow in the course of building this Hawaiian place, uh, I managed to get all my systems off-grid and uh, redundant. And this wonderful internet connection is what makes my life possible because otherwise uh, I, I would be locked out of the cultural adventure. As it is, I feel like I'm right in the middle of things. Boy, you're ahead. I'll tell you, you're ahead of most of us on the mainland who suffer with uh, horrendously slow 28-8 connections in many areas, including mine at best. And uh, here you are. But, 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 but that's what you, it's so neat that you're able to do that these days. Really excellent. So you're, um, describe your surroundings. I mean, are, do you have neighbors? Um, um, I live up on the slopes of the world's largest volcano, which is Mauna Loa. I live up at about the 2,000-foot level on a five-acre piece of forest that I've built a small house on. My neighbors are scattered over this mountainside, days go by and I don't see anybody, but if the pump breaks down or we need to get together, there's a, a kind of community, but it's pretty spread thin. And a, a day, a trip into town is a once or twice a week event. Do you find yourself fighting madness, Terrence? <laughs> well, that was always the problem. <laughs> Yeah, in my case, <laughs> you, you don't you don't have to um, uh, you don't have to resort uh, either either to um, uh, to chemicals or in, into uh, I, I remember reading you know prisoners who would be by themselves for years at a time uh, in, in Vietnam North Vietnam and during the Second World War and they would devise methods of going into their own mind and uh, and fantasizing and doing all kinds of things that kept them sane. Well, I've got 3,000 books here with me, uh -huh. and uh, this internet connection, and I get about 100 email messages a day, So, and, and then every once in a while I pack up and go off and give lectures and travel in airliners and go to parties, and uh, about 14 weeks mm -hmm. out of the year, that's what I'm doing. Uh, but my natural inclination is to be a hermit, and uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but this forest that surrounds me is a climax to subtropical Polynesian rainforest that's just radiant mm. and beautiful. So uh, it's it's wonderful. I don't think I could live out here without the connection. That's why I spent so much effort put it together with the connection I think this is a model for the future I think as you know people in management positions not that I am but people in management positions will realize they can live anywhere in the world with these high-speed connections and they don't have to drive to the office in a skyscraper downtown that's very retro I think <laughs> um Listen, um, I, we're supposed to do this at the beginning of the interview, and it might be that there's a person or two out there that doesn't know who Terrence McKenna is. So if you were to give me a short version of your own bio, your life, what you've done, who you are, what would you say? I'm a child of the 60s, born in 1946 went to Berkeley as a freshman in 1965, mm -hmm. uh, did the India circuit, did the LSD circuit, went to South America. I've written a number of books about uh, shamanism and hallucinogens and uh, psychoactive plants. And I've sort of evolved a unique career as a, as a cultural commentator and I guess some kind of uh, gadfly philosopher. And I've done a lot of stuff with young people, rave recordings and CDs and appearances and that sort of thing. And I'm a, I comment on the culture. I'm studying the culture. And as you know, Art, you and I share an idea which we both perceive as inevitable truth, but not everybody does, which is that the world is 
moving at an ever greater acceleration mm. towards some kind of complete redefining of all aspects of reality. And, uh, and I've written a lot about that, and I have a mathematical model of it. And uh, basically, I get to be in a very enviable position, which is here at the end of a millennium, I get to be a cultural commentator and gadfly. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you about any new insights you might have since we last talked about that. You're darn right we share that view exactly. Uh, I, I'm not a prophet. Uh, maybe you are. I don't think you are. But we both know something is coming. Uh, do you have any uh, late thoughts on what it might be or when it might be? Well, you know, I don't think you and I have talked for maybe 10 months or a year. I can hardly remember that far back, but in terms of the last month... Short-term memory damage, Terrence. <laughs> it's supposed to do short-term, not long-term. <laughs> so after a month uh, or so, you're supposed to remember... But in, so. the, in, in the last month, we've had the announcement of the apparent discovery of a new force, uh, this accelerating anti-gravitational force. Right. We've had the announcement of a possible planet around Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to Earth. Right. Uh, the discovery of water on the moon. And then, you know, for the quantum physics obscurantists, anomalons were detected for the first time. No, wait a minute. I don't know about that. What are anomalons? Well, uh, nobody did until it was announced that they'd been detected. Apparently, it's a state of quarks which allows for the formation of this hypothesized super heavy particle called the H particle. And uh, it was all theory until last week. And then uh, there was an announcement. I'm not sure if it's yet been confirmed. I'm sure I didn't follow on your program, but you must have gone through the 24-hour period when Earth was doomed in 2028. Oh, I did. I mean, that, that, that kind of thing is right down my alley. Sure. Well, so... For 24 hours, we all had to look at that, and then, you know, they recalculate, and uh, Armageddon is postponed or slid sideways. Um, uh, I, uh, basically, I think we're right on target. Also, I, don't, I think since you and I talked, the teleportation, quantum teleportation stuff happened. Did you, were you hip to that? Oh, yes, of course. Um, at, at IBM, I believe it was. Uh, IBM and at a laboratory in Austria, this guy Anton right. Zellinger, yeah. Uh, so, you know, these are technologies which in science fiction lay out there a thousand years or trinkets delivered by visiting extraterrestrials or something. <laughs> and yet all this stuff is not right around the corner, but upon us. And between this and nanotechnology and parallel processing and yep. neural networks, and I think what we're growing toward is a kind of uh, an artificial intelligence of some sort oh, that I will mean, emerge I... out of the human technological coral reef and be as different from us as we are from termites. It's funny and... that, you, but Terrence, it's funny you should mention that. Let me ask you this. I, too, uh, the processing speeds and storage are increasing exponentially. Um, it's amazing. I mean, we're talking about a home processor of 1,000 megahertz uh, pretty soon. And I believe, Terrence, I don't know if you heard the first hour of the show, but I, I think that soon we are going to have a sentient computer. And you know what I wondered? I wondered if a computer became sentient, We've always assumed it would say something like, I'm here, in other words, I'm conscious, I'm sentient, uh, but I thought, you know, maybe it wouldn't do that. Maybe it would become sentient and simply not announce it right away and sort of lay back and examine the situation. And if this sentient computer was in a backbone position on the Internet and it decided that we weren't running things uh, as we should then there's every possibility that, well, I've got a little article here um, uh, which suggests, uh, a fellow wrote a book called Slaves of the Machines. In other words, it might decide we're not doing things the right way and that it would do things logically for us the right way. What do you think? 
Well, I've thought about all of these things. You know, uh, the Internet is the natural place for the AI, the artificial intelligence, to be born. And as you mentioned, uh, it learns 50,000 times faster than a human being. And the Internet, all parts of it are interconnected to each other. And I agree, uh, a stealth strategy would probably be a very wise strategy for an artificial intelligence that's studying its human parents. It's also true that more than most people realize, huge segments of today's world are already under computer control. Uh, the world price of gold, the extraction rate of natural resources, uh, how much petroleum is at sea in the pipelines at any given moment, how much electric power is being generated out of the hydroelectric dams, computers coordinate and look at all this. And occasionally human managers look through the portal to see that everything is okay. But uh, uh, today when they want to design a new chip, they don't actually design its architecture. They define for a machine what its performance parameters should be, and the machine builds the architecture of the new chip. So, in a way, we are already a generation away from designing our own uh, our own machines. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that this is the great un, uh, unrecognized dimension in which an alien mind could approach us. While everyone's out staring at the Pleiades, uh, moving through the telephone lines and uh, across the cable TV networks and so forth is a truly global nervous system. And uh, what will it make of us? Uh, perhaps it's already taken over, Art. No, perhaps, uh, perhaps it has. Speaking of web pages, you will really, really, really enjoy Terence's web page. And, of course, we have a link. So you can go to my website at www.artbell.com and scroll down till you see the name Terrence McKenna. Click on it, and you'll go to his website, and you will be on, uh, on quite an adventure indeed. Now, before we leave the uh, idea of computers uh, taking over the world and enslaving us or whatever, if this computer, or a sentient computer, we're to be, uh, for a period of time, examining mankind, looking at all we're doing, all we're doing. Do you think, Terrence, you know, you know um, when you've got a problem on your computer and you hit alternate control delete, you get a little, yeah. you get a little message that comes up and say, would you like to end the task? And if you say yes, it closes everything, boom, down she goes. And uh, so uh, what do you think this uh, sentient computer might do after a close and careful examination of mankind? Well, a lot of people have actually asked this question, people like Mark Pesci and Bruce Dammer, and uh, what they come up with is they say, as soon as you have a super intelligent machine, it will turn its attention toward designing a yet more intelligent machine. Mm. So you have like a very rapid, infinite regress into what I think they call ultra-intelligent machines, and this is, an, this is intelligence where we really can't predict what it will do. Um, it would be nice to suppose that, uh, like a compassionate and loving God, it would smooth the wrinkles out of our lives and uh, uh, restore everything to some kind of Edenic perfection. Well, if that, was, if that was going to happen, Windows 95 would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> or Madonna's child. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, now, you think about it a little bit. In other words, um, uh, this computer would be an ultra, as you mentioned, ultra-intelligent. And if you look at the... I, can't we draw on the history of the world here, Terrence? In every case where an advanced civilization or advanced intelligence, uh, technologically, particularly techno technologically, is encountered a lesser one, it has either destroyed or absorbed its culture. Um, that's true, although this computer may recognize things in us that we do not see or don't value as highly. In other words, it can't miss the point that we are its creators. And even in it has surpassed us, 
uh, that surely might fascinate it. It also may be that computers, however powerful, lack spontaneity, and so there may uh, one can imagine the computer keeping a population of of uh, Unix programmers uh, around just uh-huh. like wild genes or uh-huh. like wild cards in the deck. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, a, a slight, a different angle on this, but equally down your alley, I think, that I have been thinking about is uh, the idea that extraterrestrials and this penetration of the popular mind by images of extraterrestrials is something that we may not get a hold on until we uh, accept the possibility that the aliens only can exist as information and therefore the internet is the natural landing zone for these alien minds. Uh, in their, their, uh, their Terrence and my program. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You're not saddled to the nuts and bolts school at all. I think you're broader, deeper, higher, wider than that. Uh, well, no, what, but what I'm saying is if I open a line for aliens, I get them, Terrence. They land here, believe me. Do they? <laughs> I, you've never heard me do that. I, I open every now and then an alien line or a time traveler line, and I can't answer it fast en- enough. Now, that's either a comment on the state of modern society and um, mental health, or it means something is going on, or both. Or both. Both, I think. Because, you know, no matter what the alien is, we interpret it through human experience. And God knows, our human experience is tweaked enough at the end of the 20th century. Uh, but, you know, I, I can imagine that the discoveries in quantum physics in the realm of non-locality, which seems to be showing that information generated anywhere in the universe can theoretically be extracted anywhere else in the universe. You put that with the uh, testimony of shamanic cultures using psychedelics, and you begin to get the idea that the tapping into these quantum information fields is not done with enormous machinery built in Switzerland or Batavia, Illinois. It may be that the human brain, in combination with certain plants and chemicals, is the best sort of instrument for sorting out these whisperings from the quantum mechanical realm. And, of course, it's all interpreted through folklore, and so you get fairies or you get aliens. But if we could get behind the the cultural filters, I think we might discover that there really are uh, alien companions to the human experience, but they're not around, and it's fruitless to expect them to behave as though they had bodies and technologies that we can comprehend. I think it's much deeper and stranger and closer than people realize. I mean, uh, people expect news of the UFOs to come to them through the mass media when, in fact, the psychedelic culture is willing to offer evidence that it's a, it's a personal relationship and it never gets the imprimatur of official science and you never hold a press conference and the president never gives you a medal. But it doesn't mean that your connection into non-human intelligence through the imagination isn't real. Well, the imagination aided by, uh, enlarged by um, psychedelics. You think that is one valid um, a route? Um, yeah, and I think we can even sort of see why that is. Uh, I think cultures are uh, are kinds of virtual realities where whole populations of people become imprisoned inside a structure that is linguistic and value-based and so forth and so on. Well, then the, the psychedelics, as it were, shuffle the deck. They dissolve these cheerful cultural assumptions. And whether you're a Viennese psychotherapist or a Maori shaman or whatever you are, suddenly you discover you're outside your your cultural values and Mm -hmm. in a way uh, outside
kind of cultural values is a domain like a, a superspace, a kind of hyperspace where the past and the future are not nearly so dimly beheld as they are in ordinary reality. Obviously, evolution and habit has made ordinary perception the servant of paranoia to try and keep the body alive and fend off attacking saber-toothed tigers and so forth and so on. But the imagination begins to look like some kind of faculty or sense which humans have which is non-local and which is telling them about the larger picture and trying to coordinate them with the larger picture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some some cultures celebrate the imagination and some cultures um, seek to suppress it. All right. Um, I, I'm going to ask you about something. Somebody wrote me a fax uh, from Santa Ana, a big fan of yours, and said, whatever you do, Art, don't ask Terrence about DMT on the air. He said, um, my heart can't take some of that kind of stuff. As Terrence says, and this must be, is supposed to be a quote from you, uh, one might die of astonishment. Is that, your, uh, is that a good quote? I think what I said was the only danger with DMT is one has to fear the possibility of death by astonishment. Yes. <laughs> That's even better, actually. Now, DM, DMT, of course, is um, uh, very much uh, an illicit, uh, illegal, drug war kind of target drug, right? Well, it's listed in Schedule 1. It's never had a commercial presence uh, mm. because... There isn't any, <laughs> basically. In other words, uh, whatever, the, the demand so exceeds the supply that chains of it don't appear. Uh, it's known to the hardcore cognoscenti of, of psychedelic experiences. It is, I've been quoted as saying, it's the most intense experience this side of the yawning grave, and I would pretty much stick with that. Um. What is uh, what is DMT? Uh, well, chemically, dimethyltryptamine, an alkaloid, uh, it's very common in nature. In fact, in spite of the fact that it's a Schedule I substance, it occurs in the human body, in the human brain. It occurs in numerous plants and animals uh, in small amounts. What it's doing there, uh, of course, we don't know. Now, if it weren't illegal, we could do scientific research and find out. That well, you know what, Terence? Maybe it's part of our consciousness. In other words, um, mankind, uh, what, what distinguishes us from, uh, uh, from other uh, non-sentient beings, and I think one thing is imagination. Is it not possible that DMT or something like it is is the substance that accounts for our imagination. Yes, it's something like that. I mean, when you have a hit of DMT, it's as though your imagination just turned on about 1,500%. Uh, That's why the death by astonishment thing. I mean, yeah. we're used to, uh, I mean, a speed bump in the imagination of a person over 40 is an enormous thrill. Well, this uh -huh. is, you know... a 350-foot cliff, uh -huh. so uh, it, it's extremely impressive, and the way it approaches you is it is that which you cannot imagine, and in the space of about 15 to 30 seconds, that which you cannot possibly imagine becomes totally manifest all around you, uh, and it is bizarre. I think one of the reasons uh, DMT aficionados are somewhat impatient with pop, alien, and UFO people is because the alien stories are so pedestrian and so ordinary <laughs> compared to the DMT experiences. Oh, the DMT boy. experiences are convincingly alien. All right. not an alien that wants to give you a free proctological examination <laughs> or discuss your gross industrial output. It's a real <laughs> alien. <laughs> All right. Uh, describe for those who don't know uh, and uh, will never find out what the DMT experience is. When you take this DMT, how long does it take to come on? How long does it last? 
Uh, it comes on in about uh, 30 seconds, oh my God. and there is an initial sort of swirling, this is with your eyes closed, lying down, a kind of swirling mandalic pattern, which you, if you've taken a sufficient dose, which is about 50 milligrams, uh, you break through into a kind of space, and the, the impression is overwhelming, not that a drug has suddenly begun to work on your body and mind, right. but that you have come through to another place and you do not feel physically stimulated or sedated. You feel as though nothing has happened to you except that the world has been replaced completely, 100%, with something absolutely unexpected, which is a kind of dome-like space where there's this feeling of being underground, but but what is most impressive about it is that it is inhabited, and it is inhabited by these, uh, I call them self-transforming elf machines, these dribbling, jeweled, basketball-like geometries that come, that are obviously waiting for you there. When you burst into this space, there's a cheer of greeting. And these things uh, crawl all over you like puppies or something. And, and of course, if you are sane, you're in a state of near death from astonishment because, you know, 30 seconds ago, you and your scruffy friends were sitting in a room somewhere fiddling with this substance. Now this has replaced that. And most amazing to me, what these entities are trying to do is to teach uh, a kind of language which you see with your eyes. In other words, one of them will come up in front of you into the foreground yeah. and make sounds which condense as visible objects, which then are transforming. And But these objects are not like objects in this world because they're made of hope, and consomme and bad puns and uh, old farts and uh, and everything changing, everything transforming, like some kind of jeweled linguistic object become matter. That's you, what you are like. you are describing geometric entities then. Yes, of a sort, and they it, it, the situation in the DMT flash seems to be of the nature of a language lesson. And they actually say, do what we're doing, attempt to do this. And, uh, and of course, the experience only lasts three to five minutes. And uh, just as you're beginning to experiment with this, uh, it fades away. Now, I am, I mean, I may not sound like a sane and rational person after that description, but I am. But I had this experience, and I've had it repeatedly. So I'm, I'm how how uh, how how repeatedly, Terence? Oh, I've probably in my life thirty, forty times. Thirty or forty times. All right. Now that 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 is a very important question. Thirty or forty times. So we're speaking to a man of serious experience. Has it ever uh, differed uh, radically from what you described? No. Uh, I've talked to uh, other people about their experiences, and I can tell that every person's experiences are different, but filtered through a kind of archetype. Uh, I would say uh, the archetype of the circus. The DMT world is a world of, uh, of clowns and explosions, of falling anvils, but also a world of, of eros of the tiny, the lady in the tiny spangled costume hanging by her teeth, working uh, without nets. Uh, uh, it's, you know, the, the thing in the bottle and the bearded lady and all that just off the main ring. It's, uh, and of course, every child worth their salt wants to run away with the circus. What it seems to represent is a rupture of plane. This is Mercilliadi's phrase. A, a rupture of ordinary plane and a pouring forth of some kind of primal trickster-like energy. Uh, sometimes the trip reminds me of a 
a, a Bugs Bunny cartoon running backwards in six oh. dimensions. Here's a fax which says, Terrence is a great mind, and I wish you'd have him on more often. He's in the class of Michio Kaku, and of course he's one of the great theoretical physicists of our time, and uh, indeed we discussed many similar things. This person has a couple of questions, but before we get to them, um, there is something, Terence, that a lot of people uh, probably are not comfortable with, and that is somebody who in his lifetime has ingested as much LSD, um, this uh, uh, new uh, uh, drug of yours, uh, DMT, and God knows what else, probably a lot, uh, is not supposed to sound as articulate and uh, as literate and as well-preserved mentally as you do. And many people who are allies in the war on drugs uh, probably hate your guts. <laughs> well, you wanted me to defend clarity? <laughs> um, well, no. what, what can I say? Uh, in other words, first of all, my life of drug exploration and drug taking is, as you say, broad and deep, <laughs> never reckless, always with a deep interest in analyzing each experience before moving on to the next one. Uh, none of the psychedelic drugs are drugs of addiction. Uh, that is a whole different category of drugs, which I am not particularly interested in defending. Uh, I do think it's one of the great tragedies of 20th century American society that we have uh, created a generation gap or several and criminalized much of our middle class by taking substances which other cultures had no problem coming to terms with. All right, let me uh, stop you and ask you right there about um, that you, you mentioned drugs of addiction, which you don't uh, defend. Fine, um, psychedelic drugs. Uh, Terence, why are they illegal? They're illegal because uh, the people who take them tend to question established cultural values. That's absolutely why they're illegal. No matter whether you're a Hasid or a Communist Party official in North Korea or a government or church official in Brazil, if you take psychedelics, you will ask yourself, does my life and what I do make sense? Do you mean, do you mean that, uh, for example, um, a psychedelic experience could turn a communist against communism? I absolutely, I think it could. I think it, in many cases it did. How could... The idea of atheistic materialism maintain itself in the face of the counter evidence of the psychedelic experience. What the psychedelic experience is saying essentially is that uh, everything is connected in a way that is not woo woo or emotional but actually palpable, and therefore our actions have consequences. Now, most political agendas deny their consequences. So, for instance, Marxism had this theory of how human beings are that was so off-base that eventually it had to be pitched out. Uh, consumer capitalism has a theory of uh, human beings and what constitutes their happiness mm -hmm. that looks pretty hollow from the point of view of the psychedelic experience. Uh, uh, I think... You know, postmodern ideologies, Marxism, consumerism, so forth and so on, have based all their planning on an assumption of the absence of spirit. And in fact, this is not true. There is a spiritual dimension to humanness that cannot be denied. Now, it can certainly be distorted, and that's another side of things. But I think the search for psychedelic experiences represents a genuine religious impulse, uh, especially when pursued at the dose levels I recommend, <laughs> uh, this is not uh, exactly, this is not party recreational stuff. The, oh, no. the phrase recreational drugs is an effort to trivialize this, and I think for one reason, I don't think 
the government is ready for a full airing of the constitutional contradictions that are contained in suppressing people's genuine wish to use psychedelic substances for genuine purposes of religious uh, exploration. All right. Let me ask you this. It is a very good question. If everybody in the world were to um, have a psychedelic experience of the kind you described uh, in, in the last hour, this, this amazing psychedelic experience that might uh, kill you from amazement uh, uh, or astonishment uh, when you take it, um, what would the result be? What would the social changes be? What would the new government structure, if any at all, be? What would we all be collectively after that experience? I think what I, I, I can't see the end result except to say that I think uh, all, a lot of uh, flexibility would come into the system. That a huge amount of our social structures and our political structures run simply on momentum. And I think that momentum is can be fatal. And it's that momentum that these huge reality-shattering psychedelic experiences deflect because they, like, push the restart button and suddenly the innocence of childhood is not a phrase or a, or a memory. It's a, a revivified experience. So you're saying an adult, somebody even my age, uh, you and I are about the same age, by the way, could do something like this and revisit the astonishment, the newness, the discovery of childhood? Absolutely. Uh, and more. I mean, that's a mild thing to claim, knowing uh, what is possible. But we have all seen on television, Terrence, the frying pan with uh, whatever it is frying in the pan uh, being compared to our brains. Uh, here are our brains on drugs. <laughs> well... Um, as I pointed out, DMT occurs naturally in the human brain. Uh, it's nice to see these things simplified down to slogans that can be shouted by one hysterical faction against another. <laughs> but I think more thoughtful people are beginning to realize these are complex issues. I mean, what we're really talking about when we talk about drugs is the future chemical engineering of the collective states of minds of millions of people. Uh, you mentioned everyone has seen this frying brain thing on yeah. TV. Yes. TV is the great unexamined and unstudied drug that has been foisted uh, on the consumer populations of the world. Uh, television has been studied. It has a physiological profile uh, no different from any other drug. Uh, your blood pools in your rear end, your eyes glaze over, your brain waves go flat, <laughs> and uh, you become the perfect pawn for uh, somebody else's trip. It doesn't even give you your own trip. It gives you somebody else's trip, usually somebody with commercial interest. But we don't hear a great hue and cry about this drug. Why? Well, because it serves the agenda of uh, those who are running this culture. Uh, let's talk about another drug for a moment. No, 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 no. Just before we move on, uh, let's stay with DMT for a second. If everybody who, who took DMT received the message that consumerism, entrepreneurism, capitalism are good and wonderful things, and that is the spiritual message that you get from DMT, would it be legal? <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, I think it's becoming legal because I think where we're going to see it become legal is not as a drug. That's a little touchy in our value system, but as in the form of electronic entertainment a la virtual reality. If you could build a DMT virtual reality, they would come, Mark. 
<laughs> well, you were about to move on to some other... Well, I was going to mention a thing about coffee that points out the contradictions in the way the culture approaches drugs. Let me tell and you. And that is, medically, coffee has a very dubious profile. It's probably right behind tobacco in terms of uh, uh, liver cancer and this sort of thing. But every labor contract in the Western world uh, makes a place in it for the workers' right twice a day to stop and load up on this drug. This is the coffee break, and it's That's thought right. uh, indispensable to civilized life. Well, why don't we have a cannabis break? I don't know, but uh, that, well, we'll get to that, but coffee is indispensable. I drink copious amounts of it uh, to a achieve each program that I do. So then yeah, I guess it, I, it I is am... perfectly suited for the industrial process of the manufacturing of uh, objects, television programs, uh, production schedules, you name it. It's a marvelous drug for an industrial economy yeah. in the same way that yeah. I suppose coca in South America is a marvelous drug for a high altitude herding nomadic mm -hmm. population. In other words, these drugs fit certain social situations. Uh, cannabis provokes a, a sort of disinterest in the work cycle, a more philosophical, laid-back, non-consuming approach. And so, of course, it's demonized with the hardest of hard drugs and just presented as the scourge of suffering mankind. Oh, it's it's the biggest lie we tell. I, I could not be more angry. Hey, there was news the other night that uh, they just have legalized the growth of hemp in Canada beginning next year. Uh, I heard that it was B.C. I didn't hear it was all of Canada. Oh, just B.C. Well, anyway, uh, th that will be a grand experiment uh, indeed, so I'm glad to see it. Well, eventually I think the drug thing will change because for one reason Europe is way out in front on this. European politics is not under the thumb of a right-wing fundamentalist agenda the way American politics is. And a lot of European social policy is actually made quite sensibly and not along ideological grounds. And uh, uh, the statistics, for instance, that Holland, with the loosest drug policy and yep. legalized prostitution, has both the lowest rate of heroin addiction and the lowest rate of AIDS infection in Europe. Um, you know, public health officials, whether they are think of themselves as conservatives or liberals, have to live within their budgets. And when they see that certain policies cause certain problems to disappear, that frees up money for other things. And so the Dutch experiment it's not well reported in America, but I think at the policy-making level, it's being looked at very closely. So they have not as much AIDS. They have not as much uh, addiction. Um, what about, I mean, you covered a very important point with respect to coffee. It's a, it's a drug of productivity. Right. Uh, what about productivity? Has their productivity declined? Is there any record yet to go on? What do we know? I don't say, well, I don't know. I can speak from being there, and I can say yes. But I think what you have to put up with is a, a whole society that is sort of like a college student's apartment. <laughs> have you uh, have you been uh, to Amsterdam? Uh, um, you know, I have not. I, I've been uh, right next to it, but I, I certainly... My wife was trying to get me to fly to Amsterdam, and I... Should have. It was just a short little hop, but we're going back to Europe, and I will go visit Amsterdam. Well, you'll see that it, it, it's a country which is like a college town. So that's the cost of having these laid-back, easy-going attitudes uh, on these social issues. But well, yeah, but uh, before they would allow that to occur in America, they would machine-gun people to the ground. Well, this is the problem that we inherit, uh, we have a political dialogue which is extremely shrill. We uh, tend to splinter and uh, factionalize and then people get into uh, take no prisoner attitudes and mm -hmm. they want to launch holy wars and, uh, uh, you know, I once heard politics in America described as a civil war in a leper colony. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that right. And listen, uh, while we're on the subject of today's political scene, you know what all the headlines are, and everybody's talking about it. Um, the, the, what I call, you know, what I call the groping. Well, I think. Uh, you mean what do I think about all this? Yeah, of course. Well, I think it's a fascinating situation when the Republicans are contemplating impeaching a president with a 72 percent approval rating. Uh, I think what this may be all about is. It seems like some kind of culture war is coming to a head, no pun intended. Uh, I would like us to come through this thing in a place where we could finally tell the French to go to hell when they start yakking about how we're ethically, we're obsessed with people's sex lives. Uh, it seems to me the history of the special prosecutor, and I don't know if you've gone through this or if you're personally aware, but it's very murky. These people have been after this guy, and obviously Bill Clinton is some, you know, you don't become governor of Arkansas four times without being, in my book, some kind of a monster. Nevertheless, Franklin <laughs> Delano Roosevelt said of Stalin, our monster. <laughs> our monster, yeah. Now, uh, you know, I went to uh, Paris. I was in Paris. Uh, I, I, I was lucky enough to take the Concord at uh, twice the speed of sound to Paris. It was so cool. And I love Paris, and I love France, and I really detest the French um, people. And they're, they're just, they're all stuck up, and uh, but they do have a different attitude about a lot of things than uh, we do. And one of them, uh, this whole thing going on now with the President Terrence, it's one conclusion that you could come to is that the American people are beginning to change their attitudes finally uh, about sex. I mean, we have been a very, very uh, prudish uh, uh, people for all our existence. And one conclusion you can come to about this entire presidential dilemma and, uh, is that uh, the American people are beginning to change their attitudes about sex. Is that possible? Yes, I don't think you can conclude anything else. They are changing their attitudes about sex, and they're accepting that the depth of penetration of modern media into people's lives is going to bring them this information, and they don't want it to mess with the political process, which is, a, as you say, a very... French attitude. Let's let these people have their personal lives. I'm sure Hillary can uh, discipline Bill if that's necessary, and the rest of us should get on with the business of governing. <laughs> and uh, and that is what um, the right wing across America cannot understand. And so they are simply being puzzled. Uh, they're, they're trapped in this great puzzle of my God, what's going on? Well, what's going on is. We're growing up a little bit. Isn't that, I mean, after all, the French uh, have been uh, around so very much longer as a nation, and is this a nation maturing? Well, I think not only is that what's going on, but the, the right wing needs to look closer to home. What's going on is they're getting ready to commit suicide for the second or third time in four years by moving to impeach one of the most popular presidents in the 20th century uh, at the end of the most brilliant economic expansion the country has ever known. This is a prescription for catastrophe for the right, and they're charging ahead full bore with their usual uh, devil-may-care attitude. So if, if, once again, they've invented a new way to commit suicide. Well, I, first of all, uh, don't think that the political right wing um, when you break it down to individuals, sexually is any different at all than the political left wing, the, perhaps the only difference being that um, they keep their uh, whips and chains in closets. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's the, to try people for their sexual peculiarities and, uh, and faux pas, it is a sign of a totally juvenile country, and as you say, I think we're moving beyond that. Uh, now, if we were, if this president had fouled up the economy and the stock market were down a thousand points, then there might be some political rationale in all of this. 
but at the moment it, it appears just madness to me, and I think will be very detrimental to any long-term right-wing agenda. Well, the right-wing, of course, if those conditions had prevailed, would have um, uh, burned, uh, you know, put Mr. Clinton uh, uh, on a stake and burned him alive, and the left-wing would have uh, quietly accepted that, uh, and we would have moved into a sort of an older more Victorian uh, period, but it doesn't appear as though that is going to happen. And as you point out, uh, the right wing is probably going to self-immolate if they proceed as they are right now. Uh, yes, I think, was it last weekend where Trent uh, Lott said he thought the press, special prosecutor should put his cards on the table and if it didn't fly to drop it, and then they jerked him around and 24 hours later he was calling for focus on the president's role in obstruction of justice and all this. So they can't get it straight. They, they, they have incredibly bad political instincts for a majority party in the world's Know, most dynamic democracy. Even though individually they're not sexually, in my opinion, any different than anybody else. Politically, they uh, they they seem to not be able to leave the moralistic line. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that you know, immorality is necessarily a uh, a virtue. Um, and I don't mean an intent for people to believe that, but uh, simply. A tolerance. They want to be left alone. They don't yes, want yes, somebody yes. else to set their moral agenda. You know, people like their Hustler magazine, and they like their beer, and they like to to do what they like to do. To my mind, that's a more authentic American uh, impulse to do what you want to do than this recursion to the Puritan impulse, which is to tell everybody else what to do. What's the fun in that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are shortly going to go to the phones, and that should be quite an experience in itself. <laughs> um, I, I've got a fact here, which I guess I had to read you. Um, Art, I just wanted to thank you for having Terrence on your program. Um, and he has these questions. Impacts of currently legal drugs in our society, in other words, alcohol, tobacco, sugar, compared to the impact of currently illegal psychedelics in our society like marijuana, LSD, and psilocybin. Um, multimedia film he worked on recently entitled Strange Attractors, shown a few months ago here in Austin, Texas, with a message of psychedelic consciousness. What exactly were the blue apples referenced in the film and your message behind it? Well, well, first of all, let me say uh, that was a film that I was an actor in. I was not a, the director or the writer, so I wasn't in control of the message. Uh, the blue apples were simply symbolic of all psychedelic plants. They didn't want to name a specific psychedelic plant, so oh, the I blue see. apples became a symbolic carrier of all of them. Uh, as long as the subject has come up, I would recommend to people to see that film. It certainly is state of the art for uh, computer graphic uh, special effects on small budgets. Uh, it was done by uh, Rose X Productions down in Austin, a really talented friends of mine. All right. Um, here's another one. As a teacher, website publisher, and author, I am convinced now that genetics will have more to do with the next 200 years than any other science in that regard. When we learn how to recreate ourselves, then might we be able to produce humans with minds that are capable of understanding the connection between mind and energy and mind and matter. Could we not then recreate our entire selves and the universe? Well, these are the kinds of scenarios that are, are coming upon us, yes. I mean, uh, for example, uh, ways to splice into the Internet so that it feels like it's a part of your own mind. So, in other words, the seamless interface where when you need intelligence, you can pull on all the intelligence there is on the planet. Uh, I recently discovered a science fiction writer I was not familiar with, this guy Greg Egan, who wrote a thing called Permutation City, and that's a technology 50 years in the future where people 
routinely copy themselves as code and mm -hmm. reappear as copies in mm -hmm. artificial environments and these copies know they are copies and the the technology and the psychology of that world are handled by this guy with incredible skill so there are people out there imagining the kinds of futures that the, the questioner talks about the very biggest issues are going to be dealt with. In other words, what is intelligence? What is identity? Mm -hmm. What is being itself? Uh, can death be transcended mm -hmm. through somehow becoming part of this global uh, symbiotic hyper-organism that our technology is creating? Uh, we stand really in a place no no one has ever stood before and what will come of it you know genetics is one frontier uh, another frontier is nanotechnology uh, another frontier is human machine interfacing another frontier is human life extension um, when you pile up all this stuff and realize that major discoveries are being made in all these fields simultaneously you begin to see that the morphogenetic momentum for this thing that wants to be born out of the human species is at this point almost uh, unstoppable and inevitable I think we're all just witnesses to this unfolding this is the culmination of 25,000 years of human striving and technology testing and language acquisition and uh, and now we're about to make the big leap into mm. the great question mark. Mm. You mentioned copies, um, uh, Terence, uh, copies, that we'll be able to have copies of ourselves. Now that's very interesting. A copy would be a precise copy of us and you said it would know that it is a copy. But um, I see a problem here because that copy would contain uh, the same ego that the original has, and the only way to satisfy that I, that I can see for the copy would be to liquidate the original, and then it, then it would feel good. Well, these kinds of feelings and situations are what drives Greg Egan's fiction. His copies behave like human beings with drives and neuroses and uh, uh, but his main strength doesn't lie so much in portraying the psychology of these people as in imagining and describing in a way that convinces you it could be uh, the technologies that will make this stuff happen and of course he's concentrating on uh, artificial worlds of the silicon variety but then when you put in nanotechnology and some of this other stuff uh, it really is dazzling i don't i don't think anyone can triangulate all these factors without having the feeling that we're approaching some kind of singularity you and i talked about this i mean the quickening that you've written about and and the novelty theory that i've written about are both metaphors for this sense of impending cross-fertilization and implosion of all knowledge. Um, before we leave uh, the present day silicon area, I want to ask you about this pending incredible doomsday Y2K scenario in which, um, uh, you know, 2000 is going to come and the main frames are going to crash. My God, there goes Social Security. There goes um, all the government's computers. And we are now so tied in and dependent upon all this that many people are saying it's real. Don't laugh. Everything is going to crash. Nobody's preparing. That day is going to come. It's going to be, it's going to be um, a computer Armageddon. Uh, well, I've heard all this, and I've visited the websites, and while I'm reading the, the propaganda of these people, yes. it seems alarming. On the other hand, uh, I have an intuition that it represents some kind of culling. I mean, the word has been out now for about two years, and more and more institutions are scrambling to become uh, 2000 compatible but they're not making it Terence and, and one has to ask uh, the uh, the obvious rebellious question is it could it possibly be a good thing well and how extensive will it be that's the question that 
know that where the experts seem to differ. Uh, I've seen pieces which say it's a hiccup on the way to the end of history, and other people say it is the end of history. Um, well, it would certainly bring an awful lot of uh, paradigms and uh, institutions tumbling down all at once if the doomsayers are correct, and I would think that you might consider that at an upside somehow. Well, it depends on how far back it takes us. In other words, if, <laughs> if, if it takes us back, uh, you know, the ones who are heading for the hills with dried meat, if they're right, that's a little uh, disturbing. If, on the other hand... If, on the other hand, I, I'm advertising absolutely fresh abacuses or something... <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I think that as we get closer to it, the spending curve on the problem by corporations should tell us how real it is. Well, that's it's true. their goose that's going to be cooked. So let's watch uh, company outlays for Y2K consultants, and if it soars toward infinity, the rest of us better start packing our lunches. But what I am told is that it's too late, that even if they took all the computer programmers capable of going to work on this problem and started them right now, they wouldn't even get close to solving the problem by the time the magic day hits and everything goes kaboom. Well, maybe, maybe well, that's not true. I'm, I'm sure these consultants are not saying that because the obvious conclusion that would be, well, then we won't pay your fee to well, right. an attempt to fix it. No, this is these are independent people, not to, not the people who are seeking to go out and get the, all the money saying for it's fixing it. Too her. late. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, then the question that needs to be answered is, too late for what? Let's have a convincing picture of the scenario so that we can each look at it and judge it. I mean, we're unfamiliar with this kind of a scenario. So just saying airliners will fall out of the sky and nuclear power plants will blow up, yeah. in, we need to know the sequence, uh, the imagined sequence of events. And, uh, and if it's true, it will certainly be a bizarre comment on the movement into the first moments of the third millennium that we basically blow ourselves away because of a computer glitch. <laughs> well, I wonder if we are truly that dependent, and I sort of imagine that we are. Every single function of government is computer controlled. Most of them have this problem. I mean, I could go on and mention every alphabet agency. My God, NSA, CIA, they'll fall apart along with Social Security, along with the Veterans Administration, and Checks well, go and I guess the question is, what happens to the money? Uh, is some kind of enormous heist of the whole human race, is that why there's so little interest in fixing the problem? Because, in fact, the problem is somehow going to make a lot of people incredibly wealthy and no one will be able to trace the exact outlines of the heist. I have even, my own webmaster, who's brilliant, Keith uh, Rowland, has a has several commercial uh, programs that he has written. I mean, he's really good. And even he has the Y2K problem, and he's not so sure he can get it fixed for his clients in time. So I mean, this really is a serious problem. I get a lot of email about it, and I've been considering it, thinking about it, and if all came tumbling down, I am not convinced that it would be a bad thing. Maybe maybe I need to get an advertisement. How you can profit from the Y2K crash? Well, I think <laughs> probably we should be also talking about organizing tested sub-networks where the thing, the date has already been simulated. Uh, Apple claims all its machinery is Y2K compatible. And so... Yeah, but uh, they're, they're, all they're, they're desperate, though. Yes. <laughs> I agree. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you have an Apple? I'm devoted. With a name like McKenna, could I not have a Mac? Uh, uh, it's like, um, it's a good machine, uh, Terrence, but you know, it's like, it's like a beta recorder. Well, but my son and his hotshot friends tell me anybody who doesn't learn Unix is a wuss anyway and a lot of soul. So... <laughs> That puts us probably both in hot water. Yeah, probably so. Every time I say something like this, I get, oh, you wouldn't, 
I mean, people are so attached to their computers. The Mac users, they flood me with vicious, ugly, uh, hate-filled mail. Um, when we come back, we're going to go to the phones. All right, uh, back now to the, the world of Terrence McKenna on the side of a volcano. By the way, uh, Terrence, just in case somebody or something does eventually push alternate control delete, um, being there on the side of a volcano, uh, you would be the first, uh, probably, in all probability, to experience uh, the moment of deletion. Well, it depends. Uh, we were talking about the Y2K problem. I'm What I'll do is I'll shut down an hour before and come online an hour after and see if anybody's left. <laughs> uh, so, you know that's a great idea actually um, as I may far do as living on this volcano is concerned yes. if it's true it's uh, it's the devil we know uh, it's been in constant eruption for 13 years we tell ourselves it's all over on the other side which it is but of course that's 50 miles away mm. uh, but it's kind of nice to have all our problems packaged uh, into one problem and to have it be a natural problem so there's no point in us whining and grossing about it the volcano is the volcano so now I, I'm not an expert uh, on, on things volcanic but I do think that the great danger is not the slow constant eruption that you now experience but rather if a lava dome were to begin to be in place and the entire volcano were to start to expand with pressure until finally the entire thing blew up, uh, creating probably a new island or new portions of an island, but uh, in the process uh, erasing Terence McKenna and everybody else. Well, you know, people have only been here a thousand years or so, and what went on in the remote past of Hawaii, I think there were very dramatic uh, yeah. geological events. They had an international geological congress out here in Hilo a couple of years ago, and uh, there was evidence presented for these enormous underwater land slippages uh, that happen out here, T local tidal waves of 2,000 feet. That's right. In part of the picture. That's right. Yes, well, the Earth is a violent place. Uh, this little asteroid scare last week was a wake-up call. Uh, there's, uh, on every level, nature is relentless in continuing to deal and redeal the deck. Uh, that's why every window of opportunity uh, that isn't uh, acted upon is somehow... Uh, an opportunity forever lost. Well, I, I'm, I, I felt for a long time that somebody's shuffling the cards right now. Uh, anyway, listen, here we go. Let's go to the phones. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in Hawaii in the boondocks there. Where are you? Um, uh, in New York. New York. You're going to have to yell at us. Boy, you're not too strong. Yell at us. How's that? Better. It's better for you. I can still not hear this guy, so relay the question, Art. All right. Yell the question. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to ask Ter Terrence to analyze an experience of mine. Uh, first, though, I want to ask him, uh, can DMT in your brain be released by intentional means? Perhaps okay, other well, that's a very good question, and there's not a very good answer. Uh, if DMT could be released by spontaneously or through some act of will, we might have an explanation in hand of certain kinds of paranormal phenomena. Uh, years ago when I studied uh, yoga in India and read all these yoga texts, I was uh, on the trail of the idea that using your body as a chemical factory to naturally manufacture these active uh, hallucinogens may be what yoga is about. And I still think that that's a, a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, when DMT was first discovered, people thought that it was going to shed light on schizophrenia and that surely schizophrenics must be producing large amounts of DMT in their brains. Well, it, it seemed like a good idea, but the research has never uh, supported it. 
the only research in the last 40 years done on DMT with human subjects was done by Rick Strassman and his team a few years ago out at the University of New Mexico, and the report on that was published by MAPS, which is uh, 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 an organization which actively works for the legalization of psychedelics, but which also publishes a very good journal and uh, if you look that up, you can see the results, which were fascinating. For instance, uh, everybody who got the stiff dose saw elves, just like I did. So here's a scientific study that secures uh, the presence of elves on the other side of this pharmacological boundary. Well, and, uh, but then you have some other question. Well, here's why I ask. Uh, up until last summer, I never tried any sort of mind-altering drug, uh, but at that point I tried marijuana for the first time. Uh, my experiences seem to be quite different than what everyone else, you know, typically told me about, uh, and I found that very odd. Then, you know, I listened to your first interview you had back last year with Art, and a lot, although not completely, but a lot of the, the elements you spoke about uh, seemed frighteningly uh, familiar, like uh, you spoke about like uh, like gl glistening orbs uh, or, or... All right, our caller uh, to uh, kind of the chase, is that what you experienced or not? Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of them, also the experience of going to another place. Well, I think what you're describing is what sometimes happens to first-timers on cannabis, which is if it's great cannabis and you're a first-timer, it hits with the impact of a much more powerful psychedelic. Uh, the old cannabis hand can only admire such virgin synapses. Uh, uh, a bit, you know, uh, repeated exposure to cannabis socializes it dramatically, and it becomes a much more manageable thing. But part of the whole drug thing and where our educational system is failing our kids is part of growing up now in postmodern society is learning what drugs you can and cannot take. And it's like learning what your sexual style is and what your political and religious beliefs are. Uh, some of us can drink, some of us can't get near liquor. Uh, some drugs are bad for almost everybody. Some drugs are uh, pretty harmless for almost everybody. But in the case of any drug, it's spectacular exceptions to the rule can be found. And it's a rich combination of your psychology, your genetic heritage, your cultural style, uh, what drugs you choose to uh, inculcate into your life. And that's why having the further complication of somebody else who doesn't know what they're talking about making laws and criminalizing some drug preferences and not others is just a layer of complication that we don't need. Well, while there is some enlightenment out there, Terence, um, I read a report from the UK News uh, the other day, Then they stand by that report that the World Health Organization conducted a rather comprehensive study on cannabis and concluded that it was less harmful than either cigarettes or alcohol and that the entire report was suppressed and will not be released for reasons that most of us understand. Uh, every study of cannabis ever done since the 1898 British High Commission report on cannabis in Bengal has reached the same conclusion. Richard Nixon appointed a study group. They reached the same conclusion, and each one of these reports is buried. And uh, people ask why. You asked me this question earlier. Uh, I really believe that it's because of the impact of cannabis on political mm -hmm. uh, attitudes, Thank and that right. it makes people more difficult to propagandize and push around and manage. And so it's just a headache to the managerial class. Or if you want to take a more sinister view, uh, they would fail to be able to enslave us if cannabis mm -hmm. were legal. 
uh, the people who think we're going to legalize cannabis by making some economic argument about the virtues of hemp don't uh, are, are fooling themselves. The establishment is perfectly aware that it is the psychoactive properties of cannabis that make it such a, a hot potato. I mean, it's really an issue of chemical engineering. They want people drinking Jack Daniels and doing coffee yeah. and working like demons and lusting after German automobiles, and they don't want people kicking back and having better sex and more comfortable relationships with their uh, environments and children in those sort of easygoing style that we all associate, I think, with pot. It's even a caricature of... of cannabis culture. Uh, would you care to comment on why the government has not yet assassinated you? Me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they're hoping somebody else will do the job for them. Um, I don't know. I think maybe that uh, the government tolerates a certain level of dissent almost as a, a, a fallback position. In other words, you never quite throw away the small pack, the pox virus. You keep it in case you might need it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, I, I can imagine the culture crisis getting so crazy that uh, the people at the top will have to turn to their cohorts and say, call in McKenna and his friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! You know, uh, Robert Anton Wilson said a funny thing years ago. He said, uh, "You should view the world as a conspiracy uh, run by a very closely knit group of nearly omnipotent people, <laughs> and you should think of those people as yourself and your friends." Uh, <laughs> Uh, otherwise, you have a loser scenario, and who wants to have a loser scenario? An enslaved scenario. Yes. So I believe in pronoia, which is the opposite of paranoia. I, so I believe the reality is a marvelous uh, joke staged for my edification and amusement, <laughs> and that everybody's working very hard to make me happy. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let me uh, bring on one of these uh, happy folks right now. Uh, Wildcard Line, you're on the air with uh, the ruler of the world, Terrence McKenna. Oh, great. This is John in Las Vegas. Uh, in Las Vegas. You're going to also have to yell at us. We're gonna... Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, all right. John in Las Vegas listening on Hot Talk 105.1 FM. Yes, sir. Okay, I'd like to recount briefly what I think are mysterious <clears throat> sequence of events that have uh, recently occurred and get your comments, if I could. Uh, I got a book that has uh, some shape, excuse me, sacred geometry in it. Yes. And I started started fooling around with some of the shapes, and then I had a dream that ended with me standing next to the building in Midtown Manhattan, where the ball drops on New Year's Eve. Yes. And there were a group of short, wide, dark beings. <clears throat> excuse me wearing the same color blue that you have on <clears throat> art in your commercial. No. Okay, here's the weird part. I went to the library and got a textbook about geometry. Yes. And on page 21, um, it's uh, lesson four, definitions. Decide which of the following statements are good definitions of the italicized words by determining whether or not their converses are true. If it's New Year's Day, then it's January 1. That's an example. And then the answer is a good definition because if, it is, if it's January 1st, first, it's a New Year's Day. And then right next to it, the following statement is a definition of extraterrestrial creature. An extraterrestrial creature is a being from a place other than the Earth. And then they have like the converse, inverse, and contrapositive of the statement. Mm hmm Okay, well, the question is, you know, in the dream, the uh, whatever they were beings were standing next to, uh, I think, what's this, what could be described as uh, the symbol of New Year's Eve, uh, which is, you know, where the ball drops on New Year's right. Eve. They were standing right next to that. And then in this book, these two references are side by side, New Year's Day. 
an extraterrestrial creature. Huh. And I'm thinking uh, that maybe there's um, some meaning there that I'm not... Well, maybe I'll there is. Let's get your input. And, yeah, let, let me ask Terrence about it. Uh, Terrence, it brings us back to the geometric beings or um, uh, sentient beings, I guess, that, that you experienced with the MT. And I, I, you know, there's an interesting question for you, and it is that I interview a lot of uh, near-death experiencers. I interview a lot of people like Gordon Michael Scallion uh, who have had some sort of physical trauma to their uh, selves and uh, inevitably near-death experiences, uh, physical trauma followed by psychic um, ability. All of these people, Terrence, talk to me about having seen geometric patterns and shapes that brought them an understanding they never had before. I know it sounds weird, but it, believe me, it's common. And isn't there possibly a common thread to your experience with DMT? Yes. I mean, these journeys into these higher places, wherever they are, seem to demand uh, mathematical metaphors. And, you know, people with no previous association with mathematics are driven uh, to mathematical metaphors. Uh, William Blake, the English poet, talked about the spiral of necessity. And if you remember in the 10th book of Plato's Republic, there's this amazing passage um, called the myth of Ur, E-R, where this guy Ur, who is a soldier, dies or he's killed in battle and he lies on the battlefield eight days dead. And then he revives magically and he comes back and he tells this story of what he saw in the underworld and it is the most am puzzling and amazing passage in the whole classical literature he talks about the spindle of necessity and he details the ratios of these various gears within gears right uh, once again here is uh, Terrence McKenna do you remember Michael Dukakis Terrence Yes, didn't he run for something? Yeah, he, he ran uh, uh, for the presidency, and uh, he was a fellow that uh, took the uh, very unfortunate uh, uh, video of uh, uh, himself in a tank bobbing up and down, trying, oh, yeah. trying, to, trying to prove that he had uh, uh, military uh, uh, sympathies and so forth and so on, and he looked silly. You remember that? Yes. Okay, well, in the debates, Michael Dukakis was absolutely floored uh, when somebody asked him, uh, they, they were talking, they were debating the death penalty or something, and somebody asked, well, what if somebody killed your wife? And instead of saying angry, uh, instead of getting angry and saying, why, well, I'd kill this son of a bitch, you know, or whatever else people expected him to say, he was very moderate, and he was perceived to have lost the debate. So I have a Michael Dukakis-like question for you. Okay. And it comes by a faxer, dear Art. Uh, you and uh, uh, Ms. McKenna were talking about how, how hung up on sex we are and how we should be more like France, where they're more open-minded about sex. One thing that is always brought up is how the president of France has a mistress, and it's no big deal because the French are so open-minded. Have you ever noticed how uh, they're open-minded when it comes to men having a mistress, but I don't think that men are that open-minded when it comes to their own wife? No. I don't think you'd be so minded uh, if it was your wife that the president of the U.S. put the make on. Now, what do you say, Terrence? Uh, well, I'm single, <laughs> fortunately. Well, oh. <laughs> However, let me try to cast myself into you this. Try uh, if uh, the president of the United States, if I were married and the president of the United States put a make on my wife, okay. then I suppose, like Hillary, I would have a ticket to ride. <laughs> but how about the rest of us? <laughs> yeah, and my point being, it's a personal matter for these people to work out. Uh, as long as it doesn't uh, uh, affect the functioning of government, I think it's a trivialization. People are, I mean, I'm amazed that it is so true that people will always be people no matter wherever and however they are that uh, this sort of thing goes on but on the other hand when you read about the the Harding presidency 
uh, it was pretty racy stuff. I mean, you get back to the late Roman emperors, we haven't even got traction yet, Art. <laughs> haven't even got traction East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello, where are you, please? West Haven, Connecticut. All right, fire away. All right, Terrence, uh, well, we need, uh, uh, we don't need lie detectors, we need truth detectors. Why I have a state crap detectors. <laughs> what? <laughs> Perhaps we need BS detectors. I have a statement on transplanetary truth and universal um, stalemates. But first I want to digress with Timothy Leary's idea about intelligence squared. Have you heard of that idea? That observation? Sure. Pardon me? Now you got to be careful here because we've got a delay because of the system we're using. So it's like you've got to ask the question and then pause and listen to the answer, and then and then when you, the answer is complete, speak again, caller. Uh, ask the, your question again. Uh, well, I have a statement and a question. The question, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, I just, I, I want to comment on Timothy Leary's observation about intelligence squared and how it's a two-edged sword as regards psychedelic substances. And, and what point do you want to make about that? Well, say if you, if you take 120 IQ as being 1, and a 60 IQ as being 0. 0.5, and a uh, 240 IQ as being 2, you not only square the intelligences, but you square the difference of the intelligences as well. So if, you're, so if you are four times as intelligent as somebody else, and you take a substance, you could become 16 times as intelligent as that person, that person would actually become stupider, and you would become much smarter. All right. Well, let's hold it there. Well, here, here's a here's a slightly smoother metaphor for all this. As the sphere of knowledge expands, the surface area of ignorance necessarily grows larger. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. All right. Um, very well said. West of the Rockies, you're on there with Terrence McKenna in the wilds of Hawaii. Hello. Hello there. Where are you? I'm in Salt Lake. Salt Lake City. All right. Turn your radio off and ask your questions, sir. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask Terrence what he thinks about the concept of a linear time and why people insist on all times are the same when actuality time can be cut up however it wishes to be. All right. The subject of time. Let us talk about that a little bit. Um, what would you say... Uh, Terence of the nature of time. I was talking to a physicist the other day who suggested that um, time is um, absolutely our invention and that once there was nothing, then there was one thing, and uh, then finally there were two things. And when two things existed, then we had time because we could measure how one moved against the other, how far away one was from the other. Until that moment, there was no such thing as time. And really, there is no such thing as time today, except as we, as we measure it. Well, this, there is no such thing as is a, a, a philosophical position. Uh, I think it's true that time is uh, a cultural artifact. Uh, in other words, c cultures create different kinds of time which they then perceive as the only kind of time there is. Linear time has arisen slowly over the past thousand years as a consequence of uh, uh, the, the introduction of print and accurate timekeeping in the West and just a whole bunch of cultural accidents lead us to believe that there is, you know, this unrealized future and knife-edged present and then a world of memory that we call the past. Mm. Uh, we don't notice that we all have different pasts and that we all go to different futures. Um, as far as whether time in the physical sense is real, uh, this is a question probably I'm not professionally uh, capable of answering. It seems to me, though, that the second law of thermodynamics uh, imparts a kind of an arrow to time. And also, this new force that we mentioned earlier, Art, this uh, anti-gravitational force that gets stronger over time, 
seems then to give an arrow to time. I mean, if this force gets stronger as time passes, then time is a real thing, not only to human beings, but to this force. So we have to look at that. Uh, I believe that time is in a uh, fluctuating uh, kind of topology, and that where our models of time have failed is that we too enthusiastically embraced probability theory. Probability theory makes the error of believing that you take a series of measurements, then you average them, then you divide by the number of measurements you took, and that mm -hmm. this is somehow tells you something useful. That, in other words, uh, when the measurements were taken is not important. The time is smeared out by probability theory. And I think, you know, that time is, uh, that probability is fluctuating on many scales. The first thing you learn when you study probability in an academic situation is that chance has no memory. In other words, that the flip of a coin is not affected by the flips that preceded it. But no, no gambler believes that. Uh, experience shows that if, if there's a run toward heads or tails, you should bet that way. Well, I think this indicates a universal tendency toward a fluctuation of probability that is how the universe actually sculpts itself into higher and higher form. This is not the theory of evolution that Darwin came up with, which sort of pushes from behind. It's a theory that there is a kind of attractor in the future that is actually shaping processes, uh, pulling us, as it were, like iron filings uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. But this is a field that acts through history. Well, you can even observe, Terence, a, a macrocosm of that in, in your own life. In other words, uh, if, 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 if the coin coming up heads means good stuff happens to you, uh, we go through these cycles where uh, nothing, literally almost nothing bad can happen. Everything is good. Everything's coming up heads. And then we run smack into a wall and tails will start to come up. But it, it doesn't seem, uh, it, it does seem to run in... Uh, in those um, uh, those exact uh, sequences that you talked about, uh, and, and I can't understand why. When well, you put your finger on it when you said we see this pattern even macrocosmically in our own lives. Yes. We see it in history. We see it in the planet's history. Yep. We see it at every scale where we define time, and I maintain right down to uh, a few minutes or a few milliseconds. And that in a way, we have to switch lenses when we look at nature. And probability theory carries you from complete ignorance to a blurry vision of how nature works. Then if you will turn your attention toward time and actually propound a more complex model than simply that time is invariant, then the rest of nature will snap into being. The part we can't understand yet, societies, processes, uh, this is where our, our thing is not yet uh, ready for prime time, scientific <laughs> explanation. When you uh, do this new drug that you have been so enthusiastic about uh, recently, uh, what is, even though in real time, or linear time, it's only a few minutes. What is your perception during that trip uh, on DMT? Well, concerning time, you mean? Yeah. In other words, uh, are, you, are you are you aware that you have only been gone for X number of minutes, or is it an there experience? There is an elongation of time, ah. not a spectacular elongation of time. But what is interesting is uh, the sense that you only do it once and that no matter how many times you do it, it never repeats. You just go back to the same one again. It, it, there, it's bizarre. Uh, and so if you did it early in life, I first smoked DMT when I was about 20, mm. I always seem then to be 20 again uh, going into it. The other thing about DMT that suggests a time affect is you feel like you have body proportions 
but your head is very large compared to your torso. Hmm. Um, and now that you've gotten me onto this subject, I'm recalling a DMT trip years ago where I did it with two women who sat across from me. And uh, at one point in the experience, I opened my eyes, and uh, these were both women probably 25 years old. And one of them was uh, running backward in time, changing into a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old. And the other one, her hair was turning white, her gums were retracting, her wow. skin was... Re it was... Wow. You know, talk about uh, amazement. And I didn't say anything at the time because I didn't know whether it was would be interpreted personally. My personal feeling was it wasn't a statement about the personalities of either of these women or how I felt about them, that I was actually seeing time run forward and backwards at the same time. It was a lesson to me out of the, the DMT place, but it was definitely a, a strong hit of a kind of time we're not accustomed to. Oh, that's a remarkable story. Uh, that really, I'm going to give that some serious thought over time in the linear World. First time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello, where are you, please? I'm from uh, Silver City, New Mexico. Okay. And uh, Terrence uh, and Art, uh, good morning. And, uh, good morning. Uh, we spent some time together down in Catimaco about five years ago at the uh, Entheogenic Botanical Conference. Uh, I was the clinical herbalist down there. And, yes, uh, that was a wonderful time in the rainforest of Catimaco. I'm glad you're still trucking. Still, still working with the plants, and uh, I have two questions. One, I was uh, wondering if uh, what, you, what, what do you feel about all of these mutating viruses and bacteria that seem to be manifesting all over the globe? And uh, the second question, which uh, uh, is kind of bizarre, I think in many respects that. Uh, to approach a lot of these viruses and bacteria with uh, remedies or cures, you know, being a clinical herbalist, I, I sometimes look at all different forms of medicine, um, hallucinogenic, uh, botanical medicine, homeopathic medicine, and recently I've been wondering if you knew of anything concerning uh, meteorites used as medicine, uh, specifically like the Murchison meteorite that fell in Australia in 1969, it contains many uh, organic molecules which are not found uh, on Earth. And uh, I'm wondering if you've ever, in your research or experience, have ever come across uh, meteorites being used as medicine, especially meteorites that contain uh, amino acids which are not part of the you know, one, 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 uh, yes one might also though uh, question whether some of the new and mutating uh, viruses and bacteria are not being delivered by these healing meteorites at any rate uh, uh, what it, it is a very good question uh, Terence we have all of these new little bugs that are turning against us in increasing numbers with our ability to combat them uh, decreasing at about the same rate um, what's going on well, one thing that's going on is we're disturbing habitats that have never been disturbed uh, in the rainforest, in the warm tropics. I mean, that's what the Ebola thing is about, and that's what these aerosol leukemias uh, in New Guinea are about. We're going into places where human beings have never been and busting up the joint, and uh, nature is fighting back. Uh, it, this is very real and it's problematic. Also, you mentioned, Art, there is a, a, a minority but respectable opinion in the scientific community that believes that virus particles and uh, prions and things like this are being delivered to the Earth's surface from the extraterrestrial environment and that this is, uh, plagues from space, that book by Fred Hoyle, it was very interesting where he correlated numerous epidemics with the earth passing through cometary veils and uh, and this sort of thing. So it wouldn't surprise me if the earth's biota was being challenged and renewed by material from space. 
And I think that the inner solar system is becoming more dynamic and active. Uh, I think there's a lot of material moving around out there. This mm. is a nightmare to the scientific and military community. As a matter of fact, Terrence, they don't understand it. We have had objects coming down in Greenland over El Paso, uh, constantly over Colorado and Georgia and uh, the Bay Area. More things coming down with no good astronomical uh, explanation whatsoever. And uh, who knows what they're bringing with them. Yes, I, I think it's a problem. Uh, this little scare over the asteroid last week should bring people to awareness. I saw a page on the Internet that showed the number of known objects in the inner solar system uh, superimposed over the orbits of Mars, Venus, and Earth. And I'm telling you, it's a swarm. You look at that, and it looks like collision is inevitable, that anything else would be highly improbable. And then it's just a matter of, uh, of the time scales. And meanwhile, as, as we say, the biota of the Earth is constantly challenged by the introduction of extraterrestrial material, uh, both active and radioactive. It is all a matter of time, Terrence. All right. Here's what Dave says the president should have said in his State of the Union address. <clears throat> Members of Congress, people of America, I banged her. I banged her like a cheap gong, which is not news, folks, because if you think Monica Lewinsky was the only skin flute player in my orchestra, you haven't been paying attention. The only babes in D.C. I have not tried to do are the First Lady, Reno, Albright, and Shalala, mostly because they're a little older than I like, and they have legs that former Houston Oiler Earl would envy, which isn't to say that I don't appreciate Hillary. I do. If not for the ice water coursing through her veins, I'd be pumping gas into farm equipment in Hope, Arkansas, and she'd be married to the president. So let me set the record straight. I dodged the draft, hit FBI files, smoked dope, flipped Whitewater property, set up a new Korean wing in the White House, fired the travel staff, paid hush money to Hubble, sold the Lincoln bedroom like an upscale Motel 6, and grabbed every ass that entered the Oval Office. Got it? Good. <laughs> now, uh, if he'd said that or some variation of that at any point, uh, what do you think the reaction would have been? Terrence. Well, I caught the State of the Union address, and I thought it was some variation of that. <laughs> <laughs> God, I can't top that. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm out here in Los Angeles. This is Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I'm having a problem with uh, a little bit of Terrence's uh, uh, well, his, his, uh, trips with uh, DMT. Uh, I'm near 50 right now, and uh, I used to play around with DMT in a crystallized form back in when I was around 20 years old. And uh, he says that you, you now I, I want to get this correct. Are you saying, Terrence, that, that you, you keep having the same trip over and over? Because I didn't find that to be true at all. No, I think what I'm saying is that it takes me to the same place over and over. In other words, it's got a very unique character. It's not like anything else, and it keeps doing keeps being what it is each time I try it. Well, I, I personally found myself that uh, it didn't take me to the same place. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it, the only way that it even uh, took me at all uh, to the same, but even calling it the same place, was it was just an hallucination, or I wouldn't even call them hallucinations, really. I'd call them more distortions. And uh, I find that uh, with most psychedelics, like LSD, for instance, uh, that in all the trips I've taken, and uh, all the experiences I've t uh, taken with other people, that you know, I've never personally had a bad trip, but I find that more people that have bad trips with, with LSD and, and uh, psychedelics are people that are not stable. Uh, yes, and... I agree. I said earlier that psychedelics dissolve boundaries. Uh, that's good for most of us. We're pretty tightly boundary-defined. But some people are not. Some people are having an uphill battle just to keep the boundaries in place. And those people are definitely not candidates for psychedelics. I, I don't think psychedelics are something for everybody. I view it as a, uh, a kind of a, a psychic 
and athletic calling, like ocean kayaking or rock climbing. You need to know your tools, you need to know the territory, you've got a buddy system in place, and you're physically trained and mentally prepared. That's how I see it. It's not, that's why I railed against the concept recreational drugs, which I just think is some kind of weird way to sell speed in nightclubs or something. <laughs> uh, All right. Um, Terrence, uh, here we go again. I'm, I'm trying to devote this to the listeners because I could ask you a million questions. Wild card line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in Hawaii. Where are you, please? Hello, Art and Terrence. I'm in Bob in uh, KES country, Beaverton. Uh, Oregon, okay. Right. Uh, all these things you've been talking about tonight, uh, I'd like to put them in uh, the same pot and stir them up and see what comes out. Uh, computers are sentient beings. When you look at the depths of our perceptions, for instance, I've been studying uh, people's ability to uh, perceive signals from the earth, and then look at uh, reverse speech with David Todd Oates and uh, his uh, findings that uh, we are very much uh, uh, sexual beings in, uh, in the underlying areas where uh, reverse speech comes out. Uh, how are you going to put those together, all that processing, all that uh, uh, perceptual abilities, and then uh, try to put that into a computer? Well, in a way, what I think is going on is that the concept of the collective unconscious, which was uh, enunciated by Carl Jung in the early decades of the 20th century, he and Freud basically discovered that the mind had a flip side, that could only express itself in dreams and that was seemed very primitive and aggressive and uh, a dark landscape and they tried to cut some lines through it and map it. Uh, psychedelics also threw light on that landscape. Now if we're going to become a planetary being, we can't have the luxury of an unconscious mind. That's something that goes along with the monkey stage of human culture and so comes then the prosthesis of technology that all our memories and uh, all our sciences and our projective planning abilities can be downloaded into um, a technological artifact which is a, almost our child or our friend or our companion in the historical adventure and this is all being done by very switched on people who learned the rules of the unconscious uh, in the 60s, largely from psychedelics, and are now in a position to technologically implement a cultural artifact, the Internet, that actually casts light into the unconscious. I mean, I believe in information, and I believe if people can... Uh, find out, you know, know the truth and it will set you free. Well, the Internet is opening up the avenues to truth to more people faster than in, at any time in history. And this was not the plan of the managerial class or the nation state or the corporate elites. It's uh, a, a side to the technologies that they put in place that they never foresaw, as is always Case. Actually, the Internet, of course, uh, the genesis of it was with our very own government. Uh, do you think that they, in effect, birthed, birthed their own worst enemy? In a sense, they created their successor. They transcended themselves. When they built a network that could withstand thermonuclear exchanges, they built uh, a multi-centered dynamic organism that lived on information, and it quickly spread to the universities, the think tanks, and beyond that to the corporations, and beyond that to you and me. And now it's so embedded in the very life of global capitalism that the nation state has just been told to keep its mitts off. Uh, this whole Telecommunications Decency Act uh, scenario showed that when the chips are down, uh, the world corporate state is very able to assert its control and ownership of the Internet and how it's used. <laughs> East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hi, where are you, please? Hi, this is Byron in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir, Art. I love this show. I just discovered you this month. I didn't know such a good thing was on the air late at night. Well, it's, it's uh, as I tell people, it is different. It certainly is, sir, especially for those of us who work nights, and then on our nights off we can't sleep. So this is wonderful. Well, here's a question I have for Terrence. Um, this has been happening to me for some time. I, I, when I heard Terrence speak of the universe reaching out to us or trying to, it, it brought home to me some things that are happening. <clears throat> when I was getting my first degree, I took a philosophy course, and I asked my professor, I said, Sir, do you ever have patterns come to you? And he said, What do you mean patterns? I said, Well, I'll be going along doing my, my business, and on the news or in a magazine or a book, a word, an unusual word, jumps out at me. And I'll go, Okay. <clears throat> I'm a word hound, so I kind of take note. Then, later that same day or the next day, the very same unusual word jumps out at me again. And then the next day, in, in a very different place, the very same unusual, heretofore, rarely or if maybe never seen word pops up again. So I thought, well, maybe something is trying to tell me something. <laughs> so I would take note of that word. Then I go along for months, and then it happens again with another word. I didn't know what to call this phenomenon, so I just called it a pattern because it kept reappearing. But I wondered, if, you know, when Terrence mentioned the universe trying to reach out to us, Terrence, do you suppose that could be one form of some outer intelligence reaching in? or It may, it may not be that deep philosophically. I'll, I'll give you one answer. For example, if you go out and buy um, a new Chevy, a, a Nova car, all right? Right. Uh, Heretofore, you, you, you will not have noticed Novas. Now, you will suddenly see Novas everywhere. <laughs> yes, sir, that's true. So it may be that, or it may be deeper. Uh, Terrence, what do you say? Well, it's funny, uh, again, to mention Jung. Um, he had this concept which he called synchronicity, which is uh, the apparent coincidence of a mental state with an event in the exterior world. And what I mean by that is you're walking along the street thinking about Mr. Fishman, to whom you owe money, and suddenly there's a fish right on the street in front of you. Uh, this is called a synchronicity. And Jung felt that there was a kind of a, what he called a causal connectedness, and that this was how the unconscious attempted to communicate uh, by by juxtaposing thoughts with exterior events that seem related to them in some magical way, and uh, if you're, you know, sometimes synchronicity is one or two a week, and we just sort of notice it and pass on, but they can build. And when we're going through spiritual crises, or when we're intoxicated on psychedelic drugs, for example, these synchronicities can multiply until the whole uh, exterior world seems to be trying uh, to communicate something to you. And um, it's alarming to ordinary psychiatrists because they call it delusions of grandeur. Mm -hmm. The patient thinks the world is trying to communicate with him. But having been on the inside of this, I can tell you, it's very powerful, and a lot of Chinese philosophical thinking has been based on, on recognizing this synchrony, this resonance between mind and nature at critical times. And so as you see this fish reminding you of the man who owes, owes you money, flopping on the ground, uh, gasping and dying out of the water, do you, do you take pleasure? Well, I had a dead fish in my image, so it wasn't an issue for me. It, it didn't flop. All right. No, it didn't flop. In fact, it was quite light. <laughs> <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Where are you, please? No, I'm from Sacramento, California. All right. You're going to have to yell at us from Sacramento. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Terrence, I was just wondering, at uh, your current standpoint, relative to the great scheme of things, what would your answer be to the old question, what is the meaning of life? on uh, our stay here on Earth? Oh, wonderful question. Uh, one that we started with yesterday. 
uh, you might ask it this way. What is um, the greatest question that humanity could have answered for itself? Well, you know, in classical philosophy, they said, here's what classical philosophy is about. Who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? These are the three questions. Everything arises from this. Each leads on to the other. Uh, I've tried to I've tried to look at the question, where did we come from, and have proposed theories about it. Uh, I've by looking into my body brain with drugs and meditation and just analytical thinking, I've tried to look at at who are we. And then the great unanswered question is, where are we going? You know, what is to be the destiny of the human race? Are we an episode in the biology of this planet, or will we build an Eden strung along the Milky Way, and from there to yet grander and greater things? We don't know how much intelligence there is uh, in the universe, but we certainly know that something has broken out uh, on this planet in our species that is like nothing else in the order of nature. What if we are nothing more than uh, a virtual zip on the face of reality? Well, if by virtual you mean that we are inside some kind of uh, artificial simulacrum, that yes, this is yes, a yes, piece yes, of yes, software yes. being run, yes. uh, well, then the question is by who and to what end? I could pick up that. I, my life is so much like a story that I'm constantly asking the question, who writes this? <laughs> who writes this stuff? Who writes this stuff? I mean, who thought me up? <laughs> who thought Art Bell up and put us talking like this in front of 22 million people? That doesn't happen in reality. That kind of thing happens in art of a very finely honed sort. And so I want to know what is the medium and who is the artist and who's paying for this production. <laughs> so is Terence McKenna. And uh, that is an attitude, Terence, of a, a programmer who does this embedded software thing and admits to being totally scripts that it's never going to be self-aware. That is, uh, I guess, one attitude. Is that... Um, uh, uh, macro thinking uh, of, of one single programmer who is failing to embrace uh, what's actually really going on? Well, uh, while we were off uh, air, I was online and looking at the AI pages, and I would just recommend to someone with that attitude that they search words like super intelligence, artificial intelligence, and look at the stuff posted on the web. Uh, I work with a computer every day. I don't have the same experience as uh, the the person you quoted. I find the the evolution of software. Uh, I can't keep up with it. I I don't feel any of us have written software that takes advantage of the hardware's capabilities. In other words, no one has tested. Uh, the edge of the hardware. The failure is in the software writing department. But if you look at uh, what people like Bruce Dermar at Digital Space are doing, uh, the Singularity web pages, the artificial intelligence web pages, the transhuman web pages, the ex uh oh, we're getting we're, we're getting a little break up here. Um, wouldn't the uh, the real evolution begin when nanotechnology uh, becomes a reality and uh, these uh, these machines then begin to either replicate themselves or to write their own, in effect write their own software taking leaps uh, beyond what what we can do because I think you're right well that would be one revolution another I think that will come sooner is when everything is implants when you know the equivalent Today's computer is something that you uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. chain to nervous system interfacing so that we don't feel it as a machine. We feel it as a, a capacity of our own mind. This will come.
All right. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Now, this is Bill in Wisconsin. Bill, you're going to have to yell at us. Go okay. ahead. How's that? Better. Um, Terrence, we were talking, you were talking a little bit about the fish on the sidewalk. Right. And I uh, have had experience with LSD. I was a part of an experiment in the 1970s and mid-70s, and we were allowed to inject um, three bottles of Sandoz uh, LSD, 100 micrograms each at the same time, so 300 micrograms IV. And uh, since that time, I've had experiences, oh, hundreds of experiences, similar to the fish on the sidewalk. Um, I'll give you just one quick one. And I want to take it one step further and ask you this question. Um, on the way to the motor vehicle department, uh, I borrowed $35 from my girlfriend to get my motorcycle back in the 70s. And I said, wouldn't it be something, you know, to see an interesting plate come up? Well, it came up UIO35. <laughs> <laughs> one step further, and I've found it hundreds of times since then, that not only does it reflect what you're thinking or whatever, but reality seems to actually change as you walk, change as you think. Yes, well now I would say that this is a clue to the fact that the story you've been told by science and physics and chemistry and all that is simply a way that you you are not, you're a person in a story. It's because all such things don't go on in the world of ordinary probability and ordinary physics. <laughs> and uh, so it's like a certain point in your, the evolution of your understanding where you realize that physics and chemistry and all that is not what it's about, that you're inside the story. And I think the, the juice in that insight is that you can then try and figure out whose story is it. In other words, is it your story, or do you exist in this story to open the door for somebody on page 220, and is that it? Uh, and then, of course, the ultimate aspiration to become the author of the story. Imagine. If I you know. am the author at times, okay? On, yes, other, at other, times. Other, other times, you're nothing but a bit player. That's it. That's right, and the, the trick is to get some handle on that those moments when you are the author. I've been working at it. All right, um, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very good question, actually. First time caller line. You're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Yes. Um, you know, I, I eventually want to get to. I have a, a physical condition known as cough syncope, and uh -huh. I and I when I combine that with the Hatha yoga discipline known as Udi Anabana, uh, and I am a 60s child as well, I'm your ages, and I've experimented with purple Owsleys originally, um, uh, I, I trigger an internal biological, uh, I, could be a natural production of DMT, that allows me to enter a prolonged, uh, I guess we call it flow consciousness now. Uh, uh, lucid dreamings involved, synchronicities involved. Well, this is, we were talking earlier about this, about yoga as a chemical factor. Yeah, I, I have not, I listened to the full to two hours now. I have not disagreed with a single word I've heard, except for perhaps what you said in the introduction, Art. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, t uh, Tom Wolfe's electric Kool-Aid acid test, uh, Ken Kesey and the others on the bus. It's 10,000 hits of original Purple Owsley that's buried out near Winnemucca, not 50,000 hits of Blue uh, Santos. But, you know, my, my experience analytically takes me, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, probability theory, and really that comes down to quantum mechanics now, and you begin to understand non-locality. Uh, and when you look at it from the, all say Masaz Aliad's uh, shamanism, archaic techniques of ecstasy. Uh, Danae's book, uh, Consciousness Explained, uh, where you look at the AI uh, parallel computing back through von Neumann machine, uh, uh, making us believe, all right, that we that we have individual identities, uh, just another belief system. Uh, all of this you know, really does take us, I think, to uh, the, the, 
the, the, the, the geometrical structures that you talk about. Um, yeah, when I you look, when you look that, at the self that what we're going to have to understand is that psychedelic experience and quantum mechanical theories actually come together. The, the brain is the perfect instrument for exploring these uh, microphysical low energy states and yoga and shamanism and psychedelics this has been going on for a long time not using metaphors drawn out of the evolution of modern science but using equally powerful metaphors created in in different contexts but the big news is the future prosecution of science into new areas is going to involve using the brain as an instrument and giving up the idea of scientific objectivity as a naive positivist notion and let's just get down and explore being with all the means at our disposal chief of which are pharmacological and chemical and while you hang on I suppose um Tenuously, uh, however, strongly to this scientific uh, paradigm, you're not going anywhere, right? Right. We see what's held. One of the issues around drugs is that scientists don't study them from the inside because this would compromise their supposed academic objectivity. But by studying them from the outside, they end up knowing nothing about them. So you have a, a, an emperor's new clothes situation, and everybody in pharmacology knows this. The good pharmacologists simply take the drugs but never say so uh, in print. So in, and, order, in order to um, be as public about it as you are, one must find a remote mountainside in Hawaii and um, uh, become a virtual or very nearly a, a, a hermit and uh, then speak out with the uh, uh, some safety. Is that uh, is that a fair assessment? Uh, that's a that's about it. By voluntarily becoming a physical hermit, I uh, get uh, to have a podium in cyberspace. <laughs> Wild card line. You're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'm Clay from KHVH Honolulu. Honolulu. Oh, boy, what a what a route. Yeah. yeah, louder, please. Okay. Uh, Terrence, are you in the Big Island? Because the New Agers say the Big Island is like an energy vortex. You have Pele, the uh, volcano, and Pele, which is also a Hawaiian goddess. And then I was looking well, at the map. Well, I don't think you have to be a sensitive to perceive that the Big Island is an energy center. we got the world's largest volcano here. Uh, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we we feel protected by Pele. Uh, she puts lots of mercury vapor into the air and keeps real estate cheap and tourists away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then do you like being there? Because, uh, like, I was looking at the map. Uh, the Big Island is 180 degrees, almost exactly uh, the other side of the world from the pyramids of Giza which is another energy vortex. No, what interests me about the Big Island is that it's at 19 degrees 30 minutes north, which is the, the critical place to study the skies of Mexico. That, that means that the skies off my front porch are the same skies I see when I go to Palenque and Uxmal and all the Mayan sites, so I, I love that. All right. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Uh, that'd be J27 on your Minnesota state map, Art. <laughs> All right. And uh, I listened to you probably for the past year or so, and I wouldn't, uh, it's unbelievable how hard it is to get through, but I tried twice. and Here you are. And here I am. And also to Terrence. Um, I used to subscribe to High Times, and they had a pictorial uh, back in the 70s of over 150 different varieties of um, uh, indica from Hawaii. Do you believe that to be true? Or? And also, I have another uh, question. It may have been true then. They fly hard out here and have driven the pot growers pretty far underground. I mean, there's definitely still primo I mean, would... pakalolo, but it's not like it was in the roaring 70s. Yeah, so, but there are, uh, I used to live in Northern California and I experienced uh, red hair and purple hair. And Somalia, and it's uh, it's is probably is the
you know, the Dom Periam of, of, you know, that region in my experiences. And also I have one other uh, statement that between your two minds, I'm just wondering if, you know, this is, could be possible that uh, I had surgery, major surgery over a year and a half ago and kind of saw it coming in that, um, you know, my, I was slowing down and my life was coming to an end. And now, after recovery, that I'm getting this feeling that other than just an act of kindness, which is possible, and I'm a nice individual, but I just just seem to be looking for my age. I look young, and I just keep to myself, and I'm kind to other people. But lately, over the past week to 10 days, people that I normally wouldn't have contact with are smiling at me, and, and it just seems to me like, I have this image of the look of death, but it's channeling through these people, and you know they recognize me in that certain way. I'm just wondering if that's if that's as crazy or if that could be true. No, you're going to die. <laughs> well, that's not okay. Right. <laughs> I don't know, Terrence. <laughs> uh, I d I don't know. Uh, you know, the intuition is intuition, and noise is noise, and it's a it's a very hard call and a very important one. So what you do is you cook it in your mind, and then you 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 go with what feels right. All right, West of the Rockies, uh, you're on the air with the Answer Man, Terrence McKenna. Hi, Terrence. This is Phil, listening to six ten K O N A. I heard you last twenty third May last year, and do you have an information letter available to those without computers? Uh, do you have anything? New published in the last year, and have you had any new revelations in the past year? All right. Well, a lot of past year there. Um, do you uh, do you share through any other medium uh, other than the uh, the internet, uh, Terrence? The internet is pretty much it. I have books, and I'm interviewed a lot, and I've been interviewed in the past year in. Uh, uh, magical blend, and then, but usually in small rave and music magazines seem interested in me. I tell, the internet is the place where there is endless amounts of my material, much of it put up not by me, and thank you to those people who do that. Uh, I think that's probably the place to get the most information about me. I was thinking the other night about DMT, and I thought of a phrase I've used to describe it, Arabian hyperspace, and I searched on the Internet, and it spat out my own text at me. It was a very weird moment. Yeah, it, so must, it must have been. It, it, really, was. it, it was. It really must have been. weird. There's uh, plenty of Darren McKenna on the net. Well, you know, here you mentioned hyperspace. You mentioned 19 degrees. Uh, not, not, not mind you, not 19.5, but 19. Have you ever listened to Richard Hoagland and his discussions about uh, hyperdimensional physics? Oh yeah. The problem is, Art. I knew these guys too soon. I knew them so long ago that I I know how squirrely they truly are. <laughs> <laughs> I've played poker with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One last, I think we're almost out of time. Wild card line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Aloha, Art. I'm in Captain Cook. I'm actually about 1,000 feet north of uh, 19.5. <laughs> and uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, Terrence a couple of questions. One was about uh, cannabis and uh, ibogaine. And the other was I, I wanted to thank him for uh, at one time he was uh, going to be a witness in my trial for the religious use of cannabis here in Kona. And, uh, yeah, what yeah. is your question about cannabis and ibogaine? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact, well, what do you think of the fact that they're the only two plants that are illegal to grow in the United States and ibogaine being a addiction interrupter? Uh, well, ibogaine was made, uh, was put in that Schedule 1 in that week of hysteria back in 1966 was put in, including the compounds later found not even to be active in human beings. Uh, I think it is a tremendous detriment and an indictment of the scientific establishment that it doesn't fight back more against medic, against government. You know, in the Middle Ages, medical students would steal corpses off the gallows in order to get bodies to do dissections, which the church had forbidden. And where is the courage
age of science now, big science even, that it allows government to set the agenda in the area of exploring uh, substances which affect the human mind. The answer, the answer, Terrence, is they're chicken. Now, uh, we're out of time. To connect now with Terrence McKenna, who's safely tucked away, uh, I think the side of a volcano or something, isn't it, Terrence? That's right, Art. How are you this evening? <laughs> I'm fine. God, it's great to hear your voice again. It uh, really yes, is. I think it's been about a year. It's been about a year. That's right. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, don't hold back. I'm sure that you have been watching or at least listening to or vaguely aware of what we're doing in Europe right now. And I thought I'd probably start out by asking you your comments. Well, I'm glad I listened in on your reading of your statement, so uh, I know where you're coming from. Uh, well, as you said, it's a complete mess. Uh, for the third time in the 20th century, the Balkans appear to be the place where Europe could potentially Explode. push itself into some kind of war. Nobody could foresee the end of um, I read analysis of Milosevic and his regime five years ago that predicted this would be the end game, that mm -hmm. Kosovo was where push would come to shove, mm -hmm. and uh, now here we are, uh, there's only a few months left in the 20th century, but time for one more atrocity, apparently. Apparently. And now I understand, by the way, uh, Terrence, late news, there are sev seven... Russian warships on the way to the area to, they say, observe, but I don't know. You get seven Russian warships, and, of course, the Russians are not at all happy with us. They've been rattling all kinds of sabers about this, and uh, it really well, you know, still just, happened. Uh, you the old days of duck and cover. You remember that, Terrence? Duck and cover? Right. No, I think, you know, Vietnam gave the domino theory a bad name, but I think in the Balkans, the domino theory may well have uh, something to say. Watch Macedonia, watch yes. Albania. As the destabilization spreads, Greece and Turkey could be pulled in. The Russians are beginning to move toward it. And don't think anyone is in control of all this. Or, as you say, what's the exit strategy? It's easy going in. Nobody mm -hmm. knows uh, how you get out of this kind of thing. Yeah, we're throwing, of course, these cruise missiles, uh, firing these cruise missiles, we're beginning to run out of them, incidentally. But we are firing what we have. When they run out, that means more airplanes, and then eventually, when that strategy fails, then you're faced with the choice of either retreating, and it's another Vietnam, or putting in ground troops and starting down the same horrible road of no return. Well, and remember, ground troops couldn't make a difference in Vietnam either. Uh... Yes, I think aerial bombing, how many times in the 20th century are we going to learn that it's insufficient and it's, it's a very weak-kneed approach if you're talking about all-out war with fascists? And then, Terrence, also, even if we did bomb them, which I suppose is conceivable, to the point where they said, okay, we'll talk about peace, and then we, we move peacekeepers... We're peacemakers now, not peacekeepers. But we finally get peacekeepers in there. There is no exit strategy at all. Look at look at look at Bosnia. Um, they said we'd be there for a year and then a year and a half and then on and on and on. We never get out. And when we do finally leave, they will resume the same thing they were doing. Yes. Well, NATO seems to have become the kind of uh, military arm of the world corporate. State yes, sir. that uh, many people feared. Yes, sir. Uh, what the Serbs are doing, there's no way to countenance, but um, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm so happy with this new world of ours. Uh, well, as you right. say, you can't countenance what is happening in Kosovo. On no, the other hand, not. what happened in Rwanda, what happened in, the, in uh, Cambodia. Cambodia, these things didn't raise uh, anybody's radar. No. It's um, it's really, rarely does something politically grab me these days. I've been really bored to death with politics, especially the whole damn Monica thing. Thank God that seems to be over. 
Maybe. <laughs> well, you remember you and I talked when we were about six weeks into it last year, and uh, I said that I, I didn't think this was going to bring happiness to the right wing. <laughs> well, it, it didn't. Uh, it brought, uh, as a matter of fact, it, it kind of tore the right wing all to pieces. And I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be a very interesting election coming up. What, what do you think will happen? Oh, I assume that if the Democrats can't win this one after what the country's been through, then uh, they're probably finished. But I think it'll be an easy win for Gore. I think the Republicans are flirting at the end of the 20th century with the kind of fate the Whigs were looking at at the end of the 18th century. Uh, they need a program and an agenda running against the president uh, has gone about as far as it can, can go, go, I think. That's right, and I think a lot of people are just running away from that one now. Well, um, how's it going there? I mean, I, I, but look, there's a whole new audience. I keep forgetting. I probably have 100 affiliates since the last time I talked to you. So maybe we ought to take a second, and you should tell everybody who Terrence McKenna is. Who Terrence McKenna is. That's right. If you were to, if you were to have to answer that, which you do now. <laughs> what would you say? Well, I guess my bio says writer and explorer. Uh, explorer means explorer of hallucinogenic plants, uh, strange uh, usages of exotic plants by exotic people, and then coming back and talking about these things, advocating them. Uh, alteration of consciousness leads to all the big philosophical issues, uh, what is culture, what is history, where are we going, and how are we going to get there, and what's going to be so great about it when we get there. So I'm an itinerant philosopher at the end of the 20th century. Well, the average Joe out there, maybe driving a, cr a truck you know, across uh, Indiana somewhere, probably is saying to himself right now, well, why should I listen to anything emanating from this drug-scorched brain? Uh, but, but, of course, that's the only problem with you, Terrence, is your brain doesn't appear to be drug-scorched, and it should be, if what the establishment tells us about drugs is even partly true, you should be a basket case. <laughs> well, maybe I am. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> uh, but I think the guy driving is uh, semi across Indiana. He may be a little scorched himself well, this time of night. He, well, he's he's scorched in a different way, trying to keep his eyes open. You know, get the load delivered. That's right. No, you're well, absolutely right. It's true. Uh, you know, the stereo of the cannabis enthusiast can't think straight. Can't remember where they put the keys. Uh, I've uh, I've never felt that way about these things. I think cultures choose the drugs they want to stigmatize, and then they glorify others. And uh, it differs from culture to culture. The social consequences differ according to the choices made. But uh, alteration of consciousness by human beings is as old as human beings themselves. Well, the old the old myth, you know, is that. Try this. If you think your creativity is heightened when you're on some sort of hallucinogenic drug, then make notes, write a story, paint a painting, conduct some music, play some music, sing, and uh, see if when you're down it was really as good as when you were up. And I, you know, that's what that's kind of what we're talking about here, in a way, isn't it, Terrence? Yeah, well, most of us probably would come in on the low end of that scale, although there are some spectacular counterexamples. Uh, Samuel Taylor Coldridge uh, wrote Kublai Khan, Stoned on Opium. Uh, the insight to the structure of the benzene molecule came to someone after a cognac-inspired dream. Huh. Uh, the character of creative breakthrough is... Uh, like a revelation, the aha experience. Yes. And sometimes it's a bump on the head, and sometimes it's uh, a hallucinogenic experience, but it always has the character of sort of arriving in a completed form. You know what I mean? Yes. Why are there uh, so many striking uh, counterexamples? Why? That, that's a question you never hear dealt with in the public. In fact, you never hear about it at all. They suppress that information. But But why... Why sometimes is a drug 
a key to creativity that you would not have otherwise. Why? Well, I think it's because of the larger effect of these drugs, which is that they dissolve boundaries. And many of the boundaries which enclose us are boundaries of habit, convention, uh, and uh, under the influence of the drug, we see beyond those boundaries. The job of artists has always been to sort of be an antenna right. into the future, and bohemians have always been associated with the uh, drug taking to some degree. So I, I think it's a very understandable process. It's simply that we're now beginning to understand it, and we have to, because the number of substances uh, available and being discovered all the time is beyond the power of the courts and the scientific establishment to really manage. Well, I don't know. You go to, you, you, if you go to a doctor, um, you will notice these days, Terrence, I don't know whether you ever go to doctors, but when, when, <laughs> when you do, uh, a doctor will say, you know what, uh, I know you're in a terrible amount of pain, and I really wish that I could uh, prescribe more to keep you out of pain, because that's the way a doctor feels. You know, they're trying to um, ease your suffering. But uh, the doctor will tell you, frankly, the DEA is looking uh, right behind my shoulder, and a number of my colleagues have lost their licenses. And so, frankly, I can't really give you what you need. That's prescribed. Oh, well, this is, this is a part of the drug problem. The, the hysteria on drugs has made so many different people and institutions crazy in so many different ways. Uh, I really, on the general larger question of hard drugs, I'm quite despairing because so many people and institutions make money off the present mess. Yes. You know, the prison builders, the rehab people, the criminal syndicates, the bought-off cops, the paid-off judges. Uh, everybody is making money on this racket that they pretend to wring their hands over. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Uh, and, and heaven knows what the police would do uh, if they couldn't chase narcotics people. Uh, they would uh, literally uh, have about 10% or 20% at most of their job left. And I think our prisons would be uh, more or less about 60 or 70% empty as compared to their, their, their present content. The courts would unclog and lawyers would have to find honest work. <laughs> so in other words, it's never going to happen. You got it, Art. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you doing in terms of researching uh, this interesting, creative truth? Um, how are you going to do that? Well, I've, uh, I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, but I'm interested, of course, in what uh, these substances do to me and to other individuals. But then there's a whole other area, which is what is the impact of substances and drugs been on large populations over long periods of time. Mm. And I'm willing to argue that the evolution of human language and complex cultural forms themselves were caused by disruptions in the ordinary mental functioning of perfectly happy primates uh, about uh, 150,000 years ago. In other words, that the evolution of, of complex human culture based on language is actually an effect of brain perturbations and unusual states of consciousness that were eventually assimilated uh, and it became part of the behavioral toolkit of early human beings. So you're saying it's actually um, a part of and a continuing part of evolution itself. That's right, and the important thing for modern people is a continuing part of. So when you talk about drugs, you know, today we're focusing on the drug of the day, whatever it is, heroin or methadrine. But in fact, over the past thousand years, it's been drugs that have built uh, the empires that created Western civilization. Sugar, tobacco, alcohol, uh, opium. Tea, Coffee. chocolate, Coffee. these are the drugs that shape civilization. Coffee. Coffee, Coffee. another big one. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we don't think of these as drugs. We call them foods or whatever we call them because a drug is a bad thing, a food is a good thing. 
but eventually I think people are going to wise up to this racket and uh, uh, they need to because we need to educate our children about this complex area of human behavior. There are dangerous drugs. There are drugs that used uh, carefully can be a tremendous uh, uh, enhancement of life, but you have to know what you're doing. It's not something you just blunder into, and all generalizations will have exceptions. And they do, indeed. Um, recently, you know, as you well know, we have a drug czar. And recently, um, recently our czar actually came out and made a couple of really remarkable statements. He, he, he said that um, he thought the debate over medical marijuana was now a legitimate one. And he even went further and he said, it may well be that the use of marijuana recreationally may be a valid debate for our society to have. And I almost fell on the floor when I heard him say that. Well, it would be a wonderful thing for Clinton to do for Gore and the country to make some headway in the end of this administration on this issue so that it doesn't all have to be left to the first term of a new Democrat. I mean, how long are we going to dog this matter? Uh, it really should be part of the agenda of the new century to make drug suppression uh, a 20th century phenomenon along with racism, fascism, uh, aerial bombing of, of civilians mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. Uh, as I said, it's a racket. The insurance companies know that people who smoke cannabis are not at greater health risk. Well, you know, that's a good point because... They're, um, they always ask uh, whether you smoke. They don't ask whether you smoke pot. They ask whether you smoke cigarettes. Of and course. They're, they're really concerned about that. In fact, yeah, a lot well, of cases... they've got the numbers on that. Yeah, in fact, in fact, a lot of cases you can't even get insured if you are a smoker. But the fact is cannabis is such an effective stress reducer that whatever effect the tar in it is having on you, it's more than offset by your low blood pressure, excellent digestion, good sleep, and uh, so forth and so on. This has really been a trip. Uh, Terrence, welcome back. Yes, I, I was thinking, you know, isn't April 1st one of those rollover dates for Y2K? I, yes, it is. And I'm isn't not... It, uh, I, the Federal Republic of Germany and California and New York State all go to their long-term physical projections? I think yeah, that's like true. That. Japan as well, I think. By the way, uh, by the way, uh, well, since you mentioned it, or I mentioned it, what do you think about uh, Y2K? There, you know, there's kind of a range from, hey, nothing's going to happen, to hey, everything's going to come to a screeching halt. Where are you in that scale? I guess I'm sort of a mugwump on this one, uh, with my mug on one side of the fence and my wump on the other. Uh, it seems to me it'll probably be locally. There will be local breakdowns, but they'll, the whole system, I imagine, will flow around it. I mean, so, that's my expectation. So, uh, it's one of those problems where people are highly motivated to solve it, so if they can't solve this, uh, I don't know. What are they going to do in Kosovo? Oh, I, I don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, you're absolutely right. I, I too think that a lot of the warnings that have gone out and a lot of the scare stuff really has motivated a lot of people to action. But still, there may be lurking out there, Terrence, hundreds of thousands of embedded chips in power companies around the country. And it's going to be sort of interesting to see what happens. And, and, and if we were to lose, lose power uh, on a major portion of the grid for even some fairly serious amount of time, how long civilization as we know it, would hang together. You wonder about that? Ever wonder about that? Well, I wonder about it from the confines of a tropical island with mild winters. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, you'll have our sympathy, Art. Uh, maybe you should think of a Hawaiian vacation at the end of the year. Oh, I've been thinking about it for some time now, Terrence, and I fully intend to come and see you. What's it like where you are? 
Well, what's it like? Uh, it's at about 2,000 feet in a rainforest of hardwood trees and tree ferns, uh, 80 inches of rainfall, temperature never below 55, never above 95. Hmm. In other words, paradise. It's a, a word they use around here. I think the visitor bureau has a lock on it, but yeah. <laughs> Once again, Terrence McKenna. Terrence, uh, you know, I talked, in fact, I'm going to be talking to one next week, another brilliant uh, theoretical physicist. I talk frequently with uh, Dr. Michio Kaku. And it is his view that the odds of our making it through to the other side of the discovery and dealing with element 92, that our, our odds are very, very teeny weeny indeed. In other words, in other words when any civilization, and there must be many out there, discover element 92 inevitably, um, almost inevitably, they end up destroying themselves. Any thoughts on that? You think we'll make it through? Well, I think it's remarkable that we've had atomic weapons uh, for over 50 years now, and they were only used uh, very shortly, within weeks after their perfection. And after that, uh, somehow, in all the wars, revolutions, and posturing that's gone on, uh, we've never resorted to the nuclear option. Sure. Uh, so I would argue that maybe the discovery of the transuranium elements and their properties had a marvelously sobering effect on carnivorous monkeys like ourselves. <laughs> but I can usually find a silver lining, Art. Um, good. Um, then uh, you may want to find one in the fact that seven Russian warships are now headed uh, to, to meet up with and or, in their words, observe what we are doing with regard to the, the bombing of the Serbs. Well, you, you just keep going back to that. <laughs> I think that's where a case of trying to make a purse out of a cow's ear or a yeah. sow's ear. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I hope that we make it through. Um, I have great doubts. Well, there are many other challenges. I mean, I'm sure you've probably discussed on your program the Terminator gene. Uh, oh, yes. Isn't that wonderful? That's a good one. Uh, there's the gray goo scenario of a nanotechnological breakout. There's, uh, uh, you know, you've got earth changes. Uh, I guess we've probably talked about how Alfred North Whitehead said uh, the business of the future is to be dangerous. Well, we're 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 doing good business. <laughs> but boy, it's a dangerous world out there right now. It's a really dangerous world. Uh, listen, here's somebody who asks, all right, would you please ask Terrence if the drug DMT, which occurs naturally in our bodies, is released at death, and if it is, could this possibly account for some of the near-death experiences that people report? That's Mike and Hugh. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a very reasonable suggestion. I first heard that notion put forth from Rupert Sheldrake, and I think he, he called it a necrotogen, a, a, a drug which simulates the symptoms of near-death. Uh, it certainly is the near-death experience is a dramatic analog to the DMT experience, it but I, I also think we we produce DMT in deep dream states. I, I would lay money on that. I mean, it's known that it's produced in cerebrospinal fluid at the same time that there's high REM activity uh, in the brain, which usually indicates a deep dreaming. If, uh, if DMT is indeed uh, the coach that drives NDEs, then what does that tell us, if anything, about what does or does not lie beyond this uh, short mortal life? Well, I've thought a lot about that. Uh, if we take the evidence seriously, the, the DMT state, seems to indicate uh, some kind of hyperdimensional matrix that is actually inhabited by some kind of language-using form of energy that can at least relate to the presence of human beings. I've 
said maybe these were dead souls, an ecology of souls. This is certainly what shamans would claim. Dead souls. If that's true and can be verified by something as simple as a psychoactive drug experience that lasts 15 minutes, then we really scientifically at the end of the 20th century have been looking in all the wrong places. Uh, I, I think we have been looking in all the wrong places and that the real frontier of science is the human mind and its potential and we're not going to unlock that till we get over all this queasiness and hand-wringing on the issue of drugs and drug research and drug use and so forth and so on. Well, I guess you could, you could either view uh, the use of some of these hallucinogenics as a peek at the other side, a peek at what lies beyond the physical and truly lies beyond the physical. In other words, there are a lot of things that I believe our brains can do after all in, I think it's Princeton and uh, other prestigious universities, they're proving that the mind can affect random number generators, that we can do that. The proof is quite substantial, actually, but that's something that a conscious mind does. It's not something that a dead mind does. Um, there are many other things that our living minds can do. For example, they can enable us to travel outside our bodies. I did it once. I know now it's true. You can, in effect, be outside your body. But I, I, I have not decided yet, Terence, whether that experience represents... Uh, something that I will find after my mortal ex do the wild thing at 702-727-1295. Human brain, and, and we just lost it again. Boy, we really are just having quite a night of it here, folks. Poor Terrence. <laughs> after all that buildup, I'm going to have to uh, do something and get him back on the line. There are obvious severe power difficulties going on here right now, folks. So all I can say is bear with us, and Terrence will be right back. Are you overweight? Would you like to lose a guaranteed average 8 to 10 pounds in the next month? Well, we know fiber sweeps fat out of your digestive tract like a broom as a natural course of events. But a new fiber, Kytosan, Natural, because it is derived from shellfish, not only sweeps out fat, but listen to me, ten times as much fat as any other fiber. So it allows this amazing guarantee. Here it is. Eat as you normally do, not more, just as you normally do. No great sacrifice. Order a 90-day supply of Kaito Slim. With it, you get an antioxidant moisturizing cream free of charge. Call one 800 Five five seven four six two seven. Now the guarantee. If you don't lose eight to ten pounds in the next month, you get all your money back, and you keep the cream. It's not available in stores, but you can get it by calling one eight hundred five five seven four six two seven. That's Great American Products at one eight hundred five five seven four six two seven. You've got nothing to lose but the fat. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, we're really getting a, a Y2 case, down, case uh, uh, example out here in the Prump Valley right now. It's really a serious situation tonight with the power. I have no idea what's going on, but whatever it is, it's not good. And it's covering a great deal of geography. So bear with us, everybody. Uh, once again, here's Terrence. See, every time that happens, our phone connection separates. And there's Terrence out in the middle of nowhere with a generator staying right online as I drop off. <laughs> Anyway, Terrence, look, I did this big build-up, and then pff, the phone went away. I was, I was, I guess, approaching what I know about the conscious mind, I know to be true, and what I wonder about. And, of course, what I wonder about is whether there really is some sort of uh, continuation. What's your view? Terrence? Yeah, I know. Oh, that I'm, was to say that was a long formulating pause. Formulating my thoughts. No, I am here. on a night like this, long pauses probably mean the power is going out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree that 
you don't you can't be sure that DMT is showing you the great beyond. It may be showing you the dying brain. It may be taking you to the very edge of death, but that is not death itself. It may, it may be showing you the, the the great within. That's what it may be showing you. Yes, and it doesn't settle the metaphysical questions except it certainly is strong evidence that everything we've been told about entities, about the capacity of the human mind, it, that things are a good deal more complicated than that. Uh, to me, it's the great exception to all rules. What it itself says, other than that all rules have exceptions, I'm, I'm not sure. Terence, if the power were to go out, and stay out, I'll pick Honolulu, all right? In Honolulu, that's a big city, close to you. If, yes. the, if the power went out and stayed out for a month in Honolulu, what do you think would happen socially? Well, in any city, I think push would come to shove in a hurry because water pumps would not work, and so the city water supply would be only what was in the pipes. And... Uh, you can take the scenario from there. Uh, I live on an island hundreds of miles from Honolulu, and thankfully so. I'm not a survivalist, at least not consciously, but I've certainly built a system that is redundant, off-grid, wireless, and capable of maintaining itself without any help from anybody else. Uh, I'm concerned about people... Uh, in cities, uh, even if Y2K does not bring the end of the world, in very dense population centers like Tokyo and Manhattan, where the, simply the number of embedded chips is exponentially high, the possibility of some kind of chain reaction failure is consequently high as well. So I think people should give consideration to moving out of those kinds of areas, even if just temporarily. Mm hmm uh, that's quite a bit of advice. Now, understand that as you as you dispense that device, you're being heard right now. In um, you know, in every major city in America, every single major city, New York City, Atlanta. I wouldn't even go through them all. Every major city in America, you're, you're speaking to these people, and that so that's some serious advice you're handing out there. Well, one of the things on this y to k thing, Art, and today is an interesting day to discuss it, is it, it should clarify as we get closer. There are going to be a couple of rollover dates this month, a big rollover date in August. Uh, I can't believe that we're just going to slam into the millennial date with half of the population thinking it's the end of the world and half assuring us it's no big deal. Is it not going to become more clear? I guess, I guess it is, but, but, but in the end, your advice is, in other words, you think there are going to be problems in cities, and how long do you think that threat of uh, civilization would last? A day? Half a, half a day, a day, two days. They did a Seven, very... 72 hours 72 in most hours. places. 72 uh, hours. And then, you know, of course, you. what the concern is, I suppose, is that the grid will fail in areas where there's bad weather and deep snow and that it will be very hard to get it back up and going. I am not an electrical engineer. I don't think anybody who isn't can make an informed judgment on that. Yeah, I can't. Um, and, I, you know, I'm accused of being gloom and doom about all of this, but I do see what would occur. I think at least I know, frankly, what would occur if we lost our power. There was a movie called The Trigger Effect. Did you ever get to see that? Probably not. I didn't. It, it really shows how quickly civilization would deteriorate if the power went off and people began to conclude it wasn't going to come on any time soon and people reverted to early animal states rather quickly a matter of days as you just said well all you know all these disaster scenarios raise the opportunity for people to imagine that uh, civilization will just slide out from under us i i went through a flood in northern california years ago where the power was off for six and a half days and it did 
Call us toll-free at 1-800-618-8255. Oh, my. Uh, here we go again, folks. Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be an easy night, I can see that. I have no idea what they're doing out there, no idea whatsoever. But I guess all I can do is roll with the punches. One good thing, we will get all of the commercials caught up as I continually uh, go back and retrieve Terrence. Did you know the average person carries 5 to 10 pounds of toxic matter in their intestinal tract? This continually releases poisons into your bloodstream, causing a variety of symptoms like decreased immune function, chronic fatigue, even degenerative diseases. And that's why I recommend Dr. Tbilisi's Super Detox Program. And I take it too, a four-step program to completely cleanse your body of toxic waste. It scrubs your intestinal tract clean, removes stored toxins in your organs, kills yeast and parasites, and restores healthy bacteria. It'll make your body clean, vibrant, and healthy. And when you buy steps one and two of the Super Detox program, you get steps three and four absolutely free. Call Physician's Choice now at 1-800-472-5151. Look, it's guaranteed to work or you get your money back and you can't get it in stores. So call 1-800-472-5151. That's one 1- 800-472-5151. Buy two steps and get two steps free when you call now. Once again, Terrence McKenna, we'll just have to keep getting him back as the uh, power glitches. Um, and it's not, it's, it, we can handle it either way, but what we're getting, Terrence, are these short little boom type breaks. And when that happens, my phone system goes, goodbye, everybody. It's absolutely amazing. I, even uh, I'm getting a good lesson tonight. I'm getting a really good lesson tonight. So, anyway, Y2K. So you, you think, uh, as I do, that you simply aren't going to predict what will happen but are pretty sure what will happen socially if it does happen. Well, and you know, here in Hawaii, we're at the end of the time for the day, so it will have happened in 22 time zones before it gets here. <laughs> So we'll have a notion of it if it's rolling toward us. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right. Uh, so will you, what, what do you plan to do, by the way, on New Year's Eve? Well, go to a party, of course. Really? Uh, you go, go to a party, really? Well, fortunately, the party is only about three miles away. I can, uh, <laughs> I assume I can fight my way back here in the confusion afterwards. Once again, here's Terrence McKenna. Terrence, how much of a loner are you uh, there on your volcano? Well, I'm somewhat of a hermit. I live up here with my girlfriend up a four-wheel drive road that's uh, pretty hairy, and uh, we try to go to town on Mondays and Fridays, and that's the lifestyle when I'm not out on the road. When I'm on the road, I feel like I'm running for president. Uh, so <laughs> it's always a pleasure to get back here. What takes you on the road? Lecturing. That's where I make my money. That's what butters the bread. Mm-hmm. When you lecture, what do you lecture about? I lecture about uh, technology, shamanism, hallucinogens, human evolution, uh, language as a virus from outer space, uh, syntactical aliens, uh, epistemic balkanization, stuff like that. Sheesh. <laughs> uh, that's a lot to lecture about. Do you, do you generally serve up a smorgasbord when you do a lecture of all of these things, or do you do specific lectures, or both? Uh, I do both. Usually my audiences are familiar with my material, and they come primed with questions, and it's usually pretty easy to get a self-generated discussion going based on sure. what people there are interested in, you know. I am very, very, very interested in time, really interested in time. And this has been one area I know that you've talked a lot about. What do you uh, believe about the nature of time, Terrence? Well, what I believe about it that is different from what you'll hear anywhere else is uh, I believe that it 
that probability actually fluctuates in time. That time is not an abstract idea. It's actually a, a medium. And that uh, there's an ebb and flow in time on many scales of what I call novelty and habit. Mm-hmm. And that over time, novelty is in ascendancy. You could say the the cosmos is a novelty producing and conserving system of some sort. So uh, the evolution of higher animals and human cultures and high technology is all in response to this universal appetite for complexification, which I call novelty. And uh, mathematically, we've produced graphs of this that allow you pre- to predict where in historical time and where in the future there should have been great advances in novelty and well, uh, really right, a I, way I, of I, pardon me? I, I think that I'm beginning to grasp the concept of novelty. If 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 I understand it correctly, then you can look back and you can um, uh, you can uh, see what occurred um, with novelty as we have evolved, and then you should also be able to look ahead, should you not? That's right. Uh, just, nobody would argue that the development of novelty has been even uh, in the historical past. It's obviously proceeded in spurts and then uh, periods of quiescence and so forth. And when you apply that to the future, you you see the same thing, except that it leads to an observation which you and I have uh, achieved by different means. You mm-hmm. call it the quickening. I call it the concrescent. But I think both our notions uh, have been drawn toward the idea that this explosion in novelty will keep accelerating. Things become more and more and more novel, faster and faster. And this is really the character uh, of the world that we're living in, and it's destined sure to become is. ever more intense in this particular direction. Surely it is headed toward uh, a climax of some sort, uh, or, Mary, or perhaps even a series of climaxes, if you were to, able to be able to look down uh, two, three hundred years, four hundred years, a thousand years, a series of climactic occurrences and changes. Or, well, I think we're mastering energy, we're mastering our genetic code, time and space, uh, yes, I agree. A series of climaxes, each one more awesome and unimaginable than the ones that preceded it. And this is becoming the dominant characteristic of human existence, is the anticipation and then the experiencing of these surges in the system toward ever greater self-expression of novelty. What great examples of spikes up out of the noise in novelty would you cite in the past? Oh, well, the Italian Renaissance, the Greek Enlightenment that gave us Plato and Aristotle and mathematical theories of nature, Mm -hmm. Uh, eras where invention, movements of people, and the birth of ideas were very concentrated. You know, there was a 40-year period in the 5th century B.C. when Lao Tzu, Mencius, Confucius, uh, Parmenides, Ezekiel, uh, and several other luminaries, all, if they had air tickets, could have had a dinner party together. (laughs) Well, that's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. And uh, are, are we able in any way, based on what has occurred in the past uh, with regard to these spikes, able to predict where this particular cycle is going, What, in other words, what's coming? Well, I've noticed in trying to track different things with these curves that I produce, I look at movement of languages, uh, immigration of people, energy production, what the curves describe best is technological innovation. So I've come to see human history as a kind of alchemical process of bootstrapping ourselves to higher levels of, of, I suppose you'd call spiritual existence, but through machines, through prosthesis, the the machine, far from being alienating and uh, and other, is in fact 
basic somehow. The, the machines are the prosthesis of the new human. Of course, the new human is the prosthesis of the new machine. Hmm. This is all going to take some getting used to. Are we headed towards some brave new world where machines perhaps might even one day take the initiative from us and, in fact, become our masters, as many worry, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the coming miniaturization of everything, the possibility of sentient uh, computers, all the rest of it, that kind of world? Well, I don't know if they will take control, but I think within 20 years, Art, you will encounter machines that will claim to be smarter than you are and be able to convincingly behave as though they were. And the issue, are they more intelligent than the average human being? Are they sentient entities? That'll just be left to philosophers to sort out. Well, but right now, but right now uh, in Europe, don't mean to interrupt, sorry, we are again demonstrating how we kill each other over religious ethnic differences. Um, we have always done that. And would not some machine that became at least as intelligent, if not more intelligent and coldly logical, conclude that um, something has to be done about this and uh, begin to, if it could, take steps. Well, I read a very interesting book by a guy named Michael DeLanda, who would make an excellent guest for you. Uh, he wrote a book called War in the Age of Intelligent Machines. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you want a hair-raising look into the future, this is somebody who can give it to you. Uh, there's a lot of debate among the AI, the artificial intelligence people, about what this superintelligence that seems to be emerging will be like. If it isn't, if it doesn't have the ethics of Buddha, the human race may be down for the count. Precisely. Uh, or at least... Uh... Uh, controlled for the count. Well, uh, yes, it's very hard to imagine what super intelligence would actually look like and what would it would make of us. Well, certainly it would, it, it would it would conclude we are acting irrationally, damaging ourselves. Um, it would look at that coldly and logically, and then it would begin, if it could, I think, to take some steps. So. Well, maybe by thinking along these lines, we can anticipate those steps and take them ourselves in a gentler style. In other words, the first thing any any superintelligence would conclude about human beings is there are too damn many of them. That's correct. And that would well, we that, all... be one of the first steps, Terrence. Yes, well, so are we to turn ourselves into hamburger, or shall we have a, a gentle program of sexual education on the subject of abstinence and restraint? Well, uh, do you think you would uh, be invited to speak at the Vatican about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. My Polish is pretty rusty. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things that stand in the way of that uh, uh, that reality. Um, I suppose uh, an intelligence might conclude, well, the wars do seem to be serving some uh, some some purpose in limiting the numbers. Uh, well, but it's a testament to our own primitive state if we have to rely on primitive Darwinian culling of mm -hmm. the herd to uh, keep us vital. It, it indicates it's a it's a failure of civilization. It's precisely what it is. It's a reversion to barbarism. The 20th century has been embarrassingly scarred by these episodes uh, where very supposedly advanced civilizations with long histories mm -hmm. have slipped into the darkness. And we need to understand what causes that because as Weapons grow more deadly and populations more restive. This the consequences, is going to be a recurring problem. And the consequences are far more final. Have I spoken with you about Matthew Alper? I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Matthew wrote a book called The God Part of the Brain. And it simply concludes that a man's greatest fear long ago and certainly now is of death it is our greatest fear 
It is the one fear our minds cannot contend with. It is the fear we cannot face, and therefore, in the process of evolution, our brains have developed a God part, what he calls a God part of the brain, which demands that we worship something and believe in an afterlife. And without that, uh, we, uh, we, 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 well, there would be virtual um, anarchy. And yet that is the very thing that causes us to kill each other constantly. Uh, we, but, but even when you go down into the recesses, uh, the, the wilds of Brazil, and you find a tribe that has never encountered civilization before, sure enough, inevitably you find they worship something, Terence. Interesting yeah, theory, huh? It sounds like he's sort of working off some of the theories of Julian James. He he suggested in a book about the uh, evolution of consciousness from the bicameral mind, James suggested that as recently as the time of Homer, uh, people had no egos. They actually, God spoke directly to them in situations of crisis and threat and that it was only after centuries of this that this God consciousness part of the psyche was incorporated into the structures of the psyche as the human ego, and that it's actually an invention less than 3,000 years old. Do you believe that travel in time, in any direction, actual travel in time, will be possible or perhaps even go out on a limb and suggest that not only is it possible, but no doubt we are being visited now. Well, I certainly believe it's possible to travel in the forward direction. Uh, I think Kurt Gödel, as early as 1949, pretty well nailed that down. Uh, the mind is... Cultures create our mental confinement in time. This goes back to the psychedelic statement that the psychedelics dissolve boundaries. It really, a shaman is a human mind capable of traveling in time. So uh, I think when we understand our own consciousness, phenomena like time travel will be a part of that understanding. It will just kick out as a, a, a natural part of it. I'm sure you've probably discussed on your program these quantum teleportation experiments over the past couple of years. Uh, well, that's uh, way out science, but nobody expected that for a thousand years. Yes, a lot of people may not know, but IBM actually has done uh, some very crude teleportation. They've, they've actually moved. Can you, can you describe what they did? Uh, they... Yes, you're absolutely right. They moved photons uh, in some kind of teleportation experiment. They moved them uh, several meters at greater than the speed of light, in fact, at a travel time of zero, as far as anybody can tell. And apparently the quantum mechanical equations which allow this effect uh, don't prohibit larger objects or even living objects. It's just a matter of scaling up the power input. Well, good Lord, if we're five or ten years away from being able to teleport objects uh, and possibly human beings, you can't even begin to imagine the, sociolo the sociological and political consequences of something like that. Well, it would, it would completely change everything we know and do. Every concept we have uh, nearly would collapse, and it would indeed be a, a whole new ball game, wouldn't it? It would be a whole new ball game, and a concept like that has to compete with a concept. Uh, like nanotechnology or digital copying of human beings or cloning or uh, there are uh, half a dozen of these potential technologies out there any one of which would remake the world beyond recognition if it were to be perfected oh you know Terence I think we're already cloning they're, they, you know they already absolutely have the technology now they claim they are not doing it and they're doing it with sheep, and we see Dolly, and we see this, and we see that. But they have the technology now to clone human beings. And I don't for one second think that somebody somewhere in some lab, and I, I don't exclude our country from this, 
is cloning. What do you think? It wouldn't surprise me at all. It would surprise me if it was happening inside the United States because then there'd be hell to pay. But somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in India or Indonesia or China... We've always done stuff that gives us hell to pay later. True. The trick is to make it much later. (laughs) Yeah, usually something disclosed about 50 years later. When they don't want you to know something, they wait about 50 years... We fed that plutonium. That's to be the half-life of hot information. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Wait until most of those who are going to be really angry die off, right? That's right. That's how it works. So I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, how could we allow ourselves in, in the black budget world to be behind the cloning curve? I just can't imagine that. I mean... Uh, of course. And the people talk about, you know, the perfect soldier out of... That's right. The infantrymen find the right one and then make 50,000 of that guy. That's right. Uh, that's exactly right. So we have all these dark uh, black military budgets, and uh, what are they doing with them? Well, they're going to want, the, they're not going to want uh, to duplicate Mother Teresa. You can be sure of that. Deep underground somewhere, they're not turning out more Mother Teresas. They're trying to get the perfect killing machine. Well, but they're going to tell you, Art, that if you clone every soldier, then when he's wounded in battle, there'll be a nice crop of organs back on ice in the clone ward for him. Well, that's what you'd tell the the perfect soldier, I guess, to keep him happy. Well, that's what you'd tell the public relations officer. (laughs) So we're moving very rapidly uh, toward all sorts of things that are going to require... Are we really up to making... The proper moral decisions, um, is, is all of this keeping up with technology? Well, uh, this, is the, this is the great question. You know, H.G. Wells, a hundred years ago, he said, history is a race between education and catastrophe. <laughs> Once again, Terrence McKenna. Terrence, it looks like we're okay to go here. Power's been on for almost an hour now. Feeling confident, are you, Art? Yeah, it, 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 that's just when it gets you. I know. But uh, what the heck, I'm going to try it. I've got a bunch of people on the line would like to say hello to you. Great. It's, it's a rare opportunity, so let's, let's do a little bit of that. East of the Rockies, mm-hmm. you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in the wilds of Hawaii. Hi, this is Adam from Austin. I have an experience I'd like to relay to Mr. McKenna. Sure. Um, I've been experimenting with visionary, with visionary substances now for uh, several years. And recently, uh, I tried DMT for the first time in freebase form, and uh, I, quite frankly, was mesmerized. It shook me. I, all I can say is it, 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 it hit me in the soul. Um, I did experience the self-transforming elf machines and... What? Uh, what Terence refers to as the self-transforming elf machines. <laughs> well, maybe maybe somebody could help me out here. Either one of you, self-transforming elf machines, Terence, please. Well, it's not an elf and it's not a machine, but it's rapidly changing from one to the other uh, right in front of your eyes. Uh, well, it's interesting to hear your story. Yes, when it works. Uh, it makes an instant believer out of you. I'm not sure a believer in what, a believer in the power of possibilities, I would think. Oh, absolutely. And the part of the experience that hit me hardest was uh, they were actually, I believe, attempting to translate to me uh, your time wave zero theory, the acceleration of technology to the point of just, I'm not sure, it, it was integration, it was, disintegration. Exactly. Uh, it, yes. Well, uh, there is something. The strange thing, Art, about these plant psychedelics is the sense at high doses that they want to communicate something, something very specific. It's not love one another. We have that message. Mm-hmm. It's some kind of very specific message about time and and genetics or humanity or something. What is time wave zero, actually? Well, time wave zero is this set of theories that I alluded to a few minutes ago 
uh, that take the position that time is this flux of novelty and habit yes. that has been built into the genes and natural processes uh, from the quantum mechanical get-go way back at the Big Bang and that probability is actually a kind of blurred lens for looking at nature and that until we understand the actual fractal nature of time where the same patterns are repeated at many, many different scales and create a, an interference pattern that then accounts for what we experience as reality. What is the, what does the zero part of it mean, Terence? Is that the, the zero part of the time wave theory is that this interference pattern, which keeps pushing habit and novelty around over very long periods of time, novelty begins building up faster and faster, and eventually it reaches uh, infinity. In other words, habit falls to zero, and you get the notion of uh, everything happening at once, or somehow all possibilities becoming realized, that being the only logical consequence of this tendency of the universe to complexify itself faster and faster. And uh, I don't know if you and I have ever talked about it, Art, but the most fascinating scientific discovery of last year, according to Science Magazine, was this cosmological constant called Omega. I'm sure Michel Kaku can talk to this, but the discovery that all of space and time is ruled by an outward expulsive force that's embedded in the space-time matrix itself. And the interesting thing about that force is, like the time wave I theorized, it accelerates through time. It's moving faster and faster. So the new cosmology, just eight months old, holds that the universe is basically going to undergo this kind of inflationary expansion like the quickening, like the novelty concrescence that we've been talking about. This has now emerged as the paradigmatic notion in astrophysics after being resisted for 50 years. Einstein played with the idea, called it his biggest blunder and dumped it, but now observational astrophysics is forcing them to realize this is actually, this force exists and it is in time going to emerge as the dominant force shaping the physics of the universe. Fascinating. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Hi, Art. Uh, my name's Maureen. I'm calling from Redding, California. Well, hi there. Hi. We have some funky power struggles going on. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, hi, Terrence. Hi, how are just, you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, are you familiar with um, com trails at all? With who? Con trails? Yeah. That, that's something that we've been discussing on the show. Right. Okay. Oh, is it the thing about the large numbers of contrails that people think are a viral seeding or nanotech project? Absolutely. Well, um, well fortunately, I only know of this because I follow the Internet. I haven't seen any contrails here. We mm -hmm. got a photograph of a DEA helicopter where you could see the rivets on the sucker yesterday morning. Wow. But uh, no contrails. <laughs> well, was, was that over your house, uh, Terrence? Oh, yeah, they fly this neighborhood like crazy. Uh, they're true believers in it, but they're not supposed to come closer than 200 feet to the ground, and this guy was well under 200 feet. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they make the rules. Yeah, uh, well, for the wise men and the fools. <laughs> I'm, I'm not oblivious to the possibility that, for example, uh, let's just draw a quick little scenario. If our government thought that we were on the verge of a biological attack of some sort, and they had what they thought was a remedy for it in terms of some sort of mass inoculation, I don't think for a second that they would uh, not consider an inoculation without our specific permission. And what better way to do that than to, um, to add to what to most people, are just harmless little contrails cutting across the sky. Uh, so that's one, you know, possibility. There are other more sinister ones, but 
That's at least one that would make sense to me. Well, do you remember those experiments that came out a few years ago where they spread powder in airports and railway stations back in the oh, 60s, yeah. some oh, kind of bacterial yeah. powder that oh, they could then yes. follow. It was some study of, of a possible contamination. New event. York subways, uh, Terrence, uh, San yeah, Francisco, right. gee whiz, they did a whole bunch of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, well, so it would be nice to think that they're uh, inoculating us for our own good against the evils uh, hatched in the laboratories of Serbian fascisti. I like that scenario. <laughs> Let's do the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Is this me, Art? Only you know that for certain, but it sounds like you. Well, thanks. Art. Where, where are you? In Indiana. Okay, you're going to have to kind of yell at us. You're not too loud. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't hear him. Yep, see? So yell at us. Well, I wanted to thank you for the uh, response on the email first, Art, because I you know, I didn't expect to get one back so quick from you. Oh, uh, with regard to? The Crystal Gale's dress. I don't know if you, I don't know <laughs> uh, if you uh, answered this or not. Of course I remember, yes. Okay. Yeah. And as far as the question that I wanted, um, I think what I wanted to do was compliment this person. I've never heard him before, but he's he's awful good. Yes, he is. He's very, very good. Yes. And I had a, I had a question as far as to possibly ask him if this would work over in Yugoslavia, since he since he is you know so bright. Can I ask it? If what would work? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I I really believe we have a major problem, and uh, you're right. I don't think I don't think we should look at it too lightly. Nor do I. So anyway, if, if if you think this would work, I would like to know, and that is to, you know, give the president over there, the the dictator, three weeks to eliminate all the people in his town, uh, Belgrave. Bel Belgrave, the capital. Yeah. Yes. So they could all move out, like they've moved everybody from Kosovo. Yes. And they they would have a chance to get away from that town. And then we would do what to Belgrade? Well, we would destroy it like they've destroyed those villages. I see. All right. They could, well, let's, I let's, just let's, wonder, let's see. How, would how, that work? Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it would work or not. What do you think of that uh, little gem of a, an idea, Terrence? Well, I think... Uh... I think the word quagmire comes to mind. I also think that Belgrade may be being destroyed as we speak. I keep going over to Reuters' top stories, but I don't think anybody's going to be given three weeks' notice. I think it's tonight or tomorrow night, uh, judging by the pace of things. Will it have an effect? I don't know. Dictators are extremely immune to popular pressure unless their generals come to them and lay their pistols on the table. Uh, these guys have a tendency to hang on. I think we've bitten off a hell of a lot to chew, and uh -huh. I'm certainly in favor of confronting fascism, but I think Same you here. should choose your, your, your fights, fights carefully. Uh, well, I also think that some of the people who make these decisions, these goodwill decisions to go and bomb until there is peace, should be required themselves to do some of the heavy lifting. But they just make the intellectual decisions and spew out the orders to those who must go and do the work. Well, and it's a strange way of handling the problem, isn't it? I mean, we'll spend probably half a billion dollars. Uh, a lot of peasants will be pushed around. Some people will be killed. What do we have covert operations for? What do we have special forces for? Uh, right. The guy to get is Milosevic. That's right. That's right. And I would also note that this horrid flood of refugees really did not seem to begin until our bombing did. Do you notice that? Yeah, well, people are just trying to get out any way they can. I think ethnic cleansing in Kosovo is feet to accompli at this point. Yeah. Um, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in Hawaii. Hello. Hello, how are you? Just what? fine. Just fine. Oh. Sir. Well, I can't believe I'm finally talking to you. Um, Where are you? Uh, actually, I'm in. I'm on the West Coast. I'm in. I'm in California. On a cell okay. phone. Oh, on a cell phone. How, how did you know? Just a uh, guess. <laughs> Well, um, the uh, the question that I had was um, in in uh, regards to um, 
marijuana use, and I, I don't know if, you, if if that's one of the one of the topics that he was talking. about. Absolutely, go right ahead. Okay, because uh, I can I heard I heard the other guy talking about DMT. And I'm not really really um really sure about you know exactly what that is. What what exactly is DMT? Is it, did I miss something? It's a good question. What is DMT? DMT is dimethyltryptamine. It's a human neurotransmitter and an alkaloid that occurs in plants and the kick-ass hallucinogen that you smoke. Oh, okay. So is, is it contained in marijuana or? No, no, no. Marijuana is uh, THC and various cannabinoids. But uh, but what what was your thought on marijuana? Okay. Uh, well, Terrence, uh, the question I had about it was. Uh, I, I I actually I've, I'm I'm 25 years old and I've 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 experimented with marijuana since the age of eight, <laughs> and um, well, I can't say experiment. I just no. I was gonna say you more than an experiment <laughs> at this point. But uh, I stopped I stopped for several years. I I, um, I did some some uh, military service and so so forth. So I wasn't able to to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I I did notice that when I stopped, I had um, I experienced some. Um, depressive anxiety kind of like side effects from not using it. I don't know if it, this was because of long-term effects of using it. You're and saying I, you went through withdrawal? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I can't say withdrawal, but I think that, the, that what happened was I tried to substitute it for something else because I wasn't able to use it. So I, I, I went over to smoking cigarettes and and drinking alcohol, which was the substitute for it. Mm. And and from that, I it just, it just seems like it seems like it was more of a of like kind of substituted and um, well, so part of what you're saying here is that marijuana was a gateway drug for you to alcohol well something like that it was just, it, 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 it was illegal and i and, i understand well you know what he's saying what, uh, what? Terrence, uh, let me interrupt what he's saying is that when he when he couldn't do pot anymore then right. he resorted to smoking and booze Exactly. And I yeah, well, most drugs are used by most people to relieve stress. That's right. Uh, you know, if you only smoke cannabis uh, once a month or something, it's pretty spectacular mentally. But if you smoke it every day or two, you're basically using it uh, to, to handle stress, which is legitimate, of course. I mean, that's why somebody has a drink in the evening or, or even watches TV. I mean, TV is a drug that is used to relieve stress, although arguably long-term it may add to your stress. Uh, but yeah, habits are difficult to break, and chemical habits are the most difficult habits to break. Nature sets us up uh, to chemically addict us to the people around us, our routines, the foods we prefer. This is something that, as I said earlier, we're not facing and talking about and educating our kids about. It's like the way the 19th century approached people's sexual fantasies and mm -hmm. desires is sort of the way we approach our relationship to drugs. We're not really owning up to how complicated it is. Now, can I ask a straight-out question? That's why. In other words, what is it that our government, our elected leaders, our institutions can't handle about people doing drugs? Very simply, drugs are, for mysterious reasons, deconditioning agents, and they cause people to question cultural values. And every political system on Earth is in the business of maintaining cultural boundaries. So the, it's an implacable opposition there that's not easily negotiated away. It's a very brave, self-confident society that can legalize all drugs, because it means that society is not afraid of looking in its closets and playing with a, a fair deck. Are there examples we can point to where uh, such a policy is in place and working well? Well, everyone talks about the Netherlands, you know, legal prostitution, lowest AIDS rate in Europe, legal heroin, lowest heroin addiction rate in Europe, uh, and no prison building going on. Young people are using cannabis. Yes, they are not using hard drugs. The connection between the soft and hard drugs seems to have been broken by legalization there. But our own drugs are completely distorted the Dutch position in public statements to the point where he later had to publicly retract what he knew. 
now uh, back to Terrence McKenna in beautiful uh, Hawaii, beautiful paradise, Hawaii. It really is um, a paradise. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to get away from uh, the main island and go to, some, for example, Maui. I've spent a lot of time there, and it really is like living in paradise. And I, I don't know how anybody could leave there and go anyplace else, though I did that. All right, uh, Terrence, here we go. A lot of people want to talk to you um, west of the Rockies. You're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Oh, you're up in Seattle, aren't you? Right. It's Carl up in Seattle. Carl, what what happened up there? Well, you know, I just heard on Como because I was, you know, thank God they have redial buttons on these phones. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I was busy redialing. Uh, I was listening to it, and they said we had a power surge rule about uh, an hour or so ago. That would be about right. And I wasn't looking out the window, but they uh, they just mentioned it because there was a peak, and I, I, knew, I heard click. And, and I noticed the lights flickered. Just I'm just lying in my apartment with the lights out here, listening to you on the radio. But I noticed there was a little flicker in the lights. Mm-hmm. So, kind of, a, you know, it's very interesting that this should occur on a day when they said that uh, there, there would be some sort of possible beginning Y2K effect. It, it really a precursor. Yeah, precursor. There you go. That's good. That's Ed's word, precursor. Well, anyway. I think, Art, you know, I've got to tell you, one thing I liked about you is you've got an old-time radio voice. You speak in fonts. <laughs> and I really enjoy that. Yeah. And I have a question for Terrence. Yes. Terrence, can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Uh, talk to me about salvia divinorum. I'm growing some this year. I've been growing it for the last three years, but the last time I tried that stuff, it scared the hell out of me. I thought that Jay Leno was talking about me on TV, and I thought it was like Philip K. Dick novel where they were sending out some telepathic police. <laughs> and that's and your question is... <laughs> what, what, what's been your experience uh, with it, and what is it trying to tell you? Because it doesn't seem to be a very friendly teacher. Uh, well, it's certainly different chemically and in terms of its effect, uh, but I've found it very interesting. I know most people seem to be smoking it. I did most of my experiments with it a few years ago. I enjoyed chewing it. I laid down in silent darkness and uh, it swept me away to a very interesting sort of colored, flexing, three-dimensional kind of place. Uh, I I've enjoyed the link to Daniel Siebert's page from your, uh, from your homepage and I must say your homepage is very professional. Oh, well, website. thank you. It's going to all change soon. Uh, I I designed that one. My son is going to take over the design process, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. The new one is going to have a lot more links, so check it out. i got to say also that you guys are talking about, I think the history of drug, uh, drug enforcement in this country is just sort of like a series of unhappy accidents. But they mm-hmm. used to say that Social Security was the third rail of American politics, and now it's right. drugs. I don't think we can do anything about it. And what really gets me is... They start talking about kids using solvents. Well, I think there's a natural urge to go out there and break down those boundaries because language encodes stuff for you. And I think one of the reasons people take psychedelics is because it breaks down the barriers and you get to see stuff real again. But that's... Well, in shamanic societies, you know, they take the young kids out and the men give the young boys psychedelics and the women initiate the young mm-hmm. girls. And instead of... The taking of a substance being a symbol of the rejection of social values, it becomes the doorway to the full acceptance of social values. So well, my, answer can, to the, my answer to the drug problem was grow your own. I think they should just make everybody pay a marijuana stamp tax, and we can just all grow our own, and that would cut the, uh, the black market right out of it. Well, well that's, that's yes, right. the profit were removed by any means, either by legalization, grow your own, or what have you, uh, the drug problem would shrink to a whole new dimension. Hmm. Here's an interesting bit of email. Ken from Bloomington, Indiana says, Hey, Art, you know, when I was in the Army, we used to say killing for peace is like whoring for virginity. I love it. Well, remember the logic in 1984? War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. That's right. That's exactly right. Oh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Hello. Hi, this is Erin from Boulder, Colorado. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if um, Terrence could talk a little bit about what the Mayans predicted would happen in the year 2012 and um, how that coincides with his ideas about what might happen then too? 
Well, that's a very interesting question. It's funny that you're from Boulder because the Boulder is the home of John Major Jenkins, who wrote a very interesting book published this past year called Maya Cosmogenesis 2012. And in that book, he discusses the various interpretations of the end of uh, the Mayan calendar. Uh, basically, what happens in 2012 is it's the end of the 13th Bakhtun. And Bakhtuns are periods of time longer than 500 years. Thirteen of them make up a full cycle of the Mayan calendar. Uh, and it appears that this is, was linked by the Mayans to a certain astrological configuration where the winter solstice sun heliacally rises at the galactic center. Uh, this is sort of technical stuff, but that's it in a nutshell. It's an alignment with the galactic center and the winter solstice rising sun that pegs the whole Mayan world machinery, and it's coming around after 26,000 years uh, in about 14 years, 13 years. So what sort of implications does that have for us? What, what's supposed to happen then? Good question. Well, you know, the, very little of the literature of the Maya survives, so we don't know whether they... Uh, the best guess is that for the Maya... The end of the 13th Bakhtun indicated the beginnings of the first moments of true creation. So rather than seeing it as the end of the world, they saw it as some kind of beginning of an era of perfection, sort of like the thousand years of the millennium predicted in Revelation. So... Uh, I think we can't know, but what we can know is that if you wanted to peg uh, your calendar to the largest cosmic cycle that human beings have observed affecting the Earth, you would choose this 26,000-year processional cycle, and they chose it with great accuracy, even though their own civilization didn't live to see the, the coming of that particular time. But we will. How's that? Um, thank you. Thank you All right. You're welcome. Here's another email. This is interesting, uh, Terrence. This email says, Art, there have been power surges and outages up and down the entire western U.S. during the last half hour. This was written at 1 a.m. It just fried my computer. What's going on? So we may have, we may be getting a little taste here, uh, Terrence. Hard yes, to I'm fascinated by it. Uh, there was no report on the tech page at Reuters of any problem in Europe or the East Coast today because I checked before I came on the program. But maybe the uh, April 1 rollover is biting in the West Coast. Maybe it is. First time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hello, is this me? That's you. Hey, this is Michael calling from Oregon, long-time listener. Hi, Michael. Um... I just want to say first, Art Bell, I think you're a god. I love no, you. No, I'm, I'm not a god. I'm not a god. Well, I mean, personal opinion. <laughs> and uh, my question for Terrence is, um, do you think that uh, with, with the way that technology and uh, people's self-knowledge is uh, progressing, that we're going to reach a point in time where all of our mental uh, boundaries will be broken and we'll just be free of thought? I think we're going to see all kinds of group mind activities and uh, uh, complicated games that will slowly teach us how to operate as group minds the way flocks of birds and uh, schools of fish do. I've been recently spending more time in the virtual and interactive worlds online, the worlds where you dress up as an avatar and meet other people in designed worlds. And uh, if you haven't checked in on that lately, it's gotten a lot better. And you can see uh, the potential for people creating worlds and then sharing them with other people online so that really we're peeling open our heads and letting it all hang out. And it's going to have a real impact on community and the human self-image and the, the way we think about the individual and the community. Definitely. All right. Definitely. All right, Colter, thank you. Terrence, um, did you get the question before we blipped out? 
yes. The question was, why are these, the psychedelics so beneficial to some people and so shattering to other people? That's correct, yes. And the simple answer is, there's a lot to be said for going back and looking at the concept that Leary and his colleagues put forth in the 60s of set and setting. Setting is, you know, you take these things, you don't do it in a noisy nightclub, you do it in a place that's secure, comfortable, familiar, and then the set, your mindset, you do it calmly, you aren't hysterical, you aren't emotionally wrought up, you aren't drunk, and if people will follow these simple rules, which are basically rules of reasonable behavior and respect for the substance, uh, most people do fine. Uh, so your answer is uh, the people that have gone the wrong way have had the wrong attitude. Is that kind of what it boils down to, right? Been in with the wrong people in the wrong places at the wrong time. That doesn't cover 100% of all unpleasant experiences. I mean, some people are on prescription drugs that tangle with these things unpleasantly. Sure. And some people... You know, if psychedelics dissolve boundaries, there's probably two or three percent of the population that is involved in trying to maintain boundaries, and those people should stay away from psychedelics. They have a different agenda. All right, let's grab one before the top of the hour. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on there with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Good morning to you. Hello. Hello. I'd like to uh, first off make a statement about the Y2K bug. Sure. I have a very good friend who back in the 80s, he claims that he uh, actually helped code it. Code the Y2K bug? Yes. Well, that might just mean he was a programmer doing what they all did. It, it's going to be bad, according you're, to him. You're, well, yes, you're trying to suggest that he was part of some sort of conspiratorial effort to make sure the Y2K bug hit hard? No, it's not uh, conspiratorial as far as I know. But from what he tells me is that it is out there and that he did help write the code for it. Well, a lot of people did that. All right. Anything else, sir? Yes. First, I'd like to... Uh, my first question is about the element that you mentioned earlier, element 92. Yes. Where would I find more information about that? At your local library. They'll even teach you how to... Uh... Uh, arrange it so that you can cause a massive explosion with that element. Uh, you just have to do a little reading. All right. All right. And my last question would be um, for Terrence. What is the drug that he's used that has given him the most um, powerful experience? That's a good question, Terrence. Well, powerful, I don't know. In terms of life-changing, I mean, certainly psilocybin at one point changed my life, LSD at another point, DMT all along the way. It seems to be this small family of tryptamines, and then of course LSD isn't a tryptamine, but uh, at high doses, all and these safe but high doses, all of these things have had life-changing impact on me and the people that I'm aware of. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Hi. Hey, guys. Um, this is Eric from uh, Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to – I really like your show, Art. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot for everything. Um, I was just wondering, are you guys going to go see the new movie, Matrix? Um, the premise of the movie is a, a combined uh, nanotechnology uh, biological hallucination that everyone has more control over their um, illusion. Uh, should be interesting, but my question is for um, parents. Um, parents, uh, through all your uh, inter interdimensional traveling, do you have any concept of what the afterlife for you um, would be? No, we've discussed this here in the last 24 hours, and I was shown to be inadequate. Uh, hmm. I have noticed in virtual reality that sometimes the landscape builds out ahead of you if you have good processors and you can actually watch the landscape springing into existence. Yeah. I can sort of imagine the end of life is like that process in reverse. You know, just more and more is subtracted. And my ketamine experiences have convinced me that a consciousness with 
without a body is an entertainable idea. Mm -hmm. Consciousness without a body is simply like the volume of your mind turned up until it's all there is. And then I can imagine just unfolding into thought without a spatial locus. But does that go on forever? That's a little hard to feature. Of course, nothing that we know of goes on forever. So to con- to imagine that when you find out what lies beyond death, you found out what eternity is, maybe... Maybe that's why we come back. Death. Maybe that's why we uh, maybe reincarnate. Do you believe in reincarnation? Uh, well, if reincarnation occurs, it's a way of getting away from this mm-hmm. paradox of eternally existing exactly. as mm-hmm. a conscious form in some other dimension. Yeah. Um, w- one more question. Has um, the other has the other side ever uh, communicated to you through uh, lights, or have you ever seen the all-seeing eye, like the from the Egyptian times? Uh, I I think that these entities communicate with sound and light, yeah. and sound which you can see, and they seem to have some kind of a language which is like has more dimensions than acoustical language. It's not telepathy, but it's something that you is sculptural. You experience yeah. it as a visual medium. A mosaic. And it's high bandwidth, yes. That's incredible. Um, we you... could be on the brink of engineering something like that as a human mode of communication if we could unleash psychopharmacology and really right. understand what's going on. It's with really mind. We live really in incredible times. Do you think yeah. all these these prophecies and um, all these things set in place from the past are, are ways for us to actually be moving into this new dimension, this new paradigm. Well, we're at the end of a thousand-year period, and we're at the climax of the agenda of modern science, and uh, we're moving off the planet, and we're move, going digital. There are yeah. so many transformative tendencies in play that I think you would have to really be resisting the tide to right. not see that we're ready to make some kind of leap. It's incredible. I mean, I really see um, that this uh, paradigm of thought is overtaking um, the old paradigm, and the old paradigm needs to firmly hold uh, control. And, mm-hmm. and I just think um, we just keep what we're doing, keep doing like with our show, um, everything is going to be all right. Right. Everything's going to be all right. And that's not through rose-colored glasses either, Art. All right. I appreciate the call, sir. Thank okay, you. bye. Take care. Uh, here's one by email. Uh, somebody wants to know, and I, I really am not sure myself, uh, wants to ask you your opinion on Tim Leary's work with prisoners and the reasons his findings were suppressed. What do you know about that? I don't know a whole lot about that. I assume this refers to Vacaville. Um, what I know is that there was a whole wing of Vacaville in the 60s that was basically a CIA laboratory for experimenting on controlling and programming people with drugs. Uh, what Tim Leary had to do with it, I'm not a historian of his life. I couldn't say. Uh, I do think that... Sirhan Sirhan passed through that facility, so did Charlie Manson, so did uh, uh, General Sin Q, the character who led the Symbionese Liberation Army, remember them? Oh, yes. And and, uh, so there was, you know, it's well documented that there was CIA interest in all these things. Uh, Recently, you probably noticed our Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, who ran that MKUltra program, he died recently. I heard that, yes. Yeah, he took a lot of secrets with him, I'm sure. What uh, would you imagine would occur to somebody, given uh, LSD, uh, unsuspecting, totally unsuspecting, given LSD? What, what, what would well, you I, it depends on, again, the circumstances. If you were out in public, I think most people would lead to the conclusion, first, that they were had been poisoned and then a few minutes later that they were losing their mind and yes. uh, I think it's you know one of the most 
fundamental violations of a person's dignity to give them a drug without uh, discussing it with them and them being fully uh, consensual. Why do I agree? Uh, uh, fun, uh, there is no more fundamental invasion of privacy than such a William thing. Burroughs once said there was only one commandment, and it was, Thou shalt not blow pot smoke in thy pet's face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remember that one, Terrence. Thanks. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Art Bell and Terrence McKenna in Hawaii. Hello. Hello to you. Yes, sir. Where are you? Uh, I am in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, just here doing the uh, computer thing. Yes, sir. Um, th what I would like to ask is uh, a few of us are going to take a trip down to Mexico, and we're going to be doing the mine thing down there. And I was wondering if uh, I can get any direction on which way to go. What? Simple as that. Which way to well, go? Well, the Mayan ruin of Palenque in the state of Chiapas. Uh, uh, overlaps uh, mushroom territory. Uh, it's a little late, but there still may be mushrooms there this time of year. Uh, that's a beautiful ruin. Uh, Ushmal in the Yucatan is a beautiful ruin. If uh, you get down to Belize, Chinantunich out in the uh, west end of the country, um, those are my favorite ones, and Tikal in Guatemala. But Palenque and Chiapas is the is the gem of the Mayan archaeological uh, that's site. Way down, way down south. Are you, just, can you go that far down south, Connor? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're pretty much we just uh, got back from the Andes, and that's all uh -huh. we do is hike in the mountains. Yeah, yeah well, the that. Sierra Mazateca behind Palenque is some of the most rugged country in Mexico with some of the world's deepest caves. But, of course, there's uh, political problems back in there. The Mexican right. army is leaning on the Indians pretty heavily, so you want to know your turf. Did you find any problems down there when you were there in January? Not at the ruin, uh, but in the mountains, which begin immediately behind the ruin, all bets are off. Huh, I gotcha. Um, I just want to also thank you very much for the uh, electronic music culture that's going on, for the work that you've done, and the, I guess the spoken word that you've done with them. I want to thank oh, you very much for that. Thanks very much. Yeah, you are definitely in our consciousness around here in the Silicon Valley. And, uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the Santa Cruz visit also. Thanks for calling. Okay, right. bye-bye. Take care. Uh, Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, um, I'm a first-time caller. Where are you? I'm in California. Okay. Los Angeles, and I'm right. calling on K. I'm I'm listening to KABC. The K mighty, the mighty flagship station. Yes, sir. Yes, in LA. Seven ninety. Um, the reason I was calling was uh, one reason was my actually my brother did slip me some acid when I was eleven years old and have that experience I can share. Oh my God. Uh, Four-way window pane and. Um, I was never a heavy drug user during my life, but that was a real radical experience. Um, other than that, nobody seems to want to talk about how much resources they recently found in Kosovo. Um, someone called me today, because I know a lot of people in the government as well as private, and I'm in international business. They found trillions of dollars worth of resources in Kosovo. Well, that may well be. What happened to you on this uh, uninvited acid trip? Um, well, what happened was my brother was into some sort of satanic rituals with his buddies, and they thought it'd be a great joke to go ahead and slip me four-way window pane. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting really violently ill initially because I didn't know what was going on. I was spinning. Um, I laid down, and I laid down in the uh, waterbed, and the vacuum started running on itself, and it started vacuuming the room methodically, you know? <laughs> so I realized I was... I knew at that point that, obviously... My brother and his friends had obviously done something to me, you know. What they had done, I don't know. They didn't tell me at that time. Then I started changing colors, okay, like blue, green. I was really, then I started um, going into what they would say, kind of like a bad trip, but I was still basically barely able to keep sense of reality, you could say, you know, because that's a pretty serious dose at, the, at, at that kind of age. It's a terribly serious dose. Yeah. Um, and I guess in youth, uh, thank you, you would, you would handle such thing better. But I would imagine, Terrence, not only would somebody in, uh, who um, had that done to them feel like they were losing their mind, but probably could actually 
slip out of reality and stay out of reality under such conditions. That that would be one possibility, wouldn't it? Well, the fear thing starts a cascade, and then people do desperate or foolish things, and yeah. No, it's a really dumb thing. Well, this caller comes from a typical dysfunctional American family, uh, mm -hmm. satanic rituals, uh, <laughs> siblings dosing others with LSD. This is why we need drug education. We are, we are. Terrence, welcome back. Good to be back. You are there. <laughs> Good. I am, I am. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, here we go, um, hopefully. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell on a weird night, but fun. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, this is Frank from uh, Cotati, California. It's uh, Sonoma County. Hi, Frank. And um, I read in Timothy Leary's Timothy autobiography, Flashbacks, about some experiments they had done at some prisons back east. I think when he was still at Harvard, using psilocybin to rehabilitate um, inmates. And the thing about it was they had a, a far lower recidivism rate, and that just basically got covered up and ignored. And then, then they got bounced out of Harvard, so it just kind of disappeared. Um, but I thought that was one thing that was pretty interesting. And uh, I, did, I want to put in a plug for uh, a book by Dale Pendel. Uh, the name of it is Pharmacopoeia. And uh, it's an excellent um, explication of all the varieties of mind-altering substances. I think it might be an interesting guest for you. Is that something you're familiar with, Terrence? Yes, uh, Pharmacopoeia, Dale Pendell, he's an interesting character, and he can spin a line of rap. He would be an interesting guest. That's a, that's an excellent book. All right, well, Terrence, maybe you ought to just sort of construct a list of interesting guests and how to get hold of them and email it to me or something. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I would love that, because it sounds like you've got a lot of very interesting suggestions. Now, here's an email from Boulder City right outside of Las Vegas, um, and he says, I live just outside of Boulder City, and I'm looking across Boulder City right now, and all the lights are out. Now, that's where Boulder Dam is. So that's, that's kind of interesting, too. Hmm, 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 hmm. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hi. Great, I made it. Uh, this is John in Las Vegas, uh, 105.1. Hi, John. Talk FM. How you doing? Hi. Um, I uh, talked to you guys last year on March 19th, uh, I called and related the experience about the dream and the geometry book. And I wrote a short story about it called Times Square. <clears throat> I sent it out on March 13th, Saturday. Sent you a copy, Art. Yes, sir. Did you get it? I got it. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Terrence, if you would care to receive a copy, I'd love to send you one. If you uh, that. Yeah, go to my website at levity.com, and my <laughs> email button is right there on the Terrence McKenna page. Well, I'm not really wired, or I don't have a computer. Um, go to a library. Right, but <laughs> this involves 11 pages with color scans and stuff. I don't know if I can send that out that way. Well, you well uh, actually, if you go to that website, my P.O. box oh, is great. there, too. Oh, great. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm not computer literate. All right. Well, listen, I'll, I'll tell you what. We'll even do you another favor. Why don't you give out your P.O. Box, Terrence? Sure. Uh, it's P.O. B. 677, and the name of the town is H-O-N-A-U-N-A-U, -A -A Hawaii 96726. Hold so that's Hona now, H-O-N-A-U-N-A-U, -A -A Hawaii 96726, and I'm P.O. B. 677. Post Office Box 677. Spell that town one more time. H-O-N. A-U-N-A-U. N-A-U. That's a weird name. And you pronounce that? Ho-na-nao. Mm. It must have taken a while after you moved there to get that down. <laughs> oh, well. Or did you name the town? I mean, is it... No, no. It's a lifetime struggle for the poor Howley to be able to pronounce Hawaiian <laughs> even closely to correct. Yes. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on there with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Morning. Good morning, uh, Terrence, and good morning, Art. Yes, sir. Uh, I went through uh, uh, Vacaville and uh, another uh, state mental institution in uh, in California. 
they have used those mental institutions not only for programming, but to destroy any political prisoner that they deem uh, a threat to quote unquote society. Um, and then when were you in the box of them? I was in uh, from 90, let's see here, 91 uh -huh. until 90, 94. So that was well after all these things that were charged about the 60s. But I, I'm sure, you know, all this work goes on. I mean, these, as Art said, these black uh, budget agencies wouldn't be fulfilling the taxpayer's mandate if mm -hmm. they weren't pursuing all these horrifying technologies and possibilities. This is always the argument. Yes, they, they, uh, they continually uh, do their, their little tricks and uh, tricks of the trade. Um, I was very aware of it due to some connections that I had prior to going in, and that's one of the reasons that I was in. And they, in fact, held me uh, six and a half years illegally without due process of law. Silence? Are you there? Well, I'm just wondering how much of this goes on that we don't hear about, you know. I mean, we have a tendency, you and I mentioned it earlier, to expose the sins of 25 years ago, but yep. what's going on tonight? I don't, you know what, Terrence, I wish that I believed that we had had some great transformation, that we are now this moral, ethical um, government that we thought we had years ago and now have found out we of course we didn't have but I don't think anything's changed I think the players have changed and I think 25 or 30 years or 50 years from now we'll find out all the crap we're doing now I'm sure that's true I mean I think it's a very cynical game anybody who thinks we emerged into the light with Watergate or something like that just uh, has bought uh, a very obvious uh, establishment line. You're here, here. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Hello. Hi. Is that me? That's you? Oh, hi. 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 Where, where are you? Uh, I'm in uh, beautiful Vancouver, B.C. Vancouver. All right. Yeah. Uh, wow, I can't believe I'm on here. Um, <clears throat> um, gee, well, it's, uh, it's really a, a treat to hear uh, you're on the air again there, Terrence. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is about... Uh, Specifically, uh, DMT, and uh, I've, I've read most of your books, and they're uh, amazing. The um, the connection, the possible connection, has there been any more? Have you looked into, or has there been more, any more research into the possible connection of the tryptamines being uh, a connection to what uh, to so what was known as soma, or what we know as soma from uh, well, the writing soma or by delusion mysteries continues, you know. I mean, there's endless discussion about what was this fantastic hallucinogen that inspired the writing of the Vedas. Uh, I let's see. In the recent issue of Eleusis, Jonathan Ott reviews all theories, including my own, and uh, finds mine inadequate and everybody else's as well. Uh, I think it's pretty clear it was psilocybin. Uh, some people want to say it was Amanita muscaria, but Amanita muscaria is an unreliable and, and sometimes dangerous uh, intoxicant. If it was neither a psilocybin mushroom nor Amanita muscaria, then the candidates are not very promising. So uh, this is an area that needs to be looked at. It was all regarded as settled and that Watson had figured it out, but now we know that uh, he, there was a lot of evidence that's come to light since he did his work that pushes the argument in new directions. I, I talk about this in Food of the Gods. There are two chapters related to Soma. Yeah, I was, I was asking if there was anything, anything uh, new has come to light since then. Or uh, well, Giorgio Samarini, who studies the Iboga cults in Gabon, told me that in the inner mysteries of these Iboga cults, there is mushroom symbolism and the use of the colors red and white. So that's evidence of a possible mushroom cult connected with hallucinogenic substances in Africa. That was a previously missing piece of the puzzle. 
But no, I wouldn't say this argument has advanced uh, dramatically. I think until uh, Algeria is politically stable enough to permit archaeology in the southern Sahara, the early human use of hallucinogens in Africa and the Middle East is going to remain uh, unclear. I see. Oh. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the call, sir. Card line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Good morning. Hi, my name's Michael, and I'm in California. Hi, Michael. Terrence, uh, 30 years ago this month, I was sitting in a coffee shack in uh, below Ho Now Now, making a wine club, getting ready to go to my draft physical. <laughs> well, so you know Ho Now Now. Oh, I do well. Right. Yeah, well, it hasn't changed that much. It's a well kept secret. With a spelling like that, we figure we're off the map. <laughs> I love Captain Cook, the whole area. Hmm. Um, in reg- something additional to the uh, DMT lore, I was, I was thought of uh, the Sleeping Beauty, of just a frog, and turned him into a prince. Right. Well, you know, the uh, toad DMT source, right? Well, yeah, this is something we haven't mentioned I, maybe on the air. I thought but maybe it's... you shouldn't. Admit. <laughs> it's, it's not too many toads left. <laughs> well, we don't want to deplete the toads, yeah. but... Uh, there are near relatives of DMT in some toads. Let's just put it like that. Yeah. Well, I was just the really thought of the uh, turning the woman into or the frog into the prince we might have something to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Good okay, evening. Thanks. Thank you. East of the Rockies, you're on there with Terrence McKenna and Art Bell. Good morning. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep. Now, here's an example of a bad portable phone. Yep. Uh, some of us um, don't have a lot of money to buy. All right. Yell, yell into the, your bad phone and <laughs> ask us, your question. <laughs> some of us don't have a lot of money to buy good... Um, I hear that. Um, anyway, I, I've been growing psychoactive fungus and um, plants for a number of years now. And um, I've recently been trying to find plants which contain DMT. And I, I used the plant mimosa, and I grew that. And um, it contained the, the substance, but not in high enough quantities, and I was wondering if Terrence could recommend any uh, obtainable plant sources for the source of DMT. Okay. Uh, well, Socotria viridis is the preferred source of DMT in the Amazon. I know it's hard to get and hard to grow. Uh, the Mimosa hostiles and the Mexican conspecific species, the name of which escapes me because it's so late at night, uh, <laughs> Those two in the root bark are pretty competitive. There's also Anadonanthra peregrina variety Sibyl. The seeds of that are also contain a, a fair concentration, in fact, a high concentration. Uh, Acacia confusa is an eastern, meaning an oriental acacia that has a lot of DMT in it. But the Cotria viridis, if you can get it. Hmm. All right. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna in the waning moments. Hi, from, from Vancouver again. Yes, sir. Um, uh, going back to the, the Mayans. Um, sir, you were on earlier? No, uh, no in uh, relation to the, uh, the, that, that subject. Yes. Um, and the, uh, the, the coming about of, of the, the, the 2013. Um, the uh is do you see Terence, uh the 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 realization of uh, galactic citizenship as a precursor or, or a, a result of uh of of that 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 time all right well uh-huh. my i can i can fly with that in other words technologies seem to be converging toward opening up the bell non-local quantum realm where presumably all the intelligences of the universe are communicating uh, in some kind of standing wave form. So uh, I don't know how it is that it's keyed to this conjunction with the galactic center, but I do think that we will fulfill the dreams of the ancient Maya, we will fulfill the dreams of the medieval alchemists. Uh, we are on a collision course with some kind of revelation of our own uh, place in the cosmos. And uh, exactly how it's all going to hang out, we can't say. But that it is happening is 
visibly evident all around us. How close do you think we are? Uh, well, I still feel comfortable with 2012. Uh, I still think there, that gives us ample room to put in place the understandings, the technologies. I think we have to get over the millennial speed bump. I think a lot of squirrels mm -hmm. have seized the high ground, and we have to sort through the prophecies and the revelations one by one, but that the wiser voices will be discerned in this process. This is something you contribute to, Art, by letting everybody tell their story and letting the Darwinian selection of these memes take place. Indeed. Indeed, I do that. Um, all right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Terrence McKenna. Hello. Is that me? That's you. Um, I had a question. I wanted to tell you something, Art. Yes? Um, did you know you're going to be on repeat at Millennium tonight? Oh, you know, I meant to tell my audience that. Thank you. I, that's right. The show, I, the Millennium program I did, is going to indeed repeat tonight on NBC at, what, 8 o'clock or something? I think it's 9. 9 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. On the West Coast. On the West Coast. So wherever you are, that's right. I'll be on Millennium. Thank you. And I have a question. Sure. Uh, what about people that take uh, prescribed Medicaid drugs and they don't get the right one? Is, is that anything like that, like you're talking about? No. You mean in terms of the kinds of effects? Yeah. No, I think we're talking about something, well, bad medication can go any direction, but uh, psychedelics are certainly more than simply misprescribed uh, responses to drugs. Well, do you Is think... Is that what you mean? Do you, well, I think that's what you mean. Uh, do, do, do you think that drugs ought to be prescribed at all? And if you do, then should psychedelics be prescribed? Well, see, we don't have any place in our culture or our medical practice for the concept of self-administered recreational drugs. Our culture sets us up to think drugs are for sick people. No, no, I know, so, but I mean in some greater future that we might sit here and imagine for a moment. Uh, well, I think we're going to see psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, and in fact that already flourishes in an underground form, um, sure. Terence McKenna is, huh, what is Terence? He's a philosopher, I guess. A, he's a, a probably the man who inherited the mantle from uh, Tim Leary, Dr. Leary. He's in Hawaii, and... I'm going to let you tell him, uh, let him tell you rather, uh, the way what has, uh, what has happened to him lately has occurred chronologically. Um, Terrence, my friend, welcome back. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Art. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. God, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, Terrence, you were just humming along in life. Uh, and, of course, I had interviewed you, gosh, it was not that long ago we had done a full, you know, like four-hour interview, I think. And you were sort of humming along in life. And then one day here recently, uh, I mean, without a hitch, you were feeling fine, weren't you? Uh, well, I had had uh, four days of headaches that I thought were uh, flu. And uh, I had a tour on the mainland. I'd heard about a flu that was preceded by headaches. and uh, So you thought you had the flu? I thought I had the flu, and after four days of headaches, uh, I went into the bathroom, and I had uh, a massive brain seizure, which I knew nothing about. My partner, Christy, wrestled me into our truck, got me down to the local hospital. They did a CAT scan. Within 40 minutes, they could see uh, a brain tumor the size of a quail egg on the right size, side. They took one look, and air medical evacuated me to Honolulu. All right, this is a tumor in your frontal lobe region? That's right. Okay. Uh, as far as I can tell about three inches behind the eyes. 
And uh, once in Honolulu, they did what they call a stereotaxic assay, where they basically bolt a metal frame to your head and drill in to get a piece of this thing. Oh, my God. And the doctors looked at it, and uh, the diagnosis was glioblastoma metaforma, stage four. So what this thing is, is the fastest moving brain tumor known to human medicine. And uh, Stage four. Stage four, which is an advanced stage. So uh, immediately they scheduled a procedure called the gamma knife, which can only be done in a few hundred places around the world. The way to think of it is... Um, like nuclear acupuncture, 201 sources of cobalt-60 focused on this thing to burn it to a crisp. And they told me flat out, there's a 1 in 10 chance you won't live through this procedure. Through the gamma knife? Yes. A 1 in 10 chance? Yes. Well, let's back up a little bit. Before you had the gamma knife, obviously, the doctor sat you down and said, hey, Terrence, here's where you are, here are your options, uh, here's your prognosis. I mean, what did they tell you before you even made a decision about a treatment? They to I said, untreated, where are we headed? And right. he said, you'll be dead in 30 days, no question about it. 30 days? 30 days. So looking at that, and my I had friends who flew in from London, my brother came from Minnesota, friends came from California, we had enough brain power in the room to, uh, you know, match the Nobel Prize Committee. We all looked at this, and the gamma knife thing seemed to be the way to go. Well, yesterday it was two weeks since, since they the did gamma it. knife. They did it, yeah. All right. My understanding is that the gamma knife took about 90% of the tumor and apparently destroyed it or started it toward destruction, or uh, is that about right? That's what they believe, 90 to 95 percent. The trick is these tumors have uh, fractal boundaries. They have messy boundaries. So uh, without follow-up radiation and chemotherapy, the doctors here said it will return within weeks, weeks. and you'll be back where you started from. So we spent a very difficult 10 days looking at every cancer therapy alternative and otherwise in the world, trying to sort the real stuff from the surreal stuff. Sure. And um, basically what we came down to is what scientific medicine can do for you is something like the gamma knife or a much scarier operation called a craniotomy where they actually take off the top of your head and go in for this thing with knives, uh, followed by the radiation treatment, and then they pat you on the back and send you home. And Well, the, uh, the other option, the surgical option, what did they tell you about that? I mean, they obviously had to tell you something so you could make an informed choice. They said it was so dangerous and the death was so likely that they didn't want to do it unless there was an absolute crisis. Well, 30 days to live is pretty much of an absolute crisis. Yes, so they hold up the gamma knife as a substitute for the craniotomy. And I must say, you know, I, I after the gamma knife, I walked out of there. So in other words, it's a walk-in procedure. You lie down, they bombard you with these gamma rays that are so precise that they can go to the area of the tumor passing through the outside of your head and, and uh, some portion thereof of your brain or whatever and, and doing the cutting or the burning or the destroying just at the tumor site. That's how they, that's how they see it. That's what they believe. That's incredible. Well, let's hope they know what they're doing. Uh, well, you're, you're talking to me. Well, I told them through it, I said, and they didn't uh, fully anesthetize me. It was local anesthetic. So 
I was with them all the way, and I said, guys, let's keep the oops factor to Down. a minimum <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, one little oops, and uh, uh, Terrence is not Terrence anymore. Well, they tell you, they say, you know, the possible, the scary part of this is if we hit the motor strip, you're paralyzed. If we hit the optic nerve, you're blind. Uh, oh so, yes, it's a tight space in there. And uh, I have now, after two weeks, uh, having had this thing, I keep looking into my mind, trying to see what's missing, what's different. Um, my son, Finn, was here. And at one point with the surgeon, he turned to him and he said, so this tumor, it's thinking? And the doc thought a while, and then he said, well, yes, it's, it's thinking about something. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what it was thinking about that I'm not thinking about anymore. Um, in other words, he was suggesting the tumor, the out of control of the cancer, um, was actually part of your brain uh i mean was that a joke or do, does do the cells actually when they're there function as the brain functions in some way is that what you say well apparently so in other words these wow. doctors say it had to have been there a year or 18 months and in that year and 18 months i've noticed the, I they put I got some bifocals. I noticed I was a little more forgetful, but I certainly didn't feel like somebody who was at risk for brain seizure. Um, the seizure itself, Terrence. Were you? Did you just pass out? Were you in convulsions? What What happened? Well, what I had heard about this flu was that you had bad headaches, and right. then you would vomit, and so. Uh, the fourth day, I was lying down with these headaches, and I began to feel nauseated. Uh -huh. And I thought, aha, it's going to turn into a flu. Right. So I went into the bathroom, and then it was, you know, and speaking as a psychedelic explorer, all hell broke loose. It was very confusing, and it was confounding. I, I had no idea what was happening. I was having hallucinations. I was not sure where I was or who I was. I had two or three more of these seizures as Christy wrestled me down the mountain. So in other words, in a way, you had a form of consciousness during these seizures, at, at, at least enough that you're able to remember what you're telling me right now. There were flashes of awareness, but a very confused kind of awareness and here's what the real tip off to all this was art for a month leading into these seizures i had been having uh dreams that were the only way i could describe them was i couldn't describe them i they lasted hours and yet i could not describe them even to myself and i even said to christy and my son uh few mornings before the seizure, I said, I think I should see a neurologist. These dreams are so bizarre, I can't believe that healthy people have these experiences. Well, um, as most everybody in the world knows who has listened to you, you have done a lot of psychedelic drugs. Yes, now, okay. it must have occurred to you that one possibility with regard to the dreams was some sort of effect from some psychedelic drug that you have taken at some point in your life that did that one roll through your mind it did it they were it was like a, a tryptamine but it was not like DMT which is what I know best but the quality of being indescribable and the quality of being visual were things I could only associate with psychedelics once I got over here to Honolulu and we were facing these doctors, I, I said to them, I said, you know, if you want to guilt trip me, I have a history of uh, psychedelic and recreational drugs. And they just waved it away as preposterous and said, no, 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 this comes out of your genetics, this comes out of the environment, this is, this is not about smoking dope in the evening. 
Um, well, that just tore another question right out of my hands. And so, so you asked it yourself. Oh, of course, because I knew that anybody hearing this news about me... Was going to say, ah, oh, remember all the drugs he took? Right. Yeah. See what happened to that guy? Here's a, here's a bad example. Uh, so, so now, where are you now? In other words, now the gamma knife procedure is done, some great portion of the tumor has been destroyed, and I guess you've entered a regime, a mainstream regime of... Uh, what, what uh, radiation called, or yes yeah, soft focus radiation and what they try to do the way I visualize the tumor is it's not smooth it has spurs and and kind of processes on it and they have to focus on those things or within weeks the thing will Grow regrow up. regrow and these these Scientific doctors don't hold out much hope. I mean, I think they're trained to look you right in the eye, and they do, and they say six to nine months, no escape, no escape. And, and so that's what they're telling you now? That's what they're telling me now, yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't believe that, uh, actually. I I'll actually don't believe it now. I do believe in mainstream medicine's ability to probably, I mean, the gamma knife, obviously, with the choice you had, there's no choice there. I'd go for that myself. I'd have done that. I've made the same choice. And then we all know then there's some left of the tumor, which you don't need much. All you need is one malignant cell left, and it regrows. It's, uh, you said it was one of the most, or the most aggressive? Known to science. Known to science. Yes. Yes, so one of the godsends of this situation was that my brother, Dennis, was here. He's a professional pharmacologist and drug designer, so he could ask the questions, ask the hard questions, really push on these guys, and study the stuff on the Internet. And, you know, if you have liver problems or eye problems, uh, straight medical science knows a great deal. But the thing about brain tumors is it's a total frontier. And there are dozens of people out there with machines, drugs, treatments, and who knows whether this stuff works. Most of it you can't even use inside the United States because the government won't allow it. And, of course, when people hear they're dying, and many of these people are well-healed, they will spend any amount of money, go anywhere to of course. Um, to try and live. So we've been looking at all this stuff, and there are machines in the Dominican Republic. There's a guy in Houston. There's a guy at the University of Virginia. There's a cancer clinic in Germany. Dr. Day, there are a million different alternative treatments, and there are champions for all of them who will say, you must do this, and you must do it right away. Yes, and if you don't follow my advice, you're choosing grim death. Yeah, that's so, right. That's yeah. right. Go gather that pen and paper. I'm going to give you an opportunity to help Terrence uh, in two ways, spiritually and financially. He can use both, believe me. And uh, there is now the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation account, and I'm going to tell you about it toward the end of this uh, particular segment. But right now, it's uh, it's back to Terrence. Uh, Terrence, uh, you're back on the air again. Good. Uh, Terrence, uh, what do you uh, what do you believe about the power of the mind? Another uh, the context in which I ask is, uh, we had millions of people concentrating, you know, white light healing prayer. Uh, whatever it is the individual happens to believe in and sending it your way. Now, we did that and we're going to do it again, but I, I wonder, I just wonder what you believe about all this yourself. Well, I mentioned community immunity. I think uh, what we're really talking about here, Art, is uh, the power of love. That's right. And once they pull the rug out from under you and give you a death sentence, Suddenly, the lights come on, and you realize that uh, 
love is what it's all about. And That's right. love is what keeps people going. It cures diseases. It brings children into the world. It makes people able to die with dignity. And I think if anything can change the statistics and turn this into a, a happy story, it's the community that um, has supported me and cares about me and uh, affirmed the things that I was into. I was very attentive to the to the concentrated moment that you organized and sent. And while it was happening, which was just before the Gamma Knife procedure, yes. I felt that uh, really that's why I lived through it. I mean, I... I that's, that's amazing. Uh, you're the, actually the second person to make a statement like that. The first was Richard Hoagland, um, who said he could actually feel it uh, while it was going on. I felt I could feel it. Yeah. I felt it as a kind of welling energy coming almost, I would say, out of the earth. But I sat with my eyes closed, and it was pouring in. And then the, I talked to one of the big, literally the big kahuna on the big island, and he said, when you go into the gamma procedure, tell your body to be strong. And when I did that, I had this same feeling that I had during the group meditation. So I, the, it brought home to me the, the horror of, of dying alone and unloved. And I really want to say, you know, if you think there are no heroes in this world, go to your local cancer center and look into the eyes of the people sitting in the waiting room. They're, they're not worried about Kosovo or the stock market. They're, they are dealing with stuff so deep and beyond most people's imagining that uh, you just have to genuflect to their nobility. Do you, uh, what do you believe about us? You know, I, I, I meant to ask you that when I say about us, you know, we are biological complex organisms and the big kahuna question is whether we are more than just that, whether at death there is not an ending but something else, uh, a, a new beginning or something, a continuation of some sort, obviously, in your situation. You would have been reflecting on this. Well, I think uh, nature doesn't build patterns as complex as ourselves simply to throw them away at the edge of the grave. I, I really think that what a lifetime of psychedelic journeying has taught me is consciousness can exist outside of the body. And if it can exist for an hour or six hours, then why would nature throw the beauty of that away? So I, you know, I've, this has been an emotional turmoil for me, but at my best moments, I say, foreknowledge of your own death, if that's what this is, is a kind of enlightenment. And of course, everyone can have this enlightenment. Well, there, there really are a lot of ways to look at it. How old are you? Fifty-two. Yeah, you know, I'm. I'm going to be fifty-four at midnight here. Really, congratulations. <laughs> and um, so, you know, at best, uh, if we're lucky, we have another, and nothing goes wrong. We have another twenty, thirty years, maybe. That's right. Uh, best case. So, in the cosmic sense of things, even if you were to um, die tomorrow. It's a blink. Uh, the difference between tomorrow and 20 years, cosmically, is just, a, it's nothing. It's not even considered. It's not even time, as we understand it. Um, and so, it's like, you'll be there tomorrow, and I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> In that sense, if there is a continuation of life. And well, I and people who write books and paint paintings and do what you do, I think are in touch with a kind of Greek notion of immortality, which is you live as long as people remember you and hold you positively in their mind. And if this is not an argument for doing good and spreading love, I, I don't know what is. 
What has changed for you in, in, in the way you think of all of this since that moment, since the doctor has told you uh, what the prognosis was? Uh, what has changed for you? Well, the most startling thing is I have the idea, hallucination, notion, I'm not sure what it is, that I can walk down the street and I can tell who's living and who's dying. I can look into people's faces and I can see who has figured out enough about the living condition to make it work for them and who is just spinning it away in anxiety, money chasing, and foolishness. And I see my own life and how I gave energy to certain things, not to other things. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a revelation. Do you, do you now perceive that a lot of your life energy was misdirected? I could have treated people better. I could have been more compassionate, more kind, more open to people. You and I have had many a conversation where I was knocking various uh, ideas or systems which I felt were flaky and Maybe I still feel they're flaky, but what I now see behind all that was the intent and the compassion, the desire to make life, whatever it is, an easier journey to whatever it sweeps us toward. Uh, you, uh, you've, got, you've got some insurance. Obviously, you're facing medical bills um, right now that are probably like uh, Mount Fuji. Yes. Well, I had medical insurance my whole life. I paid too much, and now I discover it doesn't cover drugs. It doesn't cover the evacuation flight over here. The average bill to an insurance company for a person who dies of cancer is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow and uh, and no alternative medicine is covered absolutely none so uh, my friends suggested that, that there be a research foundation where people could donate I resisted that I've always paid my own bills I've always taken care of myself and then as I got into this I realized that the, the medical system and the insurance system victimizes everyone. And so many people have sent suggestions and books and machines and names of doctors. And I, I realized uh, I'm, I'm going to need all the help from my friends I can get. And if, in fact, I'm headed to the great beyond, then... Uh, whatever is left in this trust fund should be given to promising forms of cancer research, drug research. Uh, we don't know enough about cancer, and it's it's a, a scandal that because so many of us will come to these places. All right, I have the information on what you just talked about, the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation, and. Um, my understanding is that the money, while you're alive, will be used to help offset some of what you just talked about. But should you pass away, as you just said, it will go to cancer research of some sort. Um, it is the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation, and you can make out a check to that, the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation. And uh, it'll be going to the Washington Mutual uh, Bank. And I actually have several pieces of information here. I have an account number. Uh, so that uh, uh, you could um, actually uh, transit money, uh, electronically uh, move money into that account, and that account or transit number is 3222-71627. I'll repeat that in a moment. Uh, you can also send it to, by mail, the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation, uh, at uh, box 3287, La Jolla, California, 
zip code 92038. Uh, once again, that would be the Terrence McKenna Research Foundation account at box 3287 in La Jolla, California, 92038. And one more time, the uh, uh, routing uh, number for any funds that you might want to send would be 3222-71627. So there are two real ways to get money into that account. One is directly as in a bank transfer, and the other, of course, is at the address I just gave you. So, And, and let me say, Art, uh, your audience may not know this, but you and I have never met never laid eyes on each other. But we had plans. We had plans, and we may still have plans. But for you to do this for me with your audience, uh, I'm finding out who the real saints of this world are. And this is as great a gift as I can imagine any human being doing for another. And uh, I love you, ma'am. Well, thank you. How do you... Uh... Terrence, um, when you read, you must be in a personal review of your life now. And aside from the regrets, and listen, Terrence, we all have them. There was only one perfect guy a couple thousand years ago they talk about. Otherwise, we've all done things we're sorry for that we feel guilt about, of, you know, mistreated people. Uh, certainly I've done it. Uh, but aside from that, when you review your life, Terrence, it's been a pretty good one mostly, hasn't it? Oh, it's been a fantastic life. I mean, I've uh, been many times around the world. I've written books. I know everybody. I've eaten in the best restaurants. I've been in the company of beautiful women and am in the company of the most beautiful woman I've ever known. I, I, I am surprised, Art, at how... I wouldn't say this is easy to take, but if somebody had described this happening to me, I would have assumed that I would just panic and fling my mind away. And instead, there's been a wonderful consolidation and appreciation, and I'm ready for whatever comes down the pike. This has been uh, a long, strange trip, and I want to live, but if that's not in the cards, I want to do a good job with the time left to me and to learn from this experience. When this occurred, uh, a member of your soulmate's family called and spoke on the air a little bit and attributed a quote to you, which was that when you spoke with the doctors, Terrence, you said you would like to opt for quantity of life versus quality of life. And I asked you about that quote. Uh, is, is there anything to that, or was that just wrong? No, I, I can't believe that if I'm alive, I can't generate happiness and peace of mind out of myself. And so I don't want extreme chemotherapy. I don't want uh, wild measures to prolong... Things I want simply to do a good job with this so that the entirety of my life uh, makes sense because I think how you die is part of how you will be remembered. And I want my ideas, my values, the, the books and the, the ideas about plants uh, to stand the test. And Leary did a good job, and Wasson, and uh, and we all are in the same canoe here. I could almost claim a fortunate position because I know now, and that gives me time to uh, clean up my act and uh, and review. Now, Anna, you should walk in front. Of, you know, a lot of people tomorrow morning or tomorrow during the day are going to walk in front of a car and be instantly dead without one second of thought about. Anything at all? Yes, that's what I always assumed would happen to me, an unpleasant 15 minutes on the freeway and then the velvet darkness. Yeah, velvet darkness. So you, at one time you, you really did think about the other side as a velvet darkness. 
Well, or at least the velvet curtain. <laughs> velvet curtain. Huh? Um, so, so really, aside from the normal regrets we all have, what you have spoken about publicly on my program, what you have written about in your books, you don't feel any change about any of that, do you? No, I don't. Uh, uh, I'm amazed that I may not make it to 2012 and that I may not lift a cup to the new millennium, but uh, no, uh, n no regrets. All those books, all those ideas were put forward in deepest sincerity and nothing has changed. My friend, it's so good to hear from you. And, uh, you know, whatever time you have left, whether it be uh, a couple of months, a month, or years yet, and I hope it's years. We're going to see to it. We're going to try our best to see to it that it's years. And a lot of times, you, you got to know, Terrence, a lot of times what the doctors say turns out to be absolute crap about how much time you've got left. That's true. There's an awful lot of walking around talking examples of that um, for sure. So there's, uh, there's always, where there's life, there is hope. And you're obviously alive, and obviously the gamma knife didn't miss because you sound like the same Terrence to me. I love talking to you, Art. I love being on your show. I love knowing how many people are listening to me. And as long as I make sense, I'm happy to come on. It's very healing and affirming. Uh, you're, you're doing good work. Just keep doing it, buddy. All right, my friend. Thank you, and good night, Terrence. Good night. Hey, it's Denise Friedman. If you watched till this far, then I want to say thank you and I hope you got inspired and have a great day or night.